hello. Uh, I think we should get started. Hi. Um, welcome. Thank you very much to. Uh, thank you very much for being here at the fifth Migrating Text event. Um, so on behalf of myself, Carla and Kit, we are very grateful for you to, uh, for coming and for all of our speakers. We've got a fantastic programme lined up today uh, involving subtitling, translation and adaptation of various kinds, thinking about audiences. <coughs> What does it mean to be part of an audience? What our audience is looking for? Um, how do you study audiences in those different fields? Just a couple of quick messages. Firstly, um, huge thanks to the London Arts and Humanities Partnership who have funded us. Um, sadly, this is the first year that we're not funded by the European Union um, <laughs> for reasons that you will be aware of. Um, but we, we still thank them for their support of migrating text. Um, thanks to the Institute of Modern Languages Research for hosting us and particularly for uh, Cremena, the background for at uh, the background at uh, the back of the room, um, who has made everything run so smoothly. A couple of housekeeping things. Um, there's no fire alarm planned, so if you hear it please leave down the stairs. Um, but there's also some strike action happening outside, which you might notice um, if there is a fire alarm we go outside. Uh, toilets, if you go back um, out towards the, the main doors, you'll find toilets for the toilets on every floor. Uh, we will be recording the lectures. Um, if anyone doesn't want to be heard on a recording, if, you've, um, if you ask a question, please let us know and we can edit that out. Um, also, there's lots of swag at the back. If you want a pen or a, a tote bag, please help yourself. Um, I think that's all of the sort of information. I'll hand over to Carla for the start of our first panel. Thank you very much, Katie. Thank you, thank you very much all for, for being here. I can see some familiar faces. And as Katie said, this is our fifth year. We're very happy that you know, it's, it's still popular and people still appreciate the kind of interdisciplinary approach that we have to the thematic, um, um, the themes that we choose each year. Um, I just, um, before I introduce our speakers, I was to speak as kind of the academic panel, um, I should say that David uh, is going to be uh, speaking before Agnieszka um, as um, the research uh, um, it kind of, you know, it's connected, they work together and some, some parts, I guess, will overlap, so David's going to pro probably introduce like a somewhat introductory topic and I'm just going to go into the nitty gritty of, of um, the technical aspects. Um, I should say, yesterday, uh, it's, 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 um, a kind of surprising discovery I made to the National Archives in <coughs> Richmond um, I'm currently working on, on a distribution of news um, by the Ministry of Information, um, which was working in, in the 1930s and 40s here, the Senate House. Senate House was a, was a building. Um, so they, um, there's a correspondence between the Ministry of Information and consulates and embassies in the Middle East and in Eastern Europe, where they were trying to sell and to distribute um, the newsreels during you know, the, the conflict in, to neutral countries that weren't participated or invaded by the, the Germans and the Italians yet. Um, as, at some point, the question of how do we translate these newsreels, the, the question of language, what kind of language, what kind of strategies do we use? And this is, um, I found the passage just was very interesting and, and, and I thought perhaps I should kind of use it tomorrow um, uh, to, to kind of introduce um, our interest, our common interest today, and I just read you a very brief passage. Sorry if, I, if I, this is really boring for you, but it was quite interesting for me just because you know today I, I was going to be here at the Ministry of Information. Um, so the, the minister asks, um, Would you therefore communicate with the various embassies and consulate general um, uh, and uh, ask them to instigate a careful check on the extent to which these special newsreels are getting to the local screens? Um, and uh, an indication of the reaction of the audience. Um, the following are the points on which I would appreciate a regular monthly report. Um, may I, at this uh, juncture, emphasise the importance of the regularity with which they are received. 
So what did they ask? They asked for the number of towns or villages in which they are being shown. They asked for the number of showings per day in the various cinemas and the uh, approximate number and class of the community which is attending. Um, the, I'll just, sorry, I hate green for my, but I just, as I said, took this image yesterday. Um, so they also asked for the reaction of the audience with reference to any special items which appear to give satisfaction or offence. So this is the way they, would, when they were doing audience research, the ministry was doing audience <coughs> research, asking consulates, asking ambassadors, please go and tell me how many towns, how many screens, who are these people, what is the <coughs> class, the, the class provenance, and uh, any kind of specific reaction to any specific uh, um, item show. And I would just like to stress the question of language and the question of translation was of paramount importance. So with this kind of we are going back to the 1940s today we you know we will be talking we will you know being transported into the 21st century and we will see how much more complicated the issues actually become. And um, so so with this I introduce you to our first speaker David Lorego Carmona. David is lecturer in, in translation at Aston University is um, graduated in, in Colombia and then moved to Spain where he worked in Tarragona University uh, and then a uh, postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Free State in South Africa so he's been traveling quite a lot, different audiences to study. Um, so he's an expert and has published extensively on, on professional translation and, and in the interplay with the use of technologies. Uh, so please welcome him as, uh, as I said, I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so good morning everyone. Thank you for the invitation, first of all, to the organizing team. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm coming just from Birmingham today, so it's practically close. That's much easier than South Africa. And the idea today, and I'm sorry, I apologize for the change, but in, when I was preparing the presentation, I decided to go back and to do a little bit of an introduction of why I do research on subtitling and reception and how I think it can be framed and then with discussions with Agnieszka we realized, well I suggested, uh, uh, that I could come first because then this would give, this would open the, the discussion and would uh, work as an introduction for her presentation later for the rest of the day. Uh, so the first thing is why reception? Why we do research on reception? They, I will try to briefly explain how we explore uh, users, how I study users of translation, and then I'll try to come up with some suggestions for how we can uh, move forward as a discipline and what translation says, why I think translation says can contribute to the discussion. That's my main point today. So why reception? I study I started doing research on reception because I realized specifically from, at the time I was interested primarily on fan sub and non-professional subtitling, and I realized that there was a, a gap in the study of the actual users of the subtitle, the subtitles that were being created. Non-professional subtitles are being created by internet communities primarily, and the idea is that the actual content, the user-generated content, is produced by only a minority of the group, only between one and 10% of the people are actually actively involved in the production of content, but about 90% of those communities are the people actually using the subtitles or actually using any type of audiovisual content. So I started to think, why do these people use those subtitles? How do they engage with the subtitles? And what are the reasons why some people at some point decide, well, uh, there's this need or there's this gap and we need to cover it. So I wanted to, to study that. And that, in the context of global media, uh, currently is related to the issues of technology or the advantages of technology. Uh, how are people connected through technology? What uh, resources does technology offer to people to uh, develop this more empowered role? And how that affects distribution and transmediality? How people, how we now produce content at international level? So it was a bit of a journey of looking specifically at how find sub and non-professional subtitling communities work, what that means for translation, but at the same time going back and seeing what, what does it mean for translation and for media, what's the role of translation in this wider concept of, of media and how we can think of this reality, not only on the way how people actually watch the content, but also what are the implications of that. So in order to come up with a framework, I started doing research on 
users uh, exploring what a uh, Chesterman proposed, and then it can be adapted for the visualization, what he calls the three R. And then this goes back very nicely to the quote that uh, Carla was reading before about reactions. So how do people react to content uh, according to this framework only at the psycho psychocognitive level? What are the responses that those reactions and that content brings up? And then uh, what are the repercussions, the wider implications of that? So we go from very granular and specific engagement with the content to a wider analysis of what that, what that means in general, what are the implications of those things are at a societal level. And to do this, I started using mixed metrics, so not just looking at quantitative, qualitative data, but try to combine in order to have the different perspectives and to have a wider a, and deeper understanding of the issues at hand. So to study reactions, I started looking, I started using eye tracking. Uh, eye tracking is very good at telling us where people are looking at and uh, what catches people's attention. So we can look very nicely at um, uh, whether people are looking at the image or the subtitles and how uh, that the, their attention is distributed. Apart from that, we can also look at how people actually read. So we can look at the reading patterns, what are the uh, behavior that people uh, follow, how people engage with the subtitles, and how they normally change the attention of the image to the subtitles. So that was my, my starting point for the reactions. Then in terms of responses, I was interviewing people, and well, I first uh, used the questionnaire, then I started interviewing people, and then that gives you another layer of understanding. I was learning that people use subtitles to, in, in many different ways, not just because they don't know the language. They use subtitles because they want to confirm their knowledge to so some more advanced way of engaging with the subtitles. Some of them also use subtitles in the original uh, language in, of the content instead of uh, interlingual subtitles because they want to, to get that additional knowledge or because they, there's a degree of mistrust or because those are the subtitles that they have at hand and those are the first they come across. Uh, then subtitles also become important to understand the way how people actually access the content, what the possibilities are. And then uh, I also learned that people are good at using different audiovisual translation modes depending on what they actually need. So some people would say that they would use subtitles for language learning or when they were with friends, for instance, but then if they just want to relax or if they are multitasking, then they would go for jobbing. And this was study conducted in, in Spain, so jobbing is, um, Spain is traditionally considered a jobbing country. Uh, although that's also one of the things I was looking at. So, so what does that mean? Can we still talk about jobbing and soft in countries when people can easily access content whenever they want and in the forms that they want to on what uh, needs and expectations they have? How does the exposure to these possibilities change the way how people choose what they want to watch and how they want to watch it? Because it's not just uh, people having this passive role in front of the TV, but also people being able to look for another alternative or to re-watch whatever they want to re-watch or to watch content as many times as they want. If they want to uh, repeat an episode, if they want to check something in the subtitles, or if they just halfway through it want to, want to change from the dub version to the subtitle version, they can do it. So how does that affect with how people engage with content? So my idea is to put forward the, the concept that we need to look at the whole spectrum, to look from the reactions to the repercussions, but not only in a linear way, but also try to push it on both ends. So try to look at a more uh, deeper and um, in a way, try to look in a better, um, try to be more structured and more use more robust methods on both ends in order to try to analyze and try to understand what people are actually doing with a uh, translated content. Uh, and to explain this, I think, I want to, to suggest what we, what I think we can do. Uh, for instance, in terms of the use of eye tracking that has become the almost the standard method to study subtitle reception. Eye tracking offers a lot of data, and eye tracking, um, it's very precise for what we need it, for subtitle reading. It, 
if you're doing psycholinguistics, then you can discuss how accurate it is, but for software vision, it is good. But then the problem that we're facing is that we're not necessarily using it in the smartest way. We are not experts in, in, in coding or we're not statisticians, so it's, it becomes very tricky. So we need to make sure that we can produce those more glamour analysis of subtitle, subtitle reading to actually understand how people read subtitles and to actually try to push uh, the boundaries of what we do and the only way we can uh, I think the only way we can do that is by providing more rigorous metrics, being more specific about how we conduct experiments and then in a way getting in line with the open science principles and the transparency principles of all other areas and then also conducting more powerful statistical, uh, using more uh, powerful statistical models and being more conscious about the models we propose and we put forward. It's not just about uh, running t-tests and ANOVAs but also understand what's behind it and trying to see how we can translate our hypothesis to that language I actually use it for our benefit. Uh, something we haven't explored much, for instance, is how we read words we are not, which are not very common, uh, words that are... Uh, oh, oh, wait. See if I can stop at the right point. Nope. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah uh, there. What happens when the strings of text do not align to what we expect? Uh, the differences between low frequency words and high frequency words, that's something that we can definitely analyze with eye tracking. Uh, for instance, we can also look at. What's wrong here now? Sorry. Something that surprised me when I was doing the, my study was uh, I was doing the experiment with um, people between 18 and 30 years of age in Spain, so these are university students watching audiovisual content subtitled in, in Spanish, from English into Spanish, and then uh, this uh, example in particular I found very interesting because uh, does anyone know how to spell Zac Efron? <clears throat> So there's a, a, a spelling mistake there, it should be an F, not PH. And it was very interesting for me that, that specific, if you look at the fixations, those are much larger than the fixations in the other words. So people were, the, these participants in particular, were very geared towards spotting that mistake in the subtitles. And that, that type of analysis, that type of what makes it more complicated for people to read is something that can give us information about how we can actually move forward. But if we want to get to that level of analysis, we seriously need to develop better methods and to be more rigorous about how we conduct uh, studies. This is just, um, I didn't do any deeper analysis of this, just a proposal out there, something that caught my attention. Uh, that's in terms of... Sorry. Um. So that's in terms of uh, reactions, in terms of responses. Uh, the same one watch Game of Thrones. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> Good audience. Uh, so we Game of Thrones and or this kind of big series opened the door for us to explore how people actually respond to what happens. And people are offering information out there. Twitter goes crazy when uh, they launched a new Game of Thrones episode. And that was a particularly interesting example. There was a mistake in the dub version of the Spanish, I think that was the fourth episode? Third episode. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, there was a mistake in the translation and she can see us, was trying to ask the answers that doesn't make any sense. In Spanish it is not a word, uh, but then it got through. It was dubbed and that was the audio that people heard in Spain. So, internet went crazy. And these kind of reactions, we can uh, try to uh, analyze to see what bothers people, uh, what information actually uh, gets there, and when people react. People only complain about translations, but translations go wrong. That, that we know. But then how can we actually leverage that and try to make it to help us 
not only as researcher but also as a profession. I'll come back to this um, in the repercussions part. Uh, but Twitter in general is a great source of uh, information for us as people doing research on Snapchat and we can learn about how people engage with content and when they do it so we know whether something that is launched in the US has an effect in China or India or Brazil or not. For instance, this is the uh, hashtag, the, uh, the trend of GOT, hashtag GOT over the last four weeks. That was taken on Monday. Uh, we can also look at where people are engaging with content. Content clearly, the U.S. is the uh, most important one. This is a U.S. production, but we also have Brazil, uh, Europe, and then India. China is not there. Twitter is not in China. So how can we try to cover for that? We know it's a huge market. There's a lot of, uh, um, especially fun stuff going on in China. So how can we count for that? So we need to look at the my proposal is that we look at translation in this wider framework of media, what the role of translation actually is. Also because it's very easy to understand the role of language. Uh, this is just standard outcome of the uh, hashtag GOT, uh, GOT analysis. We see that most of the uh, discussion is done in, in English which is understandable, but then Spanish, French, Portuguese, and Italian are also there. And then there is this 8% of unrecognized languages that are also involved. So there's a huge discussion about these products uh, happening online right after they are released in many different languages. How that affects translation and the expectations of people, and how that can be used to actually reinforce the profession. That's something we can uh, think of, and how to actually translate. And in terms of the uh, repercussions, I think the Sikansu's example is actually very good because uh, there were people laughing at it online, but then it escalated from that to actually, well, what does it say about the conditions of the people involved in the job in industry in Spain? How are they, how does a mistake like that that looks so simple get through? And then the discussion was, well, they don't have enough time. They don't have enough time and then the resources that they are provided with because of the piracy issues are just not good enough to provide a good translation. So how that does uh, connect to the people we are training as trainers, uh, the translations that we study and the translations that we produce. What are the implications of that? There's a lot of value on that. And then the advantages of international communication is that things just go uh, uh, so there and back and in any direction. So the issue was in Spanish. It grew immensely in, in Twitter in Spanish. And it was picked up by the Spanish media, by the media in Latin America. It was also huge in Latin America because we, uh, Latin American countries are mostly subtitling countries. So we normally tend to laugh at the dub versions of the Spanish uh, productions. So that was a discussion there too. But then it came back to the English speaking uh, world and then it wasn't just the laughing part but also the issues related to the job in industries. So that highlights those problems. And that's something that we can easily link if we go back to the more black, uh, granular analysis, uh, the more specific study of the reaction. So if we try to make sure that our products cover uh, all those areas, we can definitely contribute to this question of what the implications of subtitling uh, are. Something that is also very relevant is the study of reception not only in official media but also in non-official media. Uh, there's a lot of distribution of content that <coughs> well, I came to study reception through fan subbing, so that's very close to what I do. Um, and I think it's important to look at those two aspects, not necessarily as competing industries from a research perspective. Uh, we can have a discussion about the format for my economy, but that's a whole different thing. But from a distribution and from a research perspective, those two spaces, the piracy networks distributing content and the official networks selling it through official channels, coexist and influence each other immensely. So how those relationships affect, uh, affect uh, translation and the use of languages in general is also something we can look at. Uh, and also, going back, how uh, the big players in the industry affect uh, the landscape and how they define what people should consider a good subtitle or not. We have Netflix uh, pushing for a more non-English, um, for more non-English 
not English productions, so foreign language productions, uh, and using subtitle, subtitle and dubbing as a way of distributing this content, but then does it mean that they have the power now to define what good subtitles are because they are the biggest players <coughs> in the industry and because many people are working for them or not? To what extent does that power that they actually have, uh, to what extent that power actually affects the way how we translate now, how we're going to be translating in five years? That's something we need to keep into perspective. So, uh, I've mentioned most of this. I think translation has a lot to say about other areas, but we cannot do this alone. We need to we need to make sure that we contribute. We don't need to know we don't need to know about everything, but we need to know that there are other people and other disciplines also involved in these discussions, and that we need to establish those interdisciplinary collaborations because otherwise we're just looking at the issue from a very one-sided perspective, and we're not really understanding what the actual implications of this are and uh, that's something I've realized more and more now that I'm in the UK and that we are always talking about research and impact and uh, how we can actually connect what we do to a more impactful uh, research that has actually some societal implications. Uh, I think there are different questions that we can explore on all these different layers. We don't know, for instance, how subtitles actually affect reading. Uh, do we want to have, uh, sorry, how the color and the subtitles affect reading? Uh, do we prefer white subtitles or uh, yellow subtitles? Does that have an influence or not? Does it depend on the language or not? Is that a, does it have any cultural connection? Um, the different tasks involved in the... Uh, now, uh, the different tasks involved, how people when we use eye tracking, we understand that people watch video and then read the subtitles in different ways, but how does that uh, interaction actually affect the cognitive processing of the subtitles and the content in general, something that we can learn more about. Why and how people use subtitles? Not only interlingual subtitles, but also intralingual subtitles, which are being used more and more by people, just because they have some knowledge of the language and want to improve uh, their, their skills. Mm, how do cultural preferences and then uh, personal habits affect the way how people watch content and what content is subtitled and why and uh, what content is translated and distributed in certain places and why so <coughs> those are the main questions really we can use different types of data collection and data methods that we haven't looked at carefully now and we can combine them but we need to know that we can conduct more interdisciplinarity. We need to push for more interdisciplinarity in translation studies in order to be able to promote an agenda. So I think we need to listen not only to the to the audiences but also to the people involved in the production of the content, the people uh, putting the money in, the people distributing it, creating everyone engaged and I think that as researchers we're particularly well positioned to try to maintain this kind of dialogue uh, we need to innovate, not to be scared, not to commit to do things we cannot do, but to look for the collaborators that can actually help us to do those things. And we need to be prepared. Uh, we need to make sure that we uh, have the better tools that, tools that we can afford and that our studies are actually bulletproof. So we are actually providing something. It's not just doing research because we want to do research or using an eye tracker because we have an eye tracker, but also knowing what we can do with that and trying to invest the time in developing our skills and collaborating with people. And that's it. We need questions ah, after, I think it's a deep after the presentation. And yes, this presentation is okay. Um, oh. <laughs> so some of you might know my work already, but I'll do a quick introduction. Um, so she's Associate Professor in the Institute of Applied Linguistics at the University of Warsaw. Um, she has published extensively on media accessibility, media description, eye tracking technology. She was recently um, a research fellow at the uh, UCL, the uh, Central Translation Studies, with a Mary Sunodowska uh, Curie Fellowship. I don't know if I pronounced that correctly. Yes, Kodowska. <laughs> Kodowska. Oh, sorry. 
Um, so she's collaborated to many research projects um, in the UK and, and, and internationally, and, and so we're, we're, we're very, very happy that she agreed to uh, accept our invitation. And we're really looking forward to hearing for the latest development of the research. Thank Please you. welcome us. Um, hello, good morning. Uh, it's nice to see so many uh, faces. Uh, thanks for the, uh, the invite. It's great to be here again. Uh, as, a, as a speaker. Uh, okay, um, let us start. Um, uh, some of you, uh, hopefully uh, most of you, uh, may be familiar with this new journal, uh, the Journal of Audiovisual Translation, that uh, the first issue came out uh, last year. This is the first academic uh, journal on audiovisual translation. And in the first issue, there's a paper by uh, Jan Maria Greco. Uh, who uh, talks about uh, three shifts in um, accessibility studies. And one of these shifts is a, is a departure from uh, what he calls uh, the maker-centered approach towards the user-centered approach. So the maker-centered approach um, uh, would rely basically on what the makers uh, think. The makers, the assumption was not best, they are professionals, uh, so the products, different products were designed according to what the makers thought is good for the user rather than asking the uh, user uh, themselves. So, uh, and now in accessibility studies we have moved forward um, to um, um, looking at users. And I'm wondering whether uh, we have the same shifts in subtitling. <coughs> Did we uh, originally have uh, subtitle? A subtitler centered approach to subtitling and do we now have a viewer centered approach or not and I think I um, want to argue as well that it's it's not so easy the picture is more complex and we as researchers uh, play a very important part in the communication here between um, the users and the uh, the makers um, so who, who are the makers in subtitling? Uh, let us try and uh, think about that. So we've got subtitlers, uh, but then again, if you think about it, we have uh, translators, uh, template makers, spotters, QCers, it's a, it's a bit more complex. It's not like the subtitler and that's it. And subtitlers uh, are makers, but also uh, the language service providers, they are the makers as well. They tell the subtitlers with their style guides what to do and how to do things, right? And depending on the type of uh, subtitling, when we talk about interlingual subtitling for the deaf and hard of hearing, SDH, we also have the regulators like Ofcom or the FCC, uh, who also tell people how to do things or how not to do things, and then they monitor the quality. So these are, these are the makers, let's say. And uh, <clears throat> um, let us uh, have a look at uh, those relations um, um, by using the example of reading speed and subtitle um, editing. Uh, we'll start with intralingual subtitling for the deaf and hard of hearing and then we'll move on to interlingual standard subtitling. Uh, so, was there a maker-centered approach in, in intralingual SDH? I have a nice uh, quote from, uh, I tried to find the, the, the pictures of the, the people I'm quoting. <laughs> He's uh, Jeff Hutchins actually with his wife in Florence. Uh, so, but this is one, he was one of the first captioners at the American uh, public broadcaster, WGBH. Um, and uh, this is what he confessed. Uh, what they did uh, there initially. So uh, he says that whenever captioners faced a caption editing problem, what they would do, they would just talk about it among themselves, reach an agreement, and this decision would become uh, the policy. Okay, so that would sort of show that indeed the maker center approach um, <coughs> was there. But then I found some nice uh, quotes as well. Uh, there was a, a discussion on uh, uh, captioning in America already in 1970s. Um, and we've got a, a guy, uh, another guy from um, WGBH, um, Philip Collier, and he says, uh, I don't believe precision is that important. We're talking about subtitling here, captioning, as they say, right? And he explained the objective of this uh, public broadcaster. Uh, he says that they wanted to serve as many people as possible by lowering reading le uh, le level um, and reading speed of subtitles. So that's one end of the approach. And on the other 
sort of end, uh, was another public broadcaster in America, PBS, represented here by Doris Caldwell, uh, the first captioner there, again, the same um, uh, year. And she said, uh, well, when you simplify text, it only serves a small fraction of viewers, those who are normally prelingually uh, deaf and uh, with, with some inadequate schooling. You, you don't serve the, the rest of the people. And she also had another argument that oh, if you oversimplify things, you sort of abuse the integrity of the, of the uh, original program. So the producers did something the way they wanted and now you are the captioner sort of destroying it in a way. Um, so these debates, I would, uh, I would think, uh, do not necessarily show that the, the makers' approach was focused on the makers only. They, they had the viewers in mind uh, all the time. And these discussions continue uh, till the present day when we talk about closed captioning or our um, SDH. So uh, I think it was last year that this discussion started uh, prompted <coughs> by a deaf uh, Netflix user. Um, who complained on Twitter, again, so Twitter is a, is a popular thing today, um, and he says that Netflix censored um, uh, profanity and they edited dialogue for, um, for brevity. This is not what uh, deaf viewers uh, wanted, um, and it was caught up by the media. This is from The, the Guardian. Uh, the, the, it started with the show The Queer Eye, and uh, one of the hosts, um, <clears throat> of the program joined in the discussion uh, saying he was appalled at the at the subtitles and then the whole movement started with no more corruptions <laughs> hashtag <laughs> and um, right so these were the uh, repercussions so to speak um, and another repercussion to uh, use uh, the uh, terminology introduced by David here uh, was the reaction by the uh, maker Netflix uh, what did uh, Netflix say? They said that uh, the uh, deaf and hard of hearing viewers are very important to them and they will try and do their best to investigate the issue and improve their experience. Of course, they're fee paying customers, so uh, it's quite important from this point of view as well. Right, so uh, this is what we are familiar with. Uh, this is about closed captioning, intralingual um, subtitling. So you can see the, the focus isn't a lot on editing or not editing, or going verbatim. How about um, interlingual subtitling, the, the classic case of translated subtitles for hearing people? Um, and I'm going to uh, give you some quotes um, from uh, two sources from the study uh, that I did here in, in London. First, we'll have a look at users. So we did some interviews with uh, users asking them what they think is important in subtitling and what they think about text condensation and subtitling speed. So I have two people here and one person says, I would love to have as much text as possible because I know sometimes the subtitles just say the gist of it. I would prefer the full text. Uh, and then another person says the subtitles annoyed me because they didn't match the original dialogue. Uh, and so I felt there was a conflict and uh, they stopped reading the subtitles because of this conflict. Uh, then we have another person, and this view was actually repeated a number of times, uh, saying that when they watch something, the content that they understand the original language of, um, they would rather have subtitles that are verbatim or very faithful, close to the original, whereas uh, when you're watching something you don't really understand, the gist is okay, they're pretty happy with the gist. Mm -hmm. And then we have uh, another user saying, you know, uh, you need to read the subtitle, look at the screen, so I'd rather get the, the essence of the conversation. So the problem with uh, testing users is that some users will tell you one thing, the other user will tell you this thing, and then you have to come up with something like with one, one compromise. So that's a bit tricky. Uh, um, yes, yeah, so some, somebody suggested why don't we have uh, two versions or more versions. This theme uh, again reoccurs. Uh, we've discussed it a number of times. I haven't seen it implemented in many places. I don't maybe it's not viable in business terms. Uh, let's have a look at what subtitlers um, uh, think about the same thing. So this comes not from interviews, this come, uh, comes from an online survey uh, that we did among uh, professional subtitlers. And um, uh, let's have a look. 
So this person says there was a, a drop in rates, so they are earning less money, and the um, the use of templates is much more popular now, and uh, therefore the reading speeds have uh, become um, much higher. So professional subtitles who are very good at condensing are sometimes deemed too expensive. So some other people join the profession; they just type. The, uh, the, the, the text without doing much condensation, uh, they don't have much regard for reading speed or quality, this person says. Uh, another person says that subtitles are sometimes poorly done because there's too much content, not enough time to read. So good subtitles should be concise, right? That's, um, that's the view. Um, this person again <coughs> talks about the templates that they get, uh, where subtitles sometimes reach the speed of uh, 30 characters per second. This is very fast, right? <laughs> this is very fast. And uh, the, this, this person says that people complain about the quality of the translation, but the main problem, according to this person, really is that subtitles are bad because they are not condensed um, enough with literal translations leading to absurd reading speeds, right? Um, so you can't really watch anything, you just have to read the, the subtitles. Um, um, yes, so again, the same, the same <coughs> view, right? So subtitles should be concise to allow an unhurried, unhurried presentation rate, whatever that is. Um, and um, just to finish off with this, um, Dutch subtitlers, we had a lot of Scandinavian subtitlers um, in, in the survey. They, they said they were very proud to, um, of their ability to condense text, right? So this is like text condensation, it's, it's part of, the, of, the, of their work ethics. I know, in a way, okay. So this this is what they do professionally. This is uh, how they do things the best way possible. But then some users want something else. Um, but I was wondering, how do the makers, going back to my initial question, uh, the makers, the subtitlers, know how to uh, subtitle? Um, well, uh, <laughs> there are there are some subtitling guidelines, right? Uh, recently, I think this year, yes, in January, um, mm -hmm. Guidelines for Subtitling in Denmark, a very nice document, was uh, released. So we have these guidelines and we also have some company style guides, right? So I have two examples from Denmark, um, another one being um, from Netflix. So um, let's have a look at what the, the first one, Guidelines for Subtitling in Denmark, what it says. Um, about reading speed, it says, uh, well, uh, reading speed in Denmark normally is between 10 and 15 um, characters per second. This is what we do. And then we have Netflix, the same country, and uh, it says 17, although with QC they go up to 20 or 21, and then for children it's 13. So what, what do you do, right? Which, uh, which ones do you choose? And how do they actually know it's 15? or 17 or 10, okay? And they say, this is where researchers come in, I think. They say, oh, well, we do those things, we have these guidelines because there has been research and uh, we, it was uh, found that this and that, okay? So uh, this is how we have researchers in the picture. So let me uh, mm, talk very quickly about um, what we uh, know from research. Um, about uh, subtitling, uh, for sure, I think that's one thing we, we know, that subtitlers are great gaze attractors. So whenever you have the face of the person uh, and uh, yeah, the face, they, we're just looking here at the face, but whenever subtitle appears, the attention goes down and then uh, stays there at the uh, subtitle, right? Um, <clears throat> And then, this is a typical viewing pattern of a subtitle. We start from the center, when a subtitle appears, we go down, we read the subtitle, and then if we have time, we go back to the center of the screen. So this is what we know for sure. But other things, I'm not sure we know for sure. <clears throat> so what, what do we know about interlingual subtitling in terms of reading speed and condensation? And is our knowledge informed by uh, up-to-date research? And I think the, the two most frequently uh, cited studies um, are this one. The first one comes from uh, 1987. Uh, it was one of many studies done by Professor Jerry Dideval in um, uh, Belgium. This is a study that is frequently quoted as proving the six second rule. So, um, uh, what did they do exactly? They took a 10 minute clip 
from a German series and they uh, showed it to people using three different subtitling speed. They used this terminology, I translated it into characters per second, so they had a super fast 32 characters per second clip, 16 characters per second and <laughs> 10 and a half. And they had one or two liners in the subtitles and they asked people which ones they liked best and people said, well, the, uh, the slowest ones, right? The six second rule, ten and a half, with two lines is, is the best combination for us. I'm not surprised when you, when you look at the, the other options and when you think about the um, computer and the times, uh, basically. This is the computer that they use for <laughs> the, the um, study uh, there. This is what computers look like, right? It's like, that was the, <laughs> the rea reality. And when you think about TVs, this is more or less uh, what they look like, okay? So perhaps uh, more up-to-date research is uh, needed on this. And there was um, another study that is very often cited. Uh, here I have uh, a picture of somebody's presentation that I found on Twitter. I don't even know who was the presenter, to be honest. And uh, I found uh, um, this quote here that according to Jan Pedersen from University of Scot Stockholm, when the reading speed is 12 characters per second, the viewer spends 50% of the time reading the subtitle and has the remaining 50% to look at the images. But when the speed goes up to 16 and a half characters per second, uh, the viewer spends uh, uh, like 80% of the time reading the subtitles. So I was like, hmm. I didn't know Jan Pedersen did anything on that. Um, I know this table, this comes from the digital uh, TV for all study that I uh, took part in and uh, this is from um, uh, Pablo Romero uh, Fresco's um, a book. So uh, Pablo comes up with this very interesting concept, viewing speed. And what he's basically saying, and he was using words per minute, so again I translated it into characters per second, and what he's saying is that when we have subtitles displayed at a lower speed, viewers have more time to spend on images. He says at 10 characters per second, so it's 40% time of sub on subtitles. And, but when uh, the speed goes up to 16 or 17 characters per second, the viewers spend as much as 80% of the time uh, on, subtitle, uh, on subtitles. Uh, I'm not saying this is not true, I'm just saying I haven't seen any research that actually showed this. So I wrote to Pablo uh, asking what is the mathematical formula actually stands behind this and uh, we're still in touch, I, 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 I keep pestering him with questions so I'm still waiting for a reply, I'll tell you at the next conference. Um, I can say, because I was part of it, so I can say what we, what we did um, uh, there, so we looked at Shrek. Uh, we did a study in, in a couple of European uh, countries, uh, Poland, Spain, Germany, Italy, the UK as well, and for, uh, for the Polish part and the, well, for other parts as well, so we had three films with three conditions where subtitles were edited, standard and verbatim, so three different reading speeds and we showed it to people. The clips were one or two minutes long, so not very long, but when you think about it, this was intralingual, and we did SDH, it wasn't like uh, standard subtitling, and we tested deaf, hard of hearing, as well as hearing viewers, but most of our uh, viewers were actually deaf and hard of hearing, so it's not exactly applicable here, it's not exactly relevant. Were there any problems with this study? Uh, I'm allowed to say that because I was doing it, so, so there were lots of problems with this study, so um, those of you who took the pictures of the famous table, please don't go around the world and don't quote it as something that is actually true. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, so we did the subtitles. Uh, I was doing mine on, on subtitle uh, workshop at that time. We didn't have easy titles uh, back then. I, uh, last week I looked at, at these subtitles and I was appalled at what we did, uh, to be honest. Uh, there was a very high variability of speeds between particular subtitles, uh, which averaged nicely to what we wanted, but then there was a high variability. Shop changes, don't even ask me. Um, yeah, short clips. Then we tested, I don't know, 40 people or something in Poland. So again, compared to 40 million population, not that much. Um, and then my data was analyzed by my friend psychologist and I had no clue about statistics at that time. So I don't even know what they did, to be, to be honest. <laughs> Especially with 
with my data. And then in, in the book, in this famous table, we didn't even report any statistics. Um, so I, I think it's pretty much uh, not really relevant to the discussion on interlingual uh, subtitling, to be honest. Um, and just to finish off with this, uh, the, the actual Polish data uh, was um, that when you look at uh, the slow speed, let's say 10 characters per second, uh, in the table we have 40%, we had 35, so that's all right, but then when we go to 180 words per minute, so 15 characters per second, in the table says 60, 70% of the time is spent on subtitles, what we found was 45. So, um, <clears throat> so I think uh, we need more studies actually to, uh, to see what uh, really happens. In the study that I did here in, uh, in London, we had, um, and I was doing some data analysis at a simple level, but uh, I know what happened here. So uh, we indeed had um, observed an increase. Uh, this is 12 characters per second, so slow subtitles and fast subtitles. So slow subtitles were looked at, I don't know, 40% of the time, depending on the group, and fast subtitles displayed at 20 characters per second, around 60% of the time, but it never went up to 80. Um, and just to show you, um, this are, these are subtitles. Uh, uh, I deliberately slowed them down so there is no sound, so that you can have a look. Uh, these are subtitles displayed at 20 characters per second, and I'm showing a scan paths of a few viewers, Polish viewers, and you can see that they go down, read the subtitle, and go back to the image. So this shows that these fast subtitles um, were actually read um, by um, uh, viewers. Um, so that, that was 20, we didn't go higher. I don't recommend going higher or anything like that. Okay, and then as David was saying, it's really important um, how complex the text is in the subtitles. And there was this nice study by Elisa Perico with an analyst. Was it you, David? I think mm, it was No, was it you? Yeah, it was a little... Well, anyway. Uh, so uh, they were saying it all depends how complex the text is, the film is, the dialogue is, do you have many difficult words, uh, typos, all those things, right? And uh, when you do, it's, it's uh, normal that viewers spend more time, the, the processing is, is more um, affordable, basically. Uh, so it all depends. It's, it's very difficult, I think, to put it down in one single um, table. So going back to my uh, initial uh, question, I think we've got uh, lots of, as you, as you saw from the, um, from the quotes, right? We've got those discrepancies between users and viewers and the, what the makers believe, what their ethics are. And uh, they were sort of basing uh, so much on the research that we have done but we really, I think, need to look at the quality of, the, of this research here um, so, and make sure that what we know about subtitling, what we tell people about subtitling is actually evidence-based. So what we've been doing, um, we've been mixing research on deaf and hard of hearing with the research on hearing people and we were presenting the results as sort of comparable, I don't think that's really comparable, research of children and adults again was, was mixed up uh, and as I was saying um, uh, standard subtitling with SDH. And again uh, we didn't have that many studies on uh, subtitling uh, when you think about medicine and how many studies they do before they actually release some medication etc so we should <laughs> have a little bit uh, more here as well and uh, this is of course related with uh, researcher competences that he was saying as well what do we know about statistics when we study translation um, I didn't know uh, that much to be honest I never had a single class in statistics so uh, what can we do now um, uh, continue doing the work, just do it better, uh, I think. Uh, and another, another point I would like to stress is that we need to, I think, share our data so that other people um, can have a look at my data. This is what I did with, with the short project and analyze it in the ways that they know. I was just using simple novels, as David was saying, right? But there are better people at statistics. There are better, more powerful methods and my data is right there so they can be <coughs> replicated or proved wrong. Let's see, um, right? Uh, and again, we need replication. We need more uh, viewers, more films, more countries, uh, more speeds to be, uh, to be tested. Uh, and maybe this will uh, be actually a new era 
uh, in reception research on audiovisual translation. Thank you so much. I just wanted to say thank you to Jorge and Olivia who were part of well, one of the studies I was talking about and our paper uh, quoting the users and makers uh, will soon be out in this journal if you want to follow. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, um, oh, shall we show Eleanor's... Uh, what's the, so we, have, we should have had the first speaker but she's travelling back from the States where she's... Um, She's worked for the um, past few months um, on a, le um, it's not a level here, sorry, it's a Fulbright uh, scholarship, uh, fellowship. Um, so she sent us a video, which is about 10 minutes. I thought perhaps we could have a look at that, where she kind of approaches the question of media accessibility. Um, and then we still have time for questions. I think she does introduce herself, but as, she say, as I said, she's a... Um, um, working at the University of Pittsburgh um, and also um, as a Fulbright Scholar and um, she's also a associate professor at the University of Maturata uh, which is an, um, since the 1990s I believe working on media accessibility um, and, um, and reception studies. Um, she published recently an edited collection on, on media accessibility. Uh, I'm sure many of you will be familiar with her work. Um, so we, we, we had several um, email exchanges and she really wanted to, to come be part of, of, of our team but couldn't, couldn't make it today. So this, as I said, this is a very, very quick video and, and, and then we could um, discuss um, more with, uh, with uh, David and, and, and Agnieszka. Um, so I'll play that for you. Hello and good morning everybody. Uh, first of all I want to thank Carla Mereo uh, to have me take part in today's event, even in this unusual format. I really wanted to give my contribution and also I wanted to listen to the presentations and the discussion that is going to be held today. Um, but as you watch this video, I'm crossing the Atlantic back to Italy after five months in the United States as a Fulbright Chair. Um, my interest in the topics of the Migrating Texts Conference uh, is great and it refers to uh, the past 10 years of research I've been carrying out in audiovisual translation and media accessibility. I would like to start this virtual presentation by trying to explain why in what I think is still a largely uh, unexplored realm of reception studies in audiovisual translation I have decided to focus on participatory accessibility. Actually, the title of my talk, as you say it in the program, is Participatory Accessibility, Empowering End Users and Aiming for Ever More Inclusive Access to Media and Live Events. Um, when I was recently writing a chapter on reception studies for the forthcoming handbook of audiovisual translation and media accessibility, these past weeks, I thought at length, I considered the various theoretical and methodological positions that can be taken to define the very concept of audience, especially in relation to media and to live events. And I decided uh, when writing the chapter to emphasize one position, one concept of audience, one stance that I found particularly useful, especially in my latest research. Uh, on participation. Um, in a book published in uh, 2012 and called Audiences, Ian Christie reflects on the position that the researcher, the researcher can take vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the object of his or her research. And he says that audiences can be defined and observed in terms of either we or you. The you stance normally implies observing audience behavior from an external objective position and I think this includes the many studies based on eye tracking for instance and more recently studies based on EEG, galvanic skin response and all those objective measuring tools and techniques. Uh, on the other hand adopting a we stance 
implies sharing the audience position, their concerns and their actions. The concept of participatory accessibility moves precisely from a we stance and it is inextricably linked to action research, which is participatory in its very essence. My own research on participatory accessibility is based on a bottom-up up approach, or perhaps to say it more clearly, on the very practice of providing accessibility to the visually impaired at different live events over the past 10 years. In, in an article that I published uh, in Just Trans in uh, 2018, I discuss audio description in relation to audience participation. I start off in my article by referring to the concept of diffused audiences, a concept that I borrowed from Abercrombie and Longhurst in a 1998 book. The two authors say that in contemporary society, everyone becomes an audience all the time. And they go on to relate their diffused concept of audience to that of performance. They say that in our media-drenched society, performance is part of our everyday life. Media of mass communications and entertainment providing us with an important resource for everyday performance. So from these standpoints, in the Just Trans article, I analyze the ever-increasing steps taken in audience involvement, participation, for the creation, revision, and appreciation that is measured through feedback of audio description for live events, live performances in a 10-year experience, especially focusing on the Macerata Opera Festival that is um, uh, taking place every year in Italy and I've been uh, working at for over 10 years. As I report in my Just Trans article, it is precisely audience participation and audience empowerment that led to having almost 300 participants in the 2018 edition of the Accessible Program for the Macerat Opera Festival. And these are quite important figures when it comes to accessibility. This positive experience led me to conceive of a new, even more participatory project, which I report in uh, my article for the opening issue of JAT, the Journal of Audiovisual Translation. At the core of this article is an all participatory experience with visually impaired children aged 6 to 14. Uh, the occasion was provided by an adapted version of George Bizet's famous opera, Carmen, uh, an adapted version that was created for Italian school, school kids uh, by a team called Opera Domani. This one performance uh, invites teachers to work with their children in schools to prepare for, for this performance. And during the performance, the children will be directly involved. They will be singing, they will be dancing, and they will be wearing costume elements they have prepared themselves in class. It's an all participatory experience and a very successful one that uh, brings to theatres in Italy something like 150,000 um, kids every year. It's a participatory experience, but it's not truly inclusive. So I knew that this show was coming into my town in June last year, and I organized a lab to make the show accessible for blind and visually impaired children to start in an inclusive truly inclusive path. Um, what I wanted to do is to make the performance participatory for even for blind or visually impaired kids. So with a group of 14 blind, partially sighted and non-blind children and with some of their parents, in May 2018, we created and recorded the audio description of Carmen in a workshop which saw the active participation of all, including the parents. The audio description then accompanied a live performance, which was attended by most participants in the workshop and their parents. It was a successful enterprise, which was repeated in November 2018 at a different theatre with a different show. And um, 
this enterprise is going to be renewed this year too, with a new show that is based on Gaetano Donizetti's Elisir d'Amore. Uh, but to conclude this video contribution, I would like to share with you some of the concepts that guided this first experiment in participatory accessibility, and that will guide me further. First of all, I'd like to do a trend, I would like to draw attention to a shift which has occurred over the past 15 years or so, from audiences as consumers to audiences as prosumers, and finally to audiences as producers. This passage, discussed by many communication and media scholars today, and also reported in my article for the Journal of Audiovisual Translation, sees audiences as increasingly involved not only in the reception of productions for media and live entertainment, not only influencing their success and further development, but this passage sees audiences influence the whole creative process and even actively participate in it in a very production and creative process as producers, meaning P-R-O-D-U-S-E-R-S. This has been increasingly happening, for example, in the world of video games, but also in relation to the offer and consumption of streaming products through amateur subtitling or dubbing rather than through professional translation services, to make an example that might be familiar to a lot of us. In relation to accessibility and especially to live performances and the inclusion of end users in all stages of production, participatory accessibility therefore refers to the design, creation, revision and consumption of access services in an inclusive way. Although it involves difficulties at various levels, participatory accessibility ensures many benefits. As a shared experience, it implies learning from each other, regardless of sensory or age-related limitations, for instance. It also involves a shared awareness of the complexities that lie in the creation and provision of accessible services. But at the same time, it also simulates joint efforts in advocating for it. Participatory accessibility supports universal design and redefines the very concept of accessibility in inclusive terms. To go back to one of my initial concepts to finish this talk, participatory accessibility supports the usefulness and possibly the ever more systematic recourse to a we approach, not only to the study of reception, but to the very shaping to the participatory shaping of reception itself. And I just want to thank you all for listening to me and I wish you uh, all the best in carrying out this conference and, and discussion that I hopefully will um, get information about. Thank you very much. Thank you. I feel a bit awkward clapping, but she's, <laughs> she's on um, Twitter at uh, LNDG. Sorry. <laughs> Um, so she, um, I think, she, as I said, she's travelling back to Italy, but she, she says she'll catch up with questions. So if you can, you know, if you're a keen Twitter user, then you can get into contact with her. Um, I would invite, perhaps, uh, if you'd like to come over. I can see there's only one chair, so I'll bring you another one. So I'd, I'd just like to thank you first again. It was uh, very great. And I can see how you know the, the two talks are, are related, and then you two have been. That was a better one, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm really pleased that you kind of mentioned the kind of historical perspective, looking at you know how it uh, changed in the 1970s, and you know my story, and oh, yeah. so that I really appreciate that um, the connection that you made, um, the materiality, the physical apparatus, how that changed. You know, not only the way we produce translation, but also the way we receive translation and the way we interact with them. And, and the, you know, the three R's the model, the discuss so fabulous. I, I have probably many people eager to to answer you, uh, to ask you questions, and um, so please, I open the floor. So I've got two questions. Uh, the first one regarding reading speed, um, because you mentioned words per minute, words per second, etc. But one of the issues is that sometimes different pieces of software 
don't give the same results because they face the calculations on different algorithms. So that connects with my second question, which is research and our output should be put on open science so that it benefits the whole community and the industry and it benefits the quality and ultimately the end users um, and the audience. However, with this open science, do you think that we are giving the benefits of scholarship, the benefits of all this money put into academia onto the hands of the big fish? those who are getting the money and those who are actually um, working with very low rates and getting loads and millions and millions of money and not benefiting um, the whole community, academia, do you think? So first of all, uh, should there be more a wider connection with uh, software developers and then how does research benefit big fish and how can this big fish benefit <laughs> the academia? On the end. Mm -hmm. I can thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. So you're very right about the. Uh, should I stand up? Is it better? I mean, it feels weird not to see half of the room. Um, so uh, yes. So the calculations I, uh, I was giving um, were based on the assumption that um, an average word uh, consists of uh, um, uh, five characters. Um, so then again, that's a generalization. Uh, so that's how these particular calculations were done and that's how I think Pablo did them um, as well. Uh, so whenever I try to calculate the reading speed of what I have is I look at the text, uh, I calculate the number of characters I have, I have the durations of the subtitles and I simply do the max. I don't take this from the subtitling software uh, because that's a very good point that they differ. Um, Oh, big fish. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, it's a tricky question, but I don't think the present model is, for a start, I don't think the present model is better because I don't think blocking uh, academic research results behind a paywall is a better solution. Uh, I think if we are investing uh, taxpayer money, it should be on something that is out there and available who benefits from it, something we cannot really control. And as we are seeing with Facebook and Amazon and Google, it, it's a larger problem than that. If the research that we do uh, is applied by them and then ends up benefiting the end users anyway, I think that's the, that's the, that's the takeaway I would take from, from that. I think that, that would be the goal. And it, if it does change something, if it does convince people that uh, 10 characters is just too slow and that you can include more information in the subtitles, I think that's a win already. I think that's what we should aim at. Uh, and once we have received uh, funding for doing our research, what the implications of, that, uh, of those results are, uh, any, any, any impact we can get from that is a benefit, really. Uh, the channels, well, that's, that's difficult, harder to control, but we, we should definitely put it out there. Not only the results, but also how we got there. And yeah, yeah, the, the methods, the analysis being completely transparent. It's really important for the transparency uh, and for replicating things. Uh, I tried to uh, replicate a study uh, a few weeks ago and it was very difficult because I didn't have any you know, enough details. So if we not only uh, publish open uh, access, but we also share the data so everybody can go and have a look, you know, whether the subtitles that we tested, they were good subtitles or crappy subtitles, you know, and then judge for yourself. And then, I don't know, you take them and translate into your own language and uh, try and see whether you get the same result or not. Not sure it's a big fish there. Yeah, I mean, don't, don't take my question wrong. It's just because I know how um, the costs that this kind of research imply, which are great, they're enormous. And these are usually done carried out under the auspices of higher education institutions funded by public funds and we're now living in a very convoluted uh, period of time with uh, lack of um, um, like scholarship, um, funds, etc. So there may be some kind of... Um, so what, what are you but, saying? That who, who's, like we should who's funding raise you? awareness uh, of this with, with this big fish so that they fund this kind of research too. Because Research in the humanities is receiving less and less funds. 
and they may be benefiting from this but not contributing putting money to the public. Okay, that's, that's a very good idea. Thing. I think maybe we should, we should write to uh, Facebook, let's say, and uh, <laughs> tell them to contribute. And so, so many people watch uh, videos on uh, Facebook, right? Yes, this exactly. It's a very good idea. Thank you, Alain. <laughs> 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 the cross <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Serenella. Thank you for your presentations and for your research, which is very important. So David has clearly highlighted the fact that eye tracking systems are a great tool, but the issue seems to lie in the way you actually can interpret this data. This is something that I've always thought about and I've talked about this with Agnieszka loads of times. Um, but the thing is, do you think, for the both of you, do you think that there are other ways to research reading speed other than with eye tracking systems? Have you thought about it? Mm -hmm. Should I go first? Yes. <laughs> um, uh, yes. That's a, thank you for, for this for this brilliant question. Uh, actually, well, the eye tracker is very limited. It just shows you uh, where people look. It doesn't tell you what they think. Uh, it, it doesn't say anything else. So I think when doing eye tracking, you need to uh, combine it with as many other methods as possible. So, for instance, this uh, study that, that I did here in London, we tried to see uh, whether people are able to read subtitles, subtitle, let's say, at 20 characters per second, okay? So eye tracking was helping us to see whether they actually managed to read the full thing, so that's pretty useful. But we also asked them a number of different questions. So we asked them specifically, did you manage to read the subtitle? So the sort of self-report. Thing. And then we, we had um, a set of different questions like subtitle recognition questions. We were asking about words, uh, we were changing different words at the end of the subtitle and uh, giving them two versions and they were supposed to recognize, did you see this or that? And they only differed with, uh, with the ending. So the assumption was that if you didn't manage to read till the end, you wouldn't be able to say that. Or different screen recognition, scene recognitions. Um, um, uh, questions or comprehension, uh, cognitive load questions. So yes, I think you need to combine these with uh, lots of other things to get any meaningful results. Yeah, well, I, I second that. I think the triangulation of data is necessary not only to support where we will find without tracking, but also to challenge it. One of the things I found in my study was that people, uh, well, I had two different sets of subtitles and one was very uh, white and bright and shiny and the other one was like a yellowish white that white is not really white and according to the eye tracking that one the darker one was easier to read the far the uh, people were reading that one faster but if you ask people about preferences they would go with the brighter one because it looks nicer on the screen so you can always try to problematize that and i think in terms of um, reading speed in general i think it's not just the method of how we measure how people read uh, in terms of the, the tool, but also how we conceptualize reading speed, because we talk about characters per second, but we don't read characters, we read words. So I think if we would find a way to, for instance, integrate um, complexity as a measurement of character or, or reading speed calculations or complexity of subtitles or something like that to assess how those are actually readable, we can actually think of better subtitles maybe uh, but I think it's, the discussion is not just how we measure reading speed, but the whole idea of reading speed could be challenged to some extent too. Thank you. Um, I just, I think I'm going to close the floor. I know there's many other questions, um, but we could do other coffee and there's a chance for more informal discussions. Thank you very much. I'm going to speak as well. started this as PhD students um, five years ago and it was a small kind of training day workshop and now it's kind of moved to something a lot bigger than we originally envisioned and we're really happy that you know this is just bringing different um, 
profiles of, of researchers and of translators uh, together and people from the industry as well, uh, as we've seen this panel today. So I'm, I'm very pleased that Christine Gerdes accepted my invitation to, to come and give a little talk, a short talk about her professional experience. Uh, Christine is a um, London-based uh, subtractor, translator and editor. She has um, obtained her Master's in, in Translation Studies um, and she works with English and German mainly as a as language pairs and also French. Um, um, she, um, his main focus is interlingual subtitling and, and voiceover and, and, and translating for voiceover and dubbing as well. Um, broadcast the cinema, DVD, video on demand are the platforms that she works with. Um, and also, importantly, I think she's also going to mention a uh, um, um, uh, work with Sato, the Subtitlers Association. So we like to, to hear a little bit about that. Uh, and uh, so please welcome Christine to today. So uh, thank you. Yeah, hello. Um, and uh, thanks first of all to Carl and, and the organizers also for having me here. I feel quite humble to speak amongst uh, such uh, distinguished speakers <laughs> who we've just heard and will will hear. Um, yeah, I'm going to just um, give a little overview um, what it is to like to subtitle from a professional's perspective uh, and what kind of challenges um, we face um, also in respect of um, working for different audiences. So um, first of all, um, um, I would like to look at the, the actual purpose of subtitling. Um, it might be obvious to most of you or <laughs> many, but I thought why not uh, going into some some definitions. So a very, very simple one is uh, that the aim of subtitles is to reproduce the intent of the original work that would otherwise be inaccessible or incomprehensible to a given audience. So audience is the key word here. And uh, I've got two other nice definitions. Um, this one is from Fortius Karamitoglu. Sorry I, if I don't pronounce it correctly. <laughs> um, it's quite an old one, but I think it's still very valid. Um, he said uh, subtitles should provide the maximum appreciation and comprehension of the target film as a whole by maximizing the legibility and readability of the inserted subtitle text. And then this one here is uh, from Tima Tiominen, which I quite like, um, which kind of shows the kind of um, balance we have to strike when we subtitle. So on one hand, we face strict limitations um, and we want to, or we have to, eliminate a certain amount of text. Um, and on the other hand, we want the subtitles to be fluent, informative, appropriate in style, and blend into the program in a way that allows the target audience to view the program with ease. <laughs> so, not an easy task. Um, so, in other words, uh, we want subtitles can never go unnoticed. They're obviously on the screen, but we try to aim to. Um, make them an integral part of the film so that they, they are not viewed as like a disturbing um, thing that sits at the bottom of the, of the screen but we, we try to make it actually part of, of the whole film for audiences to enjoy. So how do we get there? Um, I personally see subtitling as, as a balancing act. Um, there's different factors um, seemingly opposing each other. We have the uh, constraints of time and space, and at the same time you want to aim to reach uh, the integrity of the content. And then we want to be truthful to the film's intent uh, and what the director intends um, when he does a film or makes a program or a series. Um, and need to go into the, the speaker's or character's style, um, the um, cultural references, social acts, register, and what have you. Um, and on the other hand, um, allowing the viewer to actually enjoy the visual and verbal information. So there's so much for the viewer to take in. Um, so we constantly have to 
find that right balance. Um, then there's also the factor of uh, tougher working conditions, having to keep up with technology, ever faster um, deadlines and higher demands. Um, and at the same time, you want to aim uh, to deliver always a high quality result. Um, uh, at least, yeah, that's the case for me and uh, most of my colleagues. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then finally, um, this is a bit what um, Agnieszka also touched on, is um, how do we find a compromise between what we think is best for the viewer and what, what the viewer <laughs> actually wants? And, and how do we know what the viewer wants? It's really difficult to, to answer that, so there's lots of questions. I don't necessarily have the, the answers. Um, so we have to ask ourselves, who, who is my audience? Um, they are yeah, probably as invisible to us often as um, we as subtitles are to the audience. <laughs> um, and we have to, yeah, in order to figure out who the audience is, um, first of all I ask myself a few questions. Um, <coughs> hopefully I will know, um, you know if I translate for cinema or for television what type of average audience I can expect and um, what kind of, uh, um, like how subtitle trained they will be, how, can I, how fast can I expect them to read, um, how good is their knowledge of the source language, the culture, and also the target culture. Um, we are not all, all we only translating from um, our main language pair, so often we would use um, English as a pivot language, um, or we have, um, yeah, I've, I've been working on lots of uh, multilingual films uh, where you might have a bit of English, a bit of French, and then maybe Spanish, and you're working uh, with an English template. So then we also have to consider how well does the audience actually know the, the source, the different source languages and cultures, <coughs> and how do we go about it? Um, and this is the, the sub has a res responsibility, that's a point um, um, which um, I constantly need to remind myself of as well when I work, um, that we have a, uh, a certain responsibility towards the audience when, when we translate for them, um, which is, might be also obvious, but um, um, it, it tends to be forgotten um, because we the long chain being between us and the audience. Um, we just maybe <coughs> see the, the client or the production company or the media house or the distributor, um, but it's often um, kind of uh, forgotten that we actually work for the, for the viewer in the end. Um, so with this average viewer in mind that I just mentioned, so we want to try to, or to remember that we stay true to the source sources intent, um, and that um, films are an instrument to convey culture. Um, that's a very important point, I think, um, when we talk of film or series anyways, or fictional content, um, but also for documentaries. Um, and they are a form of creative expression, So and so should um, uh, the, the subtitles should also be a form of creative <coughs> expression. Um, we have the responsibility to make the content accessible to the viewer accurately <coughs> and to high linguistic standards, uh, not least to the fact that um, um, subtitles are being also used um, directly or indirectly for language acquisition. Um, that's actually, just to give you an interesting number, um, it's from a few years back, but um, uh, just to illustrate um, how much reading um, audiences actually go through. There's been, there's been a study in, in Norway um, called the Invisible Text, um, and uh, obviously Norway is a subtitling country, um, so viewers are reading a lot of subtitles. And uh, it was actually calculated that um, uh, audiences go through the amount, equivalent amount of 17 to 18 novels each year. So, which so shows you how much reading um, there actually is and how much text um, people go through. Um, and this number is 
actually from over 10 years ago. So, and I think it's very likely that the huge increase in volume uh, that we are facing now in subtitling, it's, it's very likely to, to have increased so that people actually read a lot of subtitles. And uh, so we have to, the responsibility to do it, to do it right, in my opinion. Um, as a subtitler um, or subtitlers, we are facing lots of changes um, in the industry. Uh, new ways of distribution, um, video on demand is very dominating in the field. Um, uh, almost all internet content is nowadays um, uh, subtitled. Many viewers watch it without the sound. So these are things to consider as well. Um, so there's basically a huge demand for subtitling, new audiences, new ways of interacting with the content as well, um, and interacting with subtitles, um, which brings me to crowd and, and fan subbing. Um, I think um, the huge demand is of course good news for us, um, it's, it means more work. Um, it doesn't always mean though that we are asked to deliver quality and um, um, I think the crowd and fan subbing is, is a very interesting um, aspect, um, which um, I think they totally have their um, right to exist. <laughs> and um, I think there's culturally um, interesting uh, influences coming out of it, but when we talk about um, um, professional quality subtitling. Um, I think it's, it's important to distinguish um, those two fields, but um, uh, as a matter of fact, they often uh, get mixed up nowadays. Um, and um, yeah, many people think that uh, why not use the crowd when, uh, uh, you know, when it's cheaper, uh, why use a professional? Um, so our, our work is also um, more platform and template based. So we used to work more uh, with our own terminal or <coughs> station at home and actually had the material, um, we owned the material. And nowadays we, um, the, the media companies, the video on demand platforms, we, we log in uh, and work online on, on cloud systems. Um, um, and uh, the tendency is there to work almost ex exclusively uh, template-based now. So I see um, a shift there from the um, subtitler as, you know, um, like a creating the whole uh, process from the queuing um, to the editing and, and the translation, um, uh, which is a bit downscaled now to um, um, filling in templates, or that's how it's considered. <laughs> I mean, templates are, are super useful. Um, so um, I think they, they, they need to be used, um, I, but I think they have to be, they should be used in, in moderation and, um, and only considered as templates. And, and often we, uh, the, the large volumes now being uh, spread out, we see um, unfortunately poorly created templates, which then uh, often by yeah, less trained <coughs> subtitles just literally get uh, filled in rather than taking the template and making it their own and, and create something new out of it. Um, yeah, last but not least we are facing, um, yeah, I already mentioned the tougher working conditions. Uh, Agnieszka also mentioned the, the lower rates, um, which are um, yeah, responsible for um, a big shift, I would say, um, that we are often not, simply not able to, to deliver the, the job anymore that we, we, uh, we want to. Um, and um, so it's more the, the, the cheap and the fast, um, the quantity counts more than, than the quality. So we are faced by the deep professional, what I would call deep profession professionalization of the AVT industry. Um, and just <coughs> recently, um, I mean, um, I, I just brought you a little ad here that's supposed to attract uh, <coughs> subtitlers. 
Um, the idea is that they are doing a course and um, within a matter of months um, they, are, they can work as a subtitler. So um, basically, uh, and yeah, this is not a, this is not a rare uh, thing, we've seen these over, over the years. Um, and, um, but recently I just uh, see there seems to be a big trend uh, in selling subtitling as a little hobby that can be done on the side. Uh, and you, the great thing is you get, you get paid just to watch TV. Um, you just need to do a little Google, Google business search and, and I found like two, <laughs> you just, I just found like two or three other um, ads just like that. Um, when, when Netflix's test came out, um, Sadly, um, um, I think they made the mistake to to sell, um, yeah, to attract. I think like over 100,000 um, mm -hmm. uh, candidates who uh, who got the idea that oh, I know two languages, I I can just do it. Why not? I have a try, get some money on the <coughs> side. Um, so um, I mean, fair enough if you do it for for your own. Uh, you know, fun or enjoyment, uh, um, and I think, like I said earlier, I think uh, fan subbing has, has totally uh, the right to exist um, to reach more audiences. But um, um, posters like these actually um, um, aim clearly for amateurs uh, to do a supposedly. Um, professional job. So it's quite damaging to to our work uh, and what we try to to do when we want to work professionally. Um, yeah, which brings me to the need for quality standards uh, and training and also audience re research. Um, because when we don't get it right, um, poor subtitles can be um, <coughs> distracting uh, and damage the viewer experience. Um, so this is not really what um, the viewer supposedly wants. Um, I mean, sometimes we, it's easy to think that the audience, because we don't really know what the audience <coughs> wants, the audience doesn't really care. But um, I think we've seen more and more examples that the, uh, the audience does care. Um, there's, for example, um, um, I don't know how many of you will remember uh, some controversies about the, the film Roma, um, where um, it was decided by Netflix to put um, Spanish subtitles for the um, Spanish audience in Spain, uh, which uh, created a big uh, <laughs> upset in the media and uh, so the Spanish viewers actually felt insulted that they you know might not be um, understanding the Mexican uh, source um, um, and um, generally I also know that SDH uh, because I, I work in SDH subtitling as well um, that SDH audiences are very critical and, and very sensitive to, <coughs> to our choices and um, um, I often yeah, find myself between this um, kind of dilemma that again Agnieszka mentioned earlier um, um, that they often want a more verbatim uh, uh, subtitle um, whereas most of us think uh, you know what? What would it serve them if they have verbatim subtitles if, if they're not able to read it? Um, but um, I think the conclusion is that we need much more um, uh, connection to the audience, is much more yeah dialogue, and um, um, I'm very keen to to hear more about the kind of research you are about to do and um, what you already have been doing. Um, so, yeah, about to come back uh, uh, about the guidelines, I got a bit carried away. <laughs> um, so we have the, um, the, the traditional guidelines um, that are based on, I think, um, experience and um, um, from especially the subtitling countries. Um, they have where they have the tradition of maybe 30, 40, 50 years of subtitling. Um, and um, 
these these uh, subtitle guidelines were aimed at the supposed average viewer. Um, and now we are we have other types of guidelines um, that might maybe question, um, especially the reading speeds that we are using. Um, yeah, again, um, Agnieszka had, uh, I can only really repeat what she has said, <laughs> uh, that we feel, um, yeah, I think sometimes there's, there's too, uh, too wide of a, a gap between those two of the traditional guidelines and, and then newer guidelines like the ones um, Netflix is using. Um, I still have never really f found out what their reading speed guidelines are based on, um, what kind of research, uh, or whether they just thought, oh, 1720 sounds like a good number. Um, <laughs> I don't necessarily think that it has to be very low, but I think we should somewhere meet in the middle. And um, a problem with the guidelines is also that um, not only I and, uh, I mean, the Netflix guidelines, um, I and most of my colleagues feel the the numbers are a bit too high, but also that most um, template creators and subtitlers don't keep to them. Of course, when you have maybe 17 as a maximum, I would I would consider that in the absolute maximum uh, in exceptions. Um, I would maybe feel 14, 15 is, is a nice speed. Um, but when most subtitles actually go over 22 and and I read again and again in, in discussions that people consider that uh, uh, an okay uh, speed, then, um, yeah, I think uh, we are, we, it's a bit too much of a, of a jump. Um, I think audiences definitely read faster. Um, there's, uh, there's evidence for that. Um, but, um, and even though we might not have um, uh, founded research on um, how fast exactly readers read and how much time they spend on, sub on subtitles, I think it would be quite obvious that if they are constantly being bombarded with text at the bottom of the screen, then they really can't uh, take in the visual uh, and other sound and information of the film. Um, but uh, yeah, just to say that um, I think it's very important to bring in new uh, reception research. Um, and um, which might uh, question, but also enhance uh, the kind of traditional uh, guidelines that, that we usually work with. Um, so that finally brings me to um, uh, Subtle, um, which I'm a committee member of. Um, uh, Subtle is, is a member of the European Federation. Uh, um, ABTE, Audiovisual Translators Europe. I don't know if any of you have heard about it. Uh, I brought some fancy flyers, so mm -hmm. <laughs> come and talk to me after if you if you want to hear more. Um, so um, we work um, towards um, good quality standards in the industry, and there are now I think thirteen uh, member associations <coughs> in Europe. Um, and we also work on um, um, the guidelines um, as, and sorry, I'm quoting you so often, but <laughs> you brought in so many important points. Um, you mentioned the Danish uh, guidelines earlier, and there's been the, uh, the Norwegians have <coughs> signed theirs off, uh, the Finnish are in the making, Sattel is working on some, so um, all the associations are now working on um, uh, agreeing on some mutual standards um, and maybe even have, have a European basic um, guideline, um, which might be, I mean, each country is a bit different, but I think we might be able to at least again find a common denominator um, what subtitling should, should deliver for the audience. Um, what we also try to do, the, the subtle and, uh, and in close collaboration with ABT is, is to network and uh, uh, consult with all the parties involved um, in uh, in the uh, in ABT, uh, like academia and um, um, other translators, filmmakers, uh, post-production companies, and so on and so on. Um, maybe you, some of you may have heard about the recent campaign that we called uh, filmmakers to care more about subtitling. Um, there's been an, uh, a Guardian article about it. Um, yeah, maybe should have should have put it in here. 
um, but uh, that, so that's just a recent development that we try to reach out to filmmakers um, who usually are not involved in this at all and um, you would think there's been so much money being put into a film and so much care and love um, not only films but series uh, in general or programs in general uh, so why uh, is the subtitling uh, always an afterthought um, which we think is wrong um, and this is of, of course also addressed to uh, production companies and, um, and distributors especially. Um, so we try to, um, to um, I think colleagues in France especially, they have been trying to set up a meeting uh, in, before Cannes. Um, so things are hopefully happening there. Um, we want to also have a, we, well, we constantly have a, a discussion on race, <laughs> which is such a big issue. Uh, people don't want to talk about it, <laughs> but it is very important because uh, they go down and down and down. So uh, I can certainly say that after 15 years in the business, um, I often now um, earn less than when I started <laughs> so, uh, for certain jobs, uh, which is maybe somehow wrong. Um, yeah, um, I think reach out to the audience, that's already covered. Yeah, I think I have, no, I think I have covered it all now, so thanks a lot for listening. <laughs> Many of you might already know Adriana. I'm also one of her students, she's <laughs> London based translator and subtitler, um, subtitler and trainer. Uh, she works, so we were just discussing, she's, she's been at pretty much every University of London <laughs> that teaches translation. Westminster, Roehampton, UCL. And we do. Uh, yes, and, and, and now she's. Um, I think she took a break from academia, <laughs> and she's um, so concentrated on all your efforts that you probably very, need very much energy um, to do this job, as Christine has just out, um, outlined briefly. So she's the owner of uh, um, Adriana Fratoriello Translations, and uh, she'll tell us, I invited her, I'm really happy that she agreed to, to, to ask to discuss about their profession and uh, the question of audiences and uh, reception of their work. Thank you okay, very much. Thank you. Yeah. thank you very much for having me. So yes, today I will be talking from the point of view of one of the makers. Um, and so um, I have been kindly invited to talk about different types of subtitles and different types of subtitling scenarios. So my presentation is just going to be slightly anecdotal, but I'm hoping to throw a couple of things in, in the arena anyway. So what I did was I interrogated my archive that's what you do. And as you can imagine, because I've been at it for about 20 odd years, the archive looks massive and messy. Mm -hmm. And what I found in there, I found all sorts of things, but I would say, I wouldn't call them brothers and sisters, I would call them probably second cousins. Okay, so because I am the matriarch, then I had a good look at them. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I found from my observations. So clearly, first of all, I looked at what they had in common, and then I also tried to pinpoint what actually distinguishes them from each other and makes them into second cousins, as I said. Um, one clarification today, I am going to talk about interlingual, not intralingual supply, because that is basically what I do. Um, all right, so just to give you an idea, because this is going to be anecdotal, why not? Okay, so this is, this is just to give you an idea of a couple of things I found in there. So here we have, the first one up there is um, a uh, corporate video about the psychology of negotiation. An interview with Barbara Streisand, a <clears throat> uh, very quick second, second, second video, but a voiceover style about visiting a city. Um, then down here we have uh, a video on the making of special effects for uh, a number of films, that was a series. Um, a, another series here featuring my beloved Leonard Bernstein mm -hmm. talking music to children. Uh, a very old friend of mine, but still a, a good one, the aviator, Martin Scorsese. Uh, this was a part of a, a commercial. 
This was Yol, uh, which was a Turkish film directed, forgive me, by Serif Gören, um, where the audio clearly was in Turkish and the template was in English. So a, an example of pivot translation, as Christine mentioned, that sometimes happens. Um, but that was uh, Palm d'Or in Cannes, so beautiful film. Um, and finally, a very old but good friend of mine, again, The Mikado by Gilbert and Sullivan. Now, Okay, just to give you an example of, you know, the, 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 the little, you know, various cousins and stuff that are in there. So, clearly, you can subtitle just about anything, and uh, indeed, anything does get subtitled in all sorts of fields at the moment. Um, I think that very quickly we have gone from an era where uh, video was associated primarily with film and documentary, to an era where video is also associated with information, promotion, education, as well as obviously uh, film and documentary. Um, and as with as subtitles, clearly we will need to deal with all sorts of things. What the, back to these examples, they are, these are obviously all audiovisual texts. They've all been subtitled into Italian in my case. And when you subtitle them, you do what subtitlers do. So this, you know, this is what they have in common, if, if, if you want, from the point of view of the subtitler. So you make sure that they are readable, that they are meaningful, and in fact that they are useful to an audience. So you do the usual. You make sure that they're synchronized with what's going on, so the spotting is good. You make sure that they are semantically and syntactically sound, that the segmentation, both macro and micro segmentation is good, so line break, good line breaks as well. So they help rather than hindrance, audience fruition. That they, the reason that, huh, that the reading speed is not through the roof, and that is <laughs> obviously you know, a hot topic today. Um, that they are respectful of short changes, thank you very much, and that possibly they are also semiotic, semiotically cohesive with what's going on uh, on the screen. Um, so these are the usual suspects, but um, clearly, if we look, uh, I'm trying to go as fast as I can. <laughs> if we look at all those things I, I mentioned before, within those parameters and within these criteria, are they all the same? Well, in fact, clearly they are not. There can be quite a few differences. So although certain strategies will always be adopted, some might vary depending on the context, depending on the audiovisual text that you are um, dealing with. Take, for example, the classic condensation or omission as a strategy. Uh, would they always be present? Well, in the sense that a lot more can go in, into spoken dialogue than can go into two lines of a written subtitle, yes, they would be. However, to what extent and according to what priorities will vary depending on the type of audiovisual text that you are working on. So obviously a lot of parameters could be used to pinpoint these differences, but because we don't have all day, as I have been told, I am going to focus on just two of those. Um, one, surprise, surprise, is the audience, and the other is the kind of, as if you want the scopus of the text, or if you want just to be simple, the, the, the function, the main function of the text, the audiovisual text that we are subtitling. Um, so, uh, I am not only going to use a couple of examples from that lot that I showed you before, for ease of reference. Okay. So, the first one we have here, as I said, I, di I did really love that series. Uh, this is Leonard, Leonard Bernstein. The series was called Young People's Concerts, which was recorded uh, live in Carnegie Hall and was aired between 58 and 72, 19. 20th century, and then recently, more recently, it was uh, made into a DVD set and then subtitled into various languages. So uh, this was clearly quite specialised. Um, it was uh, all about music. It was Bernstein teaching uh, school children. He had an audience of school children. Um, he could go quite technical as well. Um, he would talk about an author or a genre. He could talk about um, intervals, he could talk about the sonata form, and so on and so forth. So, so quite a lot of research had to go into it. Um, in terms of those two parameters, obviously here, the main function here is educational. The audience is uh, an audience of young, possibly school children. I'm talking about my audience. That audience obviously was an audience of school children, so 
primarily educational or exclusively educational as you want. At the moment, I might even want to add music lovers because music lovers might, might want to go and pick that up. I would, because it is a, you know, from, from a historical and musical point of view. Um, so, given this kind of audience and this is given this kind of function, what were my priorities? My priorities were that this has to be, all the content has to be present and correct, first of all. But second, second, but not definitely not least, is the, the fact that the, the reading speed had to be good. The reading speed had to be kept fairly low. Luckily, uh, Bernstein, um, as you can imagine if you are familiar with him, um, was very, um, had a very conversational tone. He was speaking very slowly. So that actually allowed the humble subtitler to uh, achieve um, a decent reading speed, and that was the, the main aim of the thing. Obviously, the synchronization was important. The, the famous uh, semiotic cohesion in that case was absolutely paramount. But in terms of those parameters, these are the, the priorities. Moving on, the aviator. I, I'm, I'm sure you're all familiar with this, no? Big blockbuster, uh, dare I say. Uh, Martin Scorsese made this biopic of Howard Hughes in 2005. And that obviously is entertainment. Or is it? Well, it was a quite, quite a complex thing to subtitle, in fact, because number one, the guy was into aviation, clearly. <laughs> so there was a lot of technical terminology about aviation, not only contemporary, but historically speaking, obviously. This was a biopic, so all the factual information had to be correct. Um, it, the guy was also into cinema, as you, you might know. He famously directed Hell's Angels, which was featured in the film. So again, a lot of cinematic references and terminology that had to be spot on. And finally, um, the register. This, this film spanned a couple of decades. So you had to make sure that you, in translation you adopted the right kind of register if you didn't want to end up being anachronistic. So although you might say this is not a technical a documentary on, on aviation or cinema or a period, historical period study, it had to be seen as all of those things in order for the audience to then enjoy it as a piece of entertainment. But at the same time, this is Martin Scorsese, so his cinematic language had to be taken into account as well and had to be respected because ultimately you want your audience to be able to enjoy this as a piece of entertainment. Um, but I will move on to something completely different. This is, this is a corporate video uh, on the psychology of negotiation. Yeah. <laughs> um, obviously, here we're talking about educational again, but in a kind of corporate environment. So kind of, I'd say, a piece of CPD. The audience would be adult professionals, engaged, motivated, or made to be engaged and motivated <laughs> by their bosses. <laughs> more like it. Um, so the terminology was quite specific and again it had to be all present and correct. Um, but then you would notice that there is a huge difference here from what I was talking about before because this is a talking head. So um, all issues concerning for instance shot changes or issues concerning semiotic cohesion can, can be kept down to you know, be, be become virtually non-existent or, or not very problematic for the subtitle. So um, the, the one thing that uh, was worth bearing in mind was the issue of register as well as terminology because this has to be quite formal. And in my case, when I translate into Italian, I had to bear in mind that the register expected by my audience is likely to be higher than the one used in this kind of video. No informal colloquial stuff would be accepted there. It would be considered out of, out of place. Um, this is again something very different. It's a, um, a series of videos on the making of special effects for um, quite a few sort of quite a few films. In this case, it was *The Martian* by Ridley Scott, and you can imagine it was excruciatingly technical <laughs> because there were quite a few of those uh, yeah, visual um, special effects uh, in that film. Um, and the other thing is that uh, the uh, speed of delivery was very, very high throughout. Um, so, as is always the case, you consider, you know, what are your, your priorities? 
I consider primarily the audience in this case. Yes, the main function, function here is information. The audience, this was made by geeks for geeks, translated for geeks. Yeah, me being the non-geek, <laughs> sandwich in the middle. Um, so what I considered was that these are people who are quite knowledgeable already about this and are watching these things because they are keen to know more, but at the same time they are young people who are used <coughs> to consuming a lot of audiovisual stuff and used to reading at a fairly high speed anyway. Additional help clearly comes from the fact that the they are familiar with the terminology already and quite a lot of the terminology actually stays the same because it is used in English, even in, 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 in translation. Um, so ultimately the choice I made in the end was to keep the editing down to a very minimum and to keep a, a reading speed that was quite high throughout. I don't know whether I went beyond the 20, <laughs> I am not sure, but chances are that it was around that kind of parameter. And that was a, a deliberate choice. Uh, whereas in this case, <laughs> this is something, you know, I'm just giving you a, a bit of a varied menu here. Um, right, so another old friend of mine, I have, as some of you know, I have written about it because I just like it so much. Um, so this was the Mikado, an operetta by uh, Gilbert and Sullivan that was written in 1885. The um, live production of Opera Australia's uh, uh, well, 2011 production was, was filmed, the name was made into a DVD, and then that got subtitled. Subtitled, not subtitled, okay. So being an operetta, it, it uh, alternates sung parts with spoken parts, and the sung parts were all in rhyme. And uh, this alternates with the, the, the spoken parts, which are all humorous, and they contain a lot of satirical and cultural references, which are updated constantly in order to, be, to, to, to remain topical. Problem. Um, OK, OK, the first challenge here, obviously, was the, the fact that the sung thing is all in rhyme. So um, this adds uh, a, another constraint to the usual constraints of space and time and that, which is the so-called mu music constraint. The music constraint meaning that you have to consider the musicality of language, the rhythm and the rhyme, and particularly as, as, as concerns the, the, the rhyming pattern. I believe that that is an absolute priority uh, when it comes to sung text, because the, uh, rhyming subtitles, particularly rhyming couplets, if you want, are very, visually very, very powerful, and therefore uh, appreciated by the audience if they want to, to follow what's going on. Uh, and clearly then uh, also the, 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 the usual issues there were considering the translation of humour, the translation of all those cultural references, which in some cases were specifically Australian <laughs> because they do get rewritten for the specific production. So that was another interesting thing to do. Uh, what to keep, what to level out and that. Um, the other thing was clearly that this was filmed live, and so all the issues that come with the classic, you know, can can't laughter and, and, and such like, were present there. However, I would say on the flip side, okay, this is time to give you the little square. Um, the main function here obviously is entertainment. The audience is an audience of opera lovers, is also an audience of general public, quite fair, you know, knowledgeable, fairly highbrow. But the very, a very important thing here is that this audience, my audience, was different from the, live, the, the, the audience of the live performance. And this is what I consider the flip side, because the uh, DVD audience would enjoy better viewing conditions, primarily, because you can view that at home, because the, the images have a fairly high definition, because a, a DVD can be stopped and started and you can rewind it and whatever, whatever you want, which is all things that you can't do during the live performance. Okay, so ultimately, um, <clears throat> all things considered, in that respect, I chose to, uh, well, well I, I chose to and also I considered that subtitles in this situation tend to be a little bit more substantial than the subtitles you find in a live performance, which tends to be quite telegraphic <coughs> and tend to give the, the gist of what is going on. And this was deliberately uh, 
a choice, a, a deliberate choice, because of those considerations. We're not going to talk about this any, any further because, yeah. So th these are, this is like the kind of um, little excursus. So why am I telling you all this? Because I'm, I'm just thinking, I wanted to show you the diversity of things, just to give you a little example of the diversity of, of texts that we can, as a fact, uh, we have to deal with all, all the time. Um, and that also, you know, to what extent, even within the umbrella of audiovisual translation and subtitling, the strategies can vary to quite an extent. Okay, so I suppose what I'm trying to say is, are we then jacks of all trades? Are we? Um, well, in my opinion, in my humble opinion, no, we are not. We are a very specialized bunch. Because I think, in my opinion, subtitling is in and of itself a specialization. Um, in translation, you talk about niching down, as some of you will know. You talk about becoming more and more specialized in one particular field. Uh, on the other hand, in the case of subtitling, I believe that the skill in itself is a speciality. That a deep understanding of audiovisual translation, of the nature of this medium, of what it takes to turn a spoken source text, or at, at times a sung uh, source text, if you want, incorporated in a, in a complex polysemiotic text into a written target text, that is the specialization. And that can take years to master. And it goes well beyond mastering uh, a, a new type of uh, subtitling software. I say this also because I often see translators jump on the bandwagon and I oft, often see translators who tell me, I, um, I had this conversation recently with a translator who told me that be, given that in this day and age everyone uses video and video is everywhere, they are going to offer subtitling to their clients as well because why not? And because at the end of the day, it can be much harder than learning to use a new CAD tool. Well, I've got news for you. <laughs> That's not exactly the case. Okay, so can I just quickly this brings me to the keyword. Can I quickly mention the keyword? Okay, well, quality in subtitling obviously could take, you know, just a couple of hours or a couple of days or a couple of months, and I'm not going to keep you here for that length of time. But I just wanted to briefly mention two issues which I think would be worth mentioning at this moment in time. One is what I would call the Google Translate of the subtitling world, which is the automatic subtitling of YouTube. A lot of stuff gets subtitled these days, all sorts of things get subtitled, and a lot of stuff gets uh, ends up on YouTube and gets automatically subtitled. I would like to have a discussion on this because I would like to, to hear what people think about it. For me, it produces a stomach churning effect into anyone who knows anything about it. But um, also, I think what's worse is that I don't think it really helps um, audiences appreciate or understand what's going on. And I will give you a, just one example. I know that this is intralingual subtitling, so as I just said, I'm not going to talk about it. Well, <laughs> there are exceptions. And I think it's worth considering for all of us. Okay, so you have this. You get this subtitle here that says, if we're not going to speak up now, are things going to be easier or better a year from? now. <laughs> right? So this is the kind of thing that you see all the time. This is Seth Golding being interviewed. Um, every, I don't know what you think, but I think, you know, for me, it makes me feel a little bit ill. I can't have lunch, etc. <laughs> no, every last rule has been broken. Yeah. Line breaks, segmentation. It, okay. So that's one thing. The other thing was I wanted to mention, funny enough, was the reading speed kind of affair. <laughs> And of course, from my point of view, so let's see what I can contribute to this discussion. A lot has been said about it, so probably not a lot more. But, okay, I was going to quote Ian Pedersen. <laughs> um, Ian, Pedersen Ian Pedersen, in 2017, published on Just Trunks an article about his FAR model of evaluating the quality of subtitles. And I, I uh, reread the article recently and I thought it was quite interesting, so I, I'm going to quickly mention that. In that article, he mentions the so-called contract of illusion. Uh, the contract of illusion, well, it, it, along the lines of the suspension of disbelief, if you want, it is that contract according to which um, the, it's a contract between viewers 
and subtitles, according to which the viewers accept, as it were, the subtitles are the dialogue. Clearly, they are not the dialogue. As Pedersen puts it, so I am going to quote him, subtitles are a partial written representation of a translation of the dialogue and text on screen. A partial written representation. They are not the dialogue, clearly. So if the, while the, the viewers buy into this, the subtitles do their part by making the subtitles as invisible or as unobtrusive, at least, as possible. And that would be the kind of, you know, a bit like Victorian children, seeing not heard, or in this case, read not seen, maybe. Now, um, as we all know, th this is the kind of contract that get con gets constantly violated by someone like fan subbers, obviously, who are, you know, doing all sorts of weird and wonderful things, but we are not going to talk about some fan subbers today, because that is a, a separate chapter. Um, but what I am actually wondering is whether we are all doing it to an extent these days, and that because of resorting quite often to reading speaks which are truly through the roof. Now, again, um, I don't want to quote just Pedersen, but um, I, I wanted to show you this uh, table, which is an approximation. It is an approximation <coughs> that roughly, um, just to, to give you an idea, I often get, uh, well, we were talking about the Netflix guidelines, I often get clients, even not working for Netflix, who tell me to happily stick to the 17, but up to going up to 20 CPS, which uh, corresponds to 240 words per minute. I do look at the words per minute, not just because we read words, not characters, but because I am used to considering that kind of... Now, that kind of reading speed is absolutely stratospheric. And as you can see, my friend Pooh is happy in the first two, and he, beca he becomes very, very sad down there. Um, according to some research, and obviously I am just quoting this piece of research, which probably you will tell me that this is not necessarily proved, but what, what I have seen is that, uh, according to this research, 16.5 uh, CPS, 80% of the time, might be spent reading the subtitles. If that is true, even if that is close to true, it means that a 20 character per second viewing becomes just a reading experience, merely a reading exercise. Not to mention, from a practical, pragmatic and professional point of view, the fact that this kind of guideline will encourage the subtitlers, at least the less experienced ones, to translate every last thing that's been said, which is not what subtitling is about anyway. You know, so that is detrimental in so, on so many levels, in my, in my opinion. But I also wonder... I, I also wonder, is it just down to ignorance on the part of the client, or is, it, is this also the result of the information-rich, high-speed virtual world that we live in? Are we actually becoming, are we actually turning into the norm, the fact that we favour hyper-content to be consumed quickly, albeit half-chewed? That was just something I wanted to throw out there as food for thought. I don't have answers for this, but I am actually noticing this, obviously this is a part, part of a, a tendency. From my Neanderthal point of view, obviously I would instinctively add that there are certain norms and certain recommendations out there for a reason, and that if the viewers <coughs> spend 70, 80 or more percent of the time reading subtitles, they're not going to enjoy what they are seeing. So again, that goes into, let's throw this into the arena. Um, and yes, that's pretty much all I wanted to throw into the arena today. Um, you tell me what you think. I, uh, I think what, all we can do is educate clients, educate colleagues, and raise awareness and make sure that subtitles are not an afterthought. So th thank you to Satu for, for existing, and you know, thank you for all these organizations who actually make, make us think about what, hap what happens and what's, what's, uh, you know, what could be done <laughs> to raise, raise this awareness. And thanks, thanks to the researchers, and I always hope that, that there is more of a dialogue between research and profession, because that will benefit both in both directions. 
that said, I, all I can say is thank you very much for listening. <laughs> Please welcome Sir Ian High Andrew. Um, he's the Director of Media Operations at a &E Networks. He's been broadcaster for over 20 years now. 20 years since 99, yes. Fantastic. So I, I, I'm really happy again that he accepted our invitation. It's not very easy to get industry people come and talk to us because they think, oh, well, it's academics, they're going to talk about things we, you know, we don't really care or... We, we, we do care, we to do be care. Under the spot, but you care and, in fact, you, you accept it, so I'm, I'm, I'm really pleased. And uh, so we would like to hear from you about your perspective. As I said, it's very informal audience, so we won't be... We won't be in the academic grind and, uh, as yet. Okay, thank Good. you. Good. Okay, to start off with, I'd just like to sh show a short video of a &E content, the kind of people content that I think people would be glad to pay to watch. Just to illustrate the kind of content that we work with, and I think as previous speaker mentioned, lots of very different content, therefore quite difficult for our translators, I, I can appreciate, to, to work on yeah, some very entertaining, some very factual, um, some very specific content. So, where are we? Okay. Okay, um, what I wanted to talk to you a little bit about is from a content creator's, content owner's perspective, how we manage our localization, our languaging workflows. So, my agenda. And so we have four brands at A&E Networks UK, History, H2, CI Lifetime and Blaze. From the UK office we manage um, 13 pan-European feeds in 20 different languages. And our head office is here in London. We've got further offices in Munich, Rome, Warsaw, and Johannesburg, which is part of Europe for some reason. And <laughs> across the board, we commission around 1,500 individual language assets. So quite high volume, especially when you're considering that in-house, we only have three people in my team working on all of this. Two of them are here today, so please spare a thought for Joanna, who's in the office today by herself, <laughs> doing everyone's work. And so what, what we do, of course, we partner with language service providers, with language houses that um, create all that content for us. This, maybe I won't go into too much detail, but this is our workflow in creating subtitles. 
And I just wanted, I'm not going to go through it point by point, I just wanted to show this as sort of the appreciation, the complexity of, because the subtitling process itself is one box here. So that what goes into ordering the content, it's all, of course, everything we do is schedule driven. So the um, program scheduling team, they plan our schedules about two months out. At that point, they are released to us. The media is often still in production, we haven't received it. By that point, we know what deadlines we have to work to, and then we send those work orders to our language houses so they know what's coming down the pipeline, and they can hopefully forewarn the subtitlers which show is going to come in at what point and what the turnaround times are. And then those, those work orders moving back and forth and updated between us and the language houses. Of course, it's, the schedule is going to release two months out, they're never finalized. If one of our competitors, Discovery, has a big successful show on a Friday night, maybe we move our premiere to a Thursday, which means suddenly that the subtitle has one day less to finish a product. And yeah, and then it moves back and forth, and of course there's some payment involved as well. <laughs> the challenges we are facing in our subtitling workflow. First off, time to market. We try to be as close to the US air date as possible, about 80% of our content is originating in the US. I know some previous speakers spoke quite positively of, about fan subbing. For us, that's part of piracy, that's people stealing from us, that is money that we don't earn, that is money we can't um, share with our subtitlers. So that's this, and the way that we try, or one of the things that we try to do to combat that is try to be as close to the US on air date as possible. I mean, Game of Thrones is a big example where Sky are premiering that at 2 o'clock in the morning, the day the US are premiering it, and in Spain so they're doing something similar which led to those problems and those unfortunate mistakes in dubbing, and that is something we need to try to manage um, together with our language also on one hand, how quick can we turn around material, but what is the risk, what is the impact on, on the quality, and that is, that is difficult to manage at times. Then volume, that's there's a lot of content coming down the pipeline, and it's not always predictable. There's some autumn schedules are always busier than midsummer, so that means in late summer, when other people go on holidays, our teams and our subtitlers have to work double hard. And schedule changes, I already mentioned this, they never finalize. They try to change the schedule on the day of play out if they could. And we have, if, we have, if we have a small team in house, just three people. And they're all, apart from me, the, the, these three are all qualified linguistics and experienced translators. And I think that is really important when we're working with language houses, when we're working with subtitles, that we know the subject matter to some degree. And, but it's still it's just three managing 20 languages. And where I'm happy that, about the talent that I have recruited, um, myself, I'm German. German dubbing is not managed from my office. Delphine and Joanna are French. French a &E chance are not managed by us, so it's not a, not a great start. Luckily, Panayota is Greek, and Greek is one of our languages. So out of the 20 languages that we dab and subtitle into, only one of them we have the language skill in-house, and that is a, a challenge at times. So we really rely on our language houses and on our um, translators, subtitlers, and dabbers to really um, do the best on our behalf. And cost. It's, uh, it's more and more competition from Netflix and Amazon, other online platforms. People have more choice, but that it means potentially less people are watching, watching our channels. And as a broadcaster, it's not as easy to make money as it was 10, 15 years ago. And that, of course, translates into pressure onto our budgets and the drive to be efficient. And when we're launching a channel in a new territory, because most of our content is produced in the US, the production cost is already covered. The biggest cost in opening up um, a channel in a new territory is distribution, so getting the satellite feed up there. And the second or highest one is the localization. So there's from our business development teams, there's always pressure on it. Why is languaging so expensive? Why does it cost me £50,000 a year to localize this channel? And we have to try to explain to financial business people who have no understanding, no interest in localization, why we're adding real value. And what I always try to say to them is, but try selling the channel without localization. See how much people want to pay for it. <laughs> it normally shuts them up. And last, not least, other panelists have already mentioned it as well, technology. 
Um, we have to deal with a real problem in lack of um, subtitle QC software that actually help us validate at scale that um, the subtitles we have actually match the video that we have. So we, 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 for some of our videos we get 14, 15 different subtitle files, different languages. And if somewhere in the process they've been labeled incorrectly, if the wrong ISO code, it's very difficult for us to identify that this is the Russian or the Polish subtitles. Bad examples so of calling it that. Um, <laughs> in, in principle. And also that um, when we have different versions, so we've got a daytime cut of a show and a post nine cut. And of course that means that the subtitle files have to be re edited as well. If and it, it's very it's a very manual process to validate that that is actually correct. And we try to of course, automate our processes um, between us and the language house so that it's not just relying on spreadsheets and emails back and forth for the orders. And machine translation is, I'm surprised no one has mentioned so far, but for us that is a big topic. And again, sort of the, um, the people in the business who don't directly work with localization read a headline, they see Google Translate, they see all of this automated sub subtitling on YouTube and such. Why can't we do that? Why don't do we do that? It must be so much cheaper, so much faster. And we have to gently explain to them why we can't and why it's not ready yet and probably will never be fully ready. <laughs> so, so I'm rattling through a few different subjects. Um, quality control processes that we deploy at A&E, we've got four distinct levels. Um, first, of course, our language vendors, they, everything that is delivered by the subtitles is checked by them, first for linguistic, editorial quality, but also technical quality, and by that I mean um, reading speeds and, and things like that. Then our playout provider, who do the transmission of, the, um, of our channels, they again, they check that the subtitle files are in the right format, that they're technically compatible with their systems, and on playout, they view our channels and they view the subtitles so they make sure, again of course they don't speak all 14 or 15 languages that we have on each feed, but they make sure that subtitles are present, that they are in sync and they pick up um, unfortunately quite a, quite a few issues at times. And what we try to do is on a regular basis, at least once a year, um, hire some independent subtitlers and translators to validate some of the product we're putting out. So that is, that's a real cost to the business, but we think that it adds real value to, just to make sure that our standards and our provider standards are, are not slipping. Research. We have a research department, but they focus on the ratings of our channels, the overnight, um, the reach, the stickiness, how if viewers are coming back, if we're attracting new viewers, um, advertisement impact, which essentially means how much money we're, we're earning. That is, that is their focus. They do no regular research around localization. I'm sorry to say. That's why we rely on you guys in academia to, extend to actually in, help us inform and to develop our standards. So, but what we're currently doing, um, we are financing a research project together with other broadcasters that is run by MISA. Um, MISA is the Media Entertainment Service Alliance. It's a Group of it's, it's, it's a group where broadcasters and language vendors get together to discuss challenges that the, and initiatives that the industry is facing. So it's an open forum where we, are, we discuss um, what we want to do with our with our competitors. And what we're doing in the moment, what we're just about to commission, is a piece of research into um, viewers' preferences in across our European <coughs> markets. So just to understand is do they consume localized video in a different way on linear and non-linear platforms. Are the traditional dubbing territories maybe more open to consume subtitle media because they receive in online they're consuming more subtitle media? Are they maybe open to do that on linear broadcasting? So those kind of questions we are, um, what we're going to send to select audience and that's actually what I would like to say to the academics in the room. I think that might be that's something we can collaborate on, on, on research, see if there's some commonality, uh, if there's something that maybe you can add expertise to make sure we're asking the right question. And just because I think it should, collaboration like that should benefit all of us. And we just completed a research project in Germany. I know it's a dubbing market, so I'm not going to talk much about that. And of course, we we rely on our language houses to um, support us with knowledge on the market that we're into, what is the appropriate style of localization, 
how do we do lip, some lip sync dubbing, voice over dubbing? Do we have to do we just subtitle, or do we also need to localize the on-screen graphics and text? Okay. And a case study. So this is just on the, on the impact of localization on how, why it is so important to us. So what this illustrates is last year we on our Hungarian feed we used to um, dub of course all our shows, but all the promos, all the adverts in between were just in English. And last year we started dubbing them. So I'm sorry, I keep talking about dubbing, not subtitling. But it's <laughs> but, um, so, but last year we started dubbing those, and year on year they increased. The view, viewing has re, um, increased by nine percent, without any other significant changes in the market or the way that the channels run. So I think there's a really nice example of even if they're just the um, dubbing of the promos, the 30 second promos between the shows, how that impacts viewers' experience and enjoyment um, of our content and the importance of it. Audience feedback. Um, like I mentioned, we, we don't have the capacity and the, and the resources in-house to check all the output, all our localized output. So what we really rely is on our audience and we, with social media, with our Facebook, with Twitter, we, um, our social media team, they pass on any feedback, any questions, any queries I get from viewers about the subtitling to us and we would investigate all of that because it's a real good way to benchmark to actually understand of what we're delivering is appreciated by the audience or if there's any room for improvement. So one recent example that we received just last month from Holland, I'm not sure if anyone speaks Dutch here, Dutch here but they're talking about, it's on a show American Pickers where they pick by lots of old stuff and in this case, a tin, old toys, tin toys, and it takes an issue with how that's been translated. And we did investigate, and this is an extract from our response, and we did agree that actually the wrong term was used. And as I sort of included in here, just to, to highlight that we do really do, even despite the high volume and all the, all the pressure that the team has, we do really care passionately about the quality of our output, and we take any feedback from our viewers serious and every complaint is gold, that's what I keep telling my team and that's hence the show of Baltic Gold, one of our big um, Polish commissions and now it makes sense why the picture is there. <laughs> and yes, and, 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 this one is, and, and today there was a lot of discussion about the technicalities of um, subtitling and reading speeds and things like that. I think the, the, mo the complaints that we get the most are not about that, they are about the accurate translation of um, certain terms. And because we have so many factual shows or factual based shows, then it's, it's very important that we, we get that right. I rattled through that. And I know we've got <laughs> questions later, but that's it from me for now. I hope that was um, useful and informative. Christine and yeah, Jan Hendrik as well. Yes, please. Shall I bring chairs? Are you happy to stand? Yeah. <laughs> so I, I really appreciate having that um, industry point of view. I, when I said that no one sounded really interested when I contacted them, is because I approached the BBC. I think this is the fifth, the fifth year in a row that I contacted them for different things in relation to migrating text because they produced some. Uh, audience research in the 1990s was it um so uh, there's two engineers that and, and they work with software you know probably already updated and 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 they and they did and, and they um, agreed to, to come and see us and i believe as you said there's so much uh, in terms of opportunities for collaboration and really improving um the content that, that gets out there um, and that's why today i think uh, uh, you've done an amazing job of you know, discussing different points of view. Uh, I would like the audience to come to give their perspectives, ask questions. I have a question for um, Adriana about the videos that you showed us. So, out of all the different examples that you showed us, did you have to transcribe any of that? Did you get scripts? Some of the videos that you, you did, kind of historical videos as well, mm -hmm. with the, the music YouTube video in particular. 
So yeah, is, is transcription ever part of your work? Well, it really depends. It's not always the same. I don't transcribe as such. Uh, either I work from template, as has been mentioned before, in which case the client would provide a, an English template, which would create subtitles, which I then use as a template. And I really, really do mean template. Um, I, I, um, I'm not very keen on, on working with templates because they are created by someone who thinks in English for and when, when I translate them, then I have to uh, work with parameters which are not mine. The other things that I do is so-called origination, in which case I would listen to the audio and then create my own subtitles into Italian. I don't transcribe and translate. Okay, so um, when you do origination, you can either get the script or not, as the case may be. Obviously, that is a bit of a, uh, an issue if you don't get the script because you have to rely on audio. Um, <clears throat> sometimes you have to just basically just if you're not sure of something use uh, native speakers to make sure that what you're listening to is actually what you're hearing is actually correct um, but yeah so you don't do transcription as such, as such it's part of the whole process uh, can I ask you a follow-up question related to templates when you get templates how much flexibility is there then for you to actually change those templates, because obviously some cultures, research has shown, prefer one-line subtitles, yeah. others have a preference for two. And if you're getting a template with two-liners and you're wanting to make them one-liners, have you got enough flexibility to yeah. actually redo the spotting to yeah. make it correspond to what you want? Or are you stuck with a template that you're actually given? Again, that depends on the client. I try to work with people who are nice and reasonable, I understand what, <laughs> what subtitling is all about. Um, and, and, and normally I ask them to be able to do just that, to use that as a template, but be able to merge, split, and probably retime as well, um, on the basis that Italian is not English, and therefore I would need to actually rethink the spotting, not just translate, you know, you don't just translate, clearly. So that is... In terms of the two-liners versus the one-liner, that's never really an issue. I mean, you, because it's really down to you. If you, yeah. you know, it's really down to you whether you use two lines or one line. It depends on the, the amount of content you, you have in your subtitles, really. Do you want to? Add yeah, I would. To? I would second that. I mean, a, a one-liner. Um, I only came across it in in bilingual subtitles, maybe for Switzerland. That's not some rare scenarios where they would like to have French and German maybe underneath each other. So but then you have to reduce your two line into one line. But that's maybe an exceptional case. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know of many cases where I was advised to only use one mm -hmm. line. Um, but I can uh, totally second uh, what you said about um, trying to adapt and um, mm -hmm merge and split subtitles. Um, it's just that yeah, some clients uh, who work with online platforms make it a bit harder for you because their software is not necessarily as easy to work with um, as your own software. So, um, and then it, it means it's more time consuming to actually get the nice file you want to, to have. Um, and most subtitles just tend to go through these fixed templates and, and fill them in. Um, so there I see like two different approaches, mm. doing it from scratch or using a template as you said just as a template, mm. as a raw version and that, that you turn into something new or you just take it and literally just fill in your translation but you're never going to have a good result of that I believe. Mm. Yeah. We have time for one more question or two, very brief one. Okay. Uh, hi. Um, after not entirely sure I have a question for you, Jan Henrik, I just thought it was very interesting um, talking about uh, the feedback, how you respond to your feedback. Um, I think the biggest challenge for subtitles, I'm not a subtitle, but I commission subtitles. And for us, as a small uh, subtitling offering house, rates, uh, you know, it's a big challenge. And I think most of the subtitles in here that's, that's the biggest challenge. Um, 
you know, unless Netflix start uh, losing their subscribers, um, like you said in Hungary, you saw an increase in, in uh, customers or users of your channels uh, because they're responding to the dubbing. Uh, and you, like you said, um, you take the, um, the feedback seriously, the QC, uh, and it's a positive for you. Just like um, you know, any feedback, any social media um, uh, chat about something like Roma, uh, actually, I think that was one of the first times I even heard about Roma, and it's what made me want to watch the film. You know, <laughs> it's still promotion and advertising. Uh, so I think until um, people start switching off and um, you know, cancelling the subscriptions to your channels, uh, essentially, as long as the, the work gets done and people are still watching, whether or not there are two line subtitles or whether the reading speed is uh, you know, 12, 15 or 17 or 20, uh, I think, I, I still don't know how we're going to overcome the challenge of rates. I'm being undercut by 50% sometimes uh, because I, I compete against um, bigger subtitling houses who, or companies who offer a full service. Um, I have companies who will pay, uh, um, who will charge four hundred and fifty pounds for uh, a two and a half hour musical of two and a half thousand subtitles. You know, and it's German. I know Christina I've worked with you in the past. I mean, can you imagine uh, working five days on a musical and charging, uh, you know, four hundred and fifty pounds? But that's from the supplier. So God knows what they paid the freelancer. So I don't really know if I have a question. I just think it's interesting that you're bringing yeah. up this. Uh, I hope you, you know, I worked for SCI in the past and uh, you know, I've seen, uh, we discussed this earlier, when I first started working for SCI, and imagine from your point of view, from my point of view, um, when I first started working for them, we paid per subtitle. Mm -hmm. You know, imagine going to your clients saying, uh, this feature will cost you either three hundred pounds or seven hundred pounds, uh, depending on how much they talk. You just can't work like that. But it's a very accurate reflection of the, the work that you actually do as a subtitler. So I don't have an answer, but I think this great thing is is um, is a big challenge now. And I'm, I, I don't know. I, that's not even a question. I just think. How are we going to tackle this? Yeah. Got all these really competent, experienced, well qualified subtitles in this room. And then some companies say that there are, is a lack of talent and they advertise for people mm. to languages to do the job. It's, it's bizarre. It's, so it thank you. you know, and I've seen you in Germany, in Berlin, talking, and I think it's great that you come out to these events. So thanks for that. I appreciate that. I think it's important that as a whole community involved in the organisation, we talk to each other and understand what the pressures are that other parties are under. And um, the rates, I mean, when we we have long-term relationships with our language service providers and we pay them per minute. So, but and we don't know exactly, of course, what they pay their freelancers because that's their their margin. But what we do take care of with new um, localization houses is that they pay their freelancers on time. And, then, and we also do some independent research, see if we mm -hmm. hear any grumbles online in the subtitling community that they are a bad provider. Mm -hmm. So that we, we pay attention to that and to, as much as we can, because I think we have, even if it's a relationship once, one step removed, we're still responsible for it, of course. Thank you. I think we are definitely now ready for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> because it be, okay, but just very, very quick. Very, very quick. This is for Ian. Are you going to publish the results of your research on viewers' preferences? For me, sir, we are not because we're paying for it and <laughs> other broadcasters have not contributed to it, so we're not going to share it with them. No. It's, 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 it's company research, not academic okay. research. It's, it's our... It's a shame. It is, but I, I want to ask, let me, let me call for that. We're not going to share it with other broadcasters, but if someone from the Academia research um, point is interested. I think that might be a different answer. Okay, great. So this is really good. So you have Ian, Ian Hendrick contact. So just, uh, we are recording the session. So academics, my approach him for research data. Great. Okay, thank you very much. I think we are ready to
everyone. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to uh, welcome four speakers to our afternoon panel on adaptation and translation. Um, I think what we'll do, uh, we'll uh, have the four speakers um, give their papers and then we'll do a Q&A afterwards. Um, our first speaker is Kirsty Sedgman uh, from the University of Bristol. And Kirsty is lecturer in theatre at the, at the University of Bristol, specialising in, in the study of theatre audiences. And this includes engagement, experience, community, fandom and response. Her work has been published in a variety of journals and edited collections, as well as two monographs, locating the audience in 2016 and the reasonable audience in 2018. Uh, Kirsty is currently engaged in a three-year British Academy Fellowship investigating audience engagements with regional theatre through time. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction and thank you to the organisers for inviting me here today, particularly because I'm about to share something with you that I'm aware might get me kicked out of this room. <laughs> so we'll see. I am ashamedly monolingual. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> And my work today is focused, for reasons of proximity and money, on studying British theatre audiences. So I was slightly surprised when I got Kit's lovely initial email inviting me to come and talk to you all today. And I did fess up, so I'm not here, I don't think, under any false pretenses. So what might my work as somebody who studies audience reception, response, experience might be able to bring to a conference like this, which is looking at all things adaptation and translation? Well, we had some fascinating papers this morning on the practicalities and epistemologies and all of those wonderful things. What happens when you try to subtitle a, a media text? Uh, a TV show or even a piece of theatre into another language. My argument is going to be that all acts of audience research, listening to audiences, drawing out their discursive memories and understandings and responses and feelings about, about a media text or an art experience like theatre, all of those acts of research are fundamentally acts of translation. <clears throat> They're acts of interpretation in that audiences are putting their, their grand, great, big thoughts and experiences and uh, <coughs> all these cognitive and emotional and aesthetic responses into words, they translating them for us. And then we are also engaging in acts of translation in order to make sense of and to tell stories about patterns of audience response from the data that we gather. So that's the argument that I'm going to start trying to make today. Hence the title of my paper, Evidencing Audience Experience Through Audience Talk. I want to start to ask what we're actually able to know about the aesthetic thing itself, the theatre event, the, uh, the painting on the wall, the concerts that you go to listen to, what are we able to know about what that thing is doing through listening to people talk about it afterwards? So I'm a, I'm a discursive audience researcher, focused, I'm fascinated by audience talk, and I'm going to think a little bit today about what it means to do this kind of work, and what claims we're able to ask, uh, what claims we're able to make as audience researchers. So what is audience research? Um, my basic contention is always that there's no one right or wrong way to study audiences. <coughs> there are multiple methods, everything from interviews and focus groups and questionnaires to studying online discourse, comments left on YouTube videos, I've done some work on that, edited actually my very first article was studying YouTube responses to a Tony performance of Neil Patrick Harris's um, 2013 uh, Tony performance, I think it was bigger, edited by Laura, who's coming up after me. So it's been very nice to reunite with Laura. What are we able to know from studying these comments left online, on forums, social media? Um, everything from oral histories to archival research. My current project, which is funded by the British Academy, 
is exploring audience engagement through time with a regional theatre company, uh, Bristol Old Vic. So I started in the archives drawing out audience letters and correspondence and tracking that through into a new empirical study of audiences today. Who talks about the theatre and in what ways? Those are the questions that I'm asking. But also big data, quantitative surveys, cognitive science, neuroaesthetics, and also creative participatory methods, so using play and art to draw out people's responses to. Loads of different ways to draw out audiences' engagements and investments and experiences and responses. But what are we doing in and through that work? Well, my field of study comes, it's, I'm, I see myself as absolutely embedded in a field of study that goes back to the 1930s, coming out of media and mass communications research, called audience studies. Um, and the reason I put this picture up behind you is because audience research in its very, in audience studies in its very first iterations was embedded in a tradition that we call the effects tradition, which means that these new mass media forms were coming out, the rise of propaganda caused serious concerns about the potential danger of mass media to assumedly vulnerable and passive audiences. We've got then the, that traced its way through into the Frankfurt School's hypodermic model, which was Past the effects tradition, it was essentially theorising the audiences as passive, vulnerable to media messages, which they saw as being injected directly into the hearts and minds of viewers. But audience studies as we know it today has grown up absolutely against that tradition, the tradition of making assumptions about audiences as a homogenised mass. And audience studies, the best audience studies today, from Martin Barker's work to Yan Ang to Jamie Jensen, um, the best audience work, I think, investigates the tension between the power of the media to persuade and to influence, and the power of, and agency of audiences to pick and choose what media to watch and how they watch it, to engage in productive, often fan communities, and to, in certain cases, remake media anew. So we, I th I, we heard today some talk about fan subtitling practices which could be situated as part of the broader for array of fan creative practices like fan art and fan fiction, literally <laughs> rewriting favourite texts. So that's my field, that's where I'm situated, but I'm also a theatre studies person. I'm in the theatre and performance studies, I'm in the theatre and performance studies department, and that's where I see myself as located in terms of my field. And yet theatre studies has a long tradition of ignoring the audience. Actually, that's not quite true. Theatre studies has never ignored the audience. We paid attention to spectatorship. But as Helen Freshwater says in her foundational um, theatre and audience book in 2009, <coughs> she said that we've been much more comfortable making assumptions about audiences than we have been talking to audiences themselves about what they get out of things. We've been much more comfortable making claims about who these people are and why they come and what they get out of going to the theatre, or perhaps rather what we think they should have got. So there's the ideal imagined audience has been at the centre of theatre studies for a long time. And that's starting to change now. Since 2009 we've seen emerging PhD, early career researchers particularly, spearheading the field of, of audience studies, the projects bringing audience studies into theatre. And that's all about addressing big assumptions made about audiences. Addressing these claims about powerful effects and seeing actually how, um, how theatre operates for audiences in practice and what people are getting out of those engagements. <coughs> So this study is, to date, has mostly theorised experience, talked about the audience but not to them, and erased the meanings, pleasures, disappointments, motivations of diverse audiences, or perhaps only paid attention to them in certain <coughs> ways. And I want to think a little bit, very quickly, about why this might be. Well, first of all, Eleanor Belfiore, in an amazing essay called On Bullshit in Cultural Policy and Practice, 
talks about a profound confusion in research that has sought to engage with audiences to find out demographics and motivations for participation, a confusion between what she calls genuine research and advocacy research. The idea that we know audiences love the theatre, they love us, we just have to get them to say so. And therefore to advocate for our continued existence in increasingly imperiled uh, and, and austere funding situations. So that's one reason why theatre studies has tended to approach the audience and talk to them in a particular way to draw out imagined narratives of success. There's a real danger, actually, for cultural organisations. There's a real risk in having an independent researcher come in and listen to audiences, because what if audiences say something that you can't afford to hear? Um, there's also been a tendency within theatre practice and the cultural industries more generally, and within theatre studies, to veer around the idea that audience experience could be something that you can measure. And this is exemplified in the Arts Council <laughs> of Great Britain, their recent, um, Arts Council of England, their recent Culture Counts Toolkit. Recently renamed the, renamed the Insight and Impact Engagement <laughs> Toolkit. And, um, and then, after they poured a lot of money into developing it, quietly, I think, started being sidelined now because they said actually impact and insight and, and value and, and quality, the word that they keep using is quality, doesn't matter actually. It's that relevant. So, all this work might be going to waste, which is probably actually a good thing because what this toolkit is asking national portfolio organisations, basically the uh, big organisations to whom the Arts Council gives the big bucks. What they're asking them to do is to get audiences to rate the quality of an experience along these dimensions. And then artists only get to rate the experience also on those final three dimensions, which were originality, risk and excellence, because actually audiences apparently can't be trusted to assess the event on those <coughs> metrics. But the, uh, this is the idea that things like concept and presentation and distinctiveness and challenge can be boiled down into quantitative judgments. And that's something that my work seeks to challenge. Because I also do the occasional post note questionnaire. I'm, the, I'm an advocate of what Martin Barker calls the quali quant questionnaire, which does use Lippert scale type ratings to say, can you, for example, can you rate the can you rate this experience on a scale of five from excellent to very poor? But the difference is that I know that those ratings in and of themselves, by themselves, are meaningless. My excellent might be your very poor. What interests me are the systems of criteria that people bring to the event in order to make sense of it, in order to make those judgments. Why does one person coming to an event or an experience from one position, a subject position, with a particular sense of self and community and identity and lived history, take from it such different meanings and effects than somebody coming at it from a completely different <coughs> position. Those are the kinds of questions that my work seeks to answer, and that's not something that you can know anything about if all you're doing is metricizing value in this way. Um, but what really are we actually studying here? What are we able to know about all of these things? Am I studying response, audience response or audience reception? Or am I studying their experience? Um, or what about their perception of their experience? Is that actually what I'm looking for? What are we, what are we claiming to have created knowledge of when we're doing this work? We can reach toward an answer by looking to the long tradition of work in media, mass communications, cultural studies, audience studies, in other words, that has been wrestling with these questions. This is Elizabeth Bird quoting Edward Bruner, talking about the joy of audience research in Elizabeth Bird's case into film and TV, but the joy of audience research being its messiness the reaching for knowledge on the part of the researcher. And what we're reaching towards here is an understanding of how people, the people sitting in front of us, in the case of interviews, or um, the people sitting at home filling out a survey, what we're understanding is how those people are reaching for knowledge. Reaching for words to describe what in theatre studies we so often continue to 
we so often and we continue to call indescribable experiences. The ineffable, the arts are considered to be ineffable. And I think that that is the real reason why so many of my theatre studies colleagues resist audience research. So for example, Patrice Pavis cautions against fixing the event by translating its images and emotions into words. Eugenio Barber articulates unease with the stability of language, the belief that the memory of experience lived as theatre, once translated into sentences that last, risks becoming petrified into pages that cannot be penetrated. And yet, as people like Elizabeth Bird, Edward Bruner are saying, what we're exploring is not necessarily the experience itself, but how people are coming to these experiences. What is happening in and through the translation? I think I'm going to skip that bit because I've talked quite a lot already. Um, yeah, I'll move on to that. What is it that we're able to know in and through this translation between life as experienced or, or life as lived, life as experienced, and life as told? What is happening in and through that process? Yen Ang in Living Room Wars talks about this as an, a political imperative as much as anything else. Because, this is a big quote, and there are people at the back who might not be able to read it, so I'm going to read it all out for you. She says, In empirical audience research especially, it is important to reflect upon the status of the knowledge produced. After all, scrutinising audiences does, is not an innocent practice. It does not take place in a social and political vacuum. Historically, the hidden agenda of audience research, even when it presents itself as pure and objective, has all too often been its commercial or political usefulness. In other words, what we should reflect upon is the political interventions we make when talking about audiences. And I'd add talking to audiences as well. We cannot afford to ignore the political dimensions of the process and practice of knowledge production itself. She goes on to say that this is because audience research is always already an act of interpretation. And therefore, I would argue, it is an act of translation itself as well. Answers, partial ones to be sure, both permit, frisial and committed, are to be constructed in the form of interpretation, she says. So this is, I think, all about translation. Not from one language to another, but from experience into words. What can we understand through that process? When people are living an experience to when they are remembering and making sense of that experience to when they're describing it for us as researchers. Just letting Kit take a picture. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what I've explored. This is my most recent book, which is exploring the discourse around theatre etiquette campaigns, campaigns to retrain audiences in how to behave more appropriately. And I've been exploring the rhetorical manoeuvres and the power manoeuvres involved in telling others how they should behave, in feeling yourself to be a more reasonable person with the right to say, my hopes and preferences for this event supersede yours for all these historical reasons. But I started this project with Locating the Audience, which is the book of my PhD, looking at the first year of National Theatre Wales's work, which was at that time a theatre company <coughs> coming into being, the very launch year. And we talk a lot now in uh, this studies about cultural value, because that's a term helpfully provided to us by the HRC's giant funding proffer back in 2014. They're currently reviving it, so there's more money floating around out there for, for someone. We're not sure who they're going to give it to or how, or we're all waiting eagerly. But what that means is basically the way that we value culture and make sense of it has historically been according to the most privileged perspectives, critics, um, scholars, and, and particularly rich people get to dictate the terms of aesthetic value. They get to set the, the agenda. And what this kind of work is trying to do, cultural value discursive audience research work, is seeking to refigure value not as an endpoint, not, uh, not just as impact or benefit or output, something that can 
be reached towards something that exists and inspire us and fix that audiences carry away with them when they leave the theatre. Instead, this work is refiguring the idea of value as a process. And my argument is that we can get a sense of the process of valuation how people are reaching for words to describe these indescribable experiences, we can get a sense of it partial and fragmented and complete and, and um, interpretive, a sense of the process and action by paying attention to language use, not just to what is said, but to how it is said. So that's what I did in the National Theatre Wales work, and I just want to tell you about one conversation I had with one audience member, which I think exemplified something really interesting. So when I say I'm interested in not just what people are saying, well, I liked it, it was good for these reasons, and then I can go, well, this performance was it's in fact so good for those reasons. I'm not interested in if something's good or bad, I'm interested in the complexity of response, the messiness, why some people like things and why some people don't, and, what un and all those underlying things that people bring to bear when they're making these assessments and these judgments. I talked to a woman who I've called Carol. I had, she filled out a questionnaire um, afterwards saying, I liked it, but she rated it good. She didn't rate it excellent. She rated it good. But in the questionnaire, she said, I liked it, but, I liked it, but. And there was something really interesting emerging just in this, this tiny box, about um, three sentences, that was something really interesting <coughs> in that box that was about the idea that she was a Barmouth local, and she repeated this in the follow-up interview I did with her for a I'm Barmouth native, I'm a native of Barmouth, this is my home, I don't live here anymore. In fact, I live two hours away, but I came back specifically because my sister told me about it, knowing I'd be interested as a native of Barmouth. I know all these stories, and I was excited to see how National Theatre Wales would show them back to me. But that's not quite what, what they did. That guy there is Mark Rees, and he, in our interview, he branded himself an experimental avant-garde performance maker. And he said that this actually is a three-hour promenade performance, which means that audiences are taken on a tour around Barmer, and there are vignettes of performance that happen along the way. But it's not retelling Barmouth's history in any representative or directly understandable way. So that, for example, there was a moment on the beach where there was a circle of windbreakers and two performers dressed in old-fashioned bathing uniforms performed a kind of sexy gymnastic dance. Then audiences who were sitting on lilos around the outside were asked to raise them and make a salute to the Malabar monster. And then they were waved away across the beach. So that's the kind of nod towards Barmouth's history, this local town, all its local stories and embedded histories, nodding towards it rather than performing it back. And the Maubach monster was a hoax, kind of like Nessie, um, happened in the 1920s. It's a known part of Barmouth's history, but they weren't playing it back. They weren't playing it back as characters and themes. They were just doing avant-garde experimental kind of enlivenings of Barmouth's history. And Carol said this, well, it didn't mention anything about the education of Barmouth or the town or the farming up there, the sheep farming, the hill farmers, the fishermen, nothing about the life of Barmouth. It was all about the life of the French coming in and the Americans. But then have I got it wrong? There's something really interesting just in that full stop there. Then after telling me a piece of local history, I said, well, that's really interesting. I had no idea. And she said, you see, we know all these little bits, but nothing came out in. Dot, dot, dot. That's why it's sad that their underpinning knowledge wasn't dot, dot, dot. Perhaps they didn't want to portray that. Perhaps they were trying to portray something else the theatre. I don't know. And I had a choice here about how to present this to an audience. What kind of story am I telling as a researcher? I could have just told a story that summarised this conversation and said, look, she hoped to get this and she didn't get it. And there's something really interesting about that disjunction. But for me, what I found fascinating about this conversation were those ellipses. What is happening in and through those moments where she trailed off? And there's a sense here, and I say a sense because, again, I am telling a story. I'm interpreting what I think is behind the words, not just the words themselves, but how they're put together. I felt that there's a sense here that in these moments of training off, she was straining to complete a criticism, but felt she couldn't because 
as she went on to say, well, I'm not a theatre expert. I don't go to the theatre. And there, that idea, but have I got it wrong? Perhaps they were trying to portray something else the theatre, I don't know. So here, my argument was that there are two kinds of expertise in tension with one another. First of all, the sense of professional expertise, the idea that this is National Theatre Wales. I'm sure they know what they're doing. They're probably trying to do something that I just don't get. So maybe I don't have the right to critique what I've seen here today. But then also, against that, rubbing up against it, continually that sense of local expertise, that this is my place, these are my stories. Maybe I do have the right to say, but I wanted you to give me this and you didn't, why? So this exemplified for me a difficulty which emerged in a number of other conversations but was really exemplified here, a difficulty for the non-expert theatre-goer of completing criticisms, of legitimating what she felt she had to say and her right to the kind of experience that she'd hoped to see. Um, this is from my most recent <coughs> project, just one more quote, one more audience quote. And this, I think, goes to show why the idea that we can metricise value according to set ratings, Likert scale ratings alone, with no additional information, is nonsense. Because this person went to see The Caretaker by Pinter at Bristol Alvik, and he rated the show awful. And he went on to explain, well, I rated it awful because it was so powerful. Now, power is something that as theatre makers, as theatre scholars, we strive for. We say theatre is great because it's powerful. And the powerful effect doesn't always have to be pleasant. It can be unpleasant. But if it's done something powerful, then it's done something great. Now, imagine if we hadn't got this detail here. The actors did their absolute best, orally, physically, clinically, but I simply hated the play. I had a feeling of being locked into my seat in the presence of three people I disliked. I stayed, out, I stayed out on the second half, so I only saw the first half. But imagine if we didn't have that detail, and we went, oh, well, 40% of people have rated it awful, so I guess it's an awful play. So, to sum up, what I'm arguing here is that talk can never be just understood as truth, can never be just quoted as dis direct slices of experience or response and taken up to face value. All information that we get as researchers is going to be fragmentary and incomplete and we are doing, we're doing powerful work in putting that together and we're doing that according to our own subject positions and senses of self and ideological biases. And the best that we can do I think is to acknowledge where we're coming from and why we've put the picture together in this way. And as researchers, we're not just uncovering knowledge, we're constructing it through interpretation, through multiple processes of translation. But as Kim Schroeder says, the methods available to us may not be perfect, but there is no alternative except ignorance. So that's why I do this work. Thank you very much. Um, next up, we've got uh, Laura MacDonald. Uh, Laura is a senior lecturer in musical theatre at the University of Portsmouth. Um, her articles have appeared in a number of journals and edited volumes, and she's currently completing a monograph investigating the making and marketing of long running Broadway musicals. Um, and she's currently co-editing the Routledge Companion to the Musical Theatre, forthcoming in 2021. Um, and other um, essays forthcoming uh, in edited collections include the first scholarly evaluation of Shanghai Disneyland, as well as an examination of trends in European and East Asian musical theatre fan practices. Thank you, and thanks for such uh, ideal programming. Um, it's absolutely ideal to be following Kirsty, and I think you'll easily see why I'm writing an essay for Kirsty right now, and she's writing one for me. Um, uh, so ditto on everything. Um, I was bilingually educated in Canada, and my language skills diminish as we move eastwards. 
Um, so I research theater in countries where I don't speak the language. I don't have fluency and I do it anyway. So shock horror. Um, I'm sure I'm going to make mistakes today and you can correct me on my, uh, my poor, uh, my my poor evaluation or assessment. Um, this is a travel log. I hope you've packed your bags. We're going to go to Japan, uh, South Korea, and China in the next 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what else do I need to say as a preamble? I think that's enough. Um, so this is uh, where we're going to get to the pirates. When I came up with this title, poets and pirates, I wasn't thinking just of of uh, formal translation from one language to another, uh, but also the tone or the character of translation, that a more poetic or a formal um, official translation is maybe a bit more elegant than the um, amateur translations of fans or um, some more awkward uh, fan labor. So I'm not just interested in the, the specific scripts of, of the musicals that I study, but in uh, all kinds of translation that might be done quite elegantly, but also really roughly um, for, for good reason. Uh, so if you haven't recognized this already, this is an image from Les Miserables, which I'm sure is exactly as it was when you might have seen it with um, dozens of Chinese workers um, in an all-girl production in which Jean Valjean was basically eliminated as a character. Um, so uh, this is uh, the work of Chinese pirates. Um, I'm not going to give you any more identifying details because this is basically an illegal production. This was not licensed. This was translated by teachers and performed by students at a girls' school. Um, but I wanted to start there to give you a sense of just how much agency audiences have and, uh, and hint towards my reading of fan practices as, as audience practices, that, that the fan work comes this begins through spectatorship that might lead to something uh, more generative. Uh, so that's where we're, we're aiming to get. And that was in, um, I don't even want to say which city. Um, that was in China in 2016. Uh, but we'll go back to uh, Japan in the 1980s. Uh, when Den Fujita, the president and founder of McDonald's Japan, sponsored a month-long run of 42nd Street in Tokyo in 1987 by an all-American cast, he equated the tour with importing hamburgers. Uh, and I, I'm using this example because there are theater scholars who compare musicals to McDonald's and refer to them as Mick Theater, uh, that musicals are uh, cookie-cutter replications around the world. However, if you've been to McDonald's in another country, you'll know that it's actually quite localized. So my reading of McTheater is that actually the comparison of musicals to hamburgers is quite useful if you think about that localization of the food product. Uh, but Mr. Fujita said, what better musical portrays the American dream and American culture than David Merrick's 42nd Street? So this is a musical, if you don't know the original Ruby Keeler film about a chorus girl's rise. Uh, to stardom, um, you're going to go out there a kid, but you're going to come back a star. Um, Fujita said, uh, I am continuously concerned about McDonald's contribution to Japanese culture and always seek new ways in which the Japanese people can learn about the American culture. He thought this was a cultural exchange of the highest order for McDonald's to be bringing this musical to Japan. So I, I do think the consumption of a musical is richer and more powerful and satisfying than eating a hamburger. Um, but his comparison is still apt. The musical theater form, with all of its heightened emotion, um, like the tastiness of a hamburger, is regularly consumed and enjoyed by audiences far away from Western sites of production. Uh, but while Asian spectators have indeed eagerly gulped down American and European musicals, their spectatorship is more complicated than the digestion of a hamburger. Um, I'm not going to read the whole paper. Um, this is just to get that quote out. Uh, so I'm focusing on South Korea and Japan because those are two of the largest non-English language musical theater industries in the world, um, and China is now poised to overtake them. Uh, and in my larger project, I'm interested in things like U.S. imperialism and the political relationships uh, between all of those countries, which are clearly linked to the progress of this Western uh, cultural form. Uh, so we are going to begin our travels uh, on the pavement in Tokyo. Um, 
Uh, and I'm trying to also showcase a little bit of my research in terms of the kinds of documents and sources I use. So I took this photo. Most of the photos here are photos I've taken. I was on my way to meet some Japanese theater producers because I often like to engage with the formal creators of musicals. I interview writers and composers and directors, and I go and meet producers. Um, I am laughing at myself now because I knew what this was, but I didn't recognize it. I walked down the street and there were these hordes of women silently sat on the pavement, some of them wearing matching scarves, others had matching jackets on. I went off to my meeting and it was only afterwards that I realized these were musical theater fans. Uh, these are the very well-known fans of Takarazuka, the all-female musical theater company in Japan, uh, which started in the very early 20th century uh, as a strategy by a railway company to encourage people to buy train tickets. So if you bought a train ticket and took the trip to Osaka, you could see a show at the end of it. More than 2.5 million uh, spectators go to these shows every year now. The company has continued. Uh, female performers play male characters, and they tend to perform musicals uh, from the West or telling Western stories. And very quickly in the history of the Takarazuka company, fan clubs were formed uh, as a way for the fans to connect more with the performers and really connect to uh, these female stories and this kind of girl culture. Um, and yet I didn't recognize that because to me, theater fans are loud and boisterous and full of emotion and enthusiasm. If you've ever been at a stage door in the West End, you've seen this, these women were silent. And I did see one of these these Japanese women stars enter the theater and they were just silent. They just get, talk about gaze tracking. They <laughs> tracked her uh, and then that was it. They were done. And they might not be going to the theater that day. So we have this not imagined community. We have the actual community of spectators, which is something that fan clubs for theater, for musical theater facilitate. Nearby, this is in Ginza, fairly upmarket part of Tokyo. This is a shop for uh, where theater audiences, theater fans can buy programs, DVDs. Um, I bought ticket subs for musicals from the 1960s. Um, so uh, this is just a flavor of um, the audience uh, experiences or, or actions in Japan. So there's this dedication, this marking of presence outside the theater, as well as additional consumption in the shop where you can further uh, extend your spectatorship by buying these more tangible documents of the, the live performance. Um, here are some images. This is an Austrian musical about the Empress Elizabeth, and here we have Takarasians, uh, as the performers are known, um, performing Elizabeth in Japan. Um, uh, it's a very specific aesthetic, um, the, the Takarazuka productions. Um, and these appeal to the primarily female audience uh, of Japan, uh, Japanese musicals, uh, many of whom are housewives. And the fact that it's housewives who are buying theater tickets actually dictates the performance schedule. So the majority of performances are actually matinees, not evening shows. Uh, so we see the power of the audience in dictating the theater scheduling. Um, but Takarazuka is not the only theater company producing musicals in Japan. Uh, in the 1960s, uh, a Japanese film executive based in New York started attending Broadway musicals. And his spectatorship in New York led to the production of musicals in Japan. So he returned to Japan and he urged his film production company, Toho, uh, to start producing Western musicals like My Fair Lady, which they did. Uh, at the same time, the American government, the State Department, paid for a tour of Hello Dolly through uh, Asia to entertain the troops. But many local Asian audiences also attended these performances that you can see documented here. And this is an interesting moment because you have the Japanese film executive insisting we must start producing Western musicals in Japan. You also have the American government sending American musicals to Japan. So you have this kind of push-pull at the same time. And I think that's really important to recognize, similarly to what Kirsty was saying, that there, it's not a case of this passive audience, that there is this insistence of, of we want these performances. Uh, so racing ahead, uh, these are some uh, posters for musicals in Japan. So this is Guys and Dolls performed by, so classic American musical about gangsters in the 30s, um, performed
performed by Takarazuka, so all female cast. And then we have uh, an American musical about Scott and Zelda Fitzgerald. So that is a more traditional commercial production. Um, who, who passed a poster for a musical on their way to Senate House today? Who saw one? Okay, I would have thought more hands since we're in London. But um, so this is a way in which East Asian musical theater is the same as here, right? We see it in the public sphere on a regular basis. The musicals mark their presence. And I would argue that we see more posters for musicals in the public sphere than for any other live event. More than the circus, more than symphony concerts, more than Shakespeare, you're more likely to see a poster for a musical. Um, if we cross the Sea of Japan, bring your bags. Uh, onward to South Korea, we still see musical theater marketing in the public sphere with a variation. So these are banners in Seoul in 2015 to advertise this South Korean premiere of the Broadway musical In the Heights by Lin-Manuel Miranda and Chiara Allegria Hudes. Um, you may know Lin-Manuel Miranda from another little musical. Um, what we see here are several performers uh, who share their role. So a practice in, of musical theater casting in Korea is to cast two, three, or four people to play the same role so that the spectators can select which performers they wish to see. I would liken it to um, a sports team where you would have your favorites. Uh, and so this marketing is reminding you as the prospective audience member, it's your choice, it's a, you know, choose your own adventure, uh, which Usnavi, which Benny, which Nina are you going to choose to see? And the schedule is, is published very clearly. You can see, oh, I want to see the K-pop star, uh, but I also want to see that musical theater performer. And I, then there's the television star as well. So you get quite a range of talent. Uh, the limited uh, performances, rather than eight shows a week as you would have on Broadway or the West End, these performers perform twice a week, maybe three times a week. Uh, so it means you get these really uh, intense performances because they don't need to save a voice. Um, so to, because of this multi, uh, this role sharing, the cast is going to be different at every performance. and. Uh, now I'm shifting into what I wanted to share with you in terms of the preparation for the audience. So all the steps that are taken formally by the producers of a show or by the venue to engage the audience in advance of the performance. So I haven't shown you any Korean production shots yet. We're not even, the show has not begun and yet we're already engaged with the cast. Um, and you'll note there's a, a, a red carpet there, uh, which is an invitation to you to take a photo of yourself with the cast and post that on social media. Um, you'll see some more of that. Uh, but at In the Heights, and um, I mentioned on Twitter earlier, I, I'm showing In the Heights today because I think this is a really uh, significant achievement in engaging the audience and really bringing uh, an American show to a South Korean audience. This is a, a musical, as this map explains, that is set in Manhattan. So this is explaining where Manhattan is. But the characters come from uh, different or their families come from different uh, uh, places like the Dominican Republic and so each of these boxes explains a different character and their uh, Latino heritage but the green box is the one I was especially interested in because it's explaining the only African-American character in this musical which is about a community at the top of Manhattan around the 4th of July um, and in, on Broadway, Benny is an African-American. In Korea, I've been told, I'm not fluent in Korean, uh, Benny is compared to a half Chinese person in Korea. Okay, so this was an attempt to prepare the audience that when you see this character, Benny, he's different, he's an outsider. Um, so in the musical, he, has span he learns Spanish from his uh, Latina girlfriend. Um, so I'll get in a moment to exactly how that happened in a Korean translation. Uh, so, just so you can see, this is, um, this is Benny on Broadway, um, and this is Benny um, in Korea. He always has a blue shirt on, so when I show you a video, you'll find Benny, even though there are three different Bennies, you'll see him in the blue shirt. Um, this is Abuela, a grandmother character. She got quite a bit more glam when she arrived in Korea. Um, she was very flamboyant um, with one of the Usnavis. Um, and I think I'll just go to the video. Here we 
go. Um, I'll talk over the video a little bit. There are a lot of details to notice um, that really struck me. So you see a lot of English and Spanish on the signs. Um, the, there's a Korean character who is holding a plastic massager, which is exactly like what you would get on the street at a Daiso or another discount store in Korea. So watch for a girl waving this plastic kind of massager. Um, in the theater, there were surtitles on either side translating the show into Japanese and Mandarin. Uh, and then when the characters were singing in Spanish and English, that was also translated. This is Vanessa. She, on Broadway, was a very fierce Latina woman, very scary to the male characters in the show. In Korea, you can see she's in a very small, short dress and curly, curly hair. She cried a lot in the Korean production. And I eventually explained to a Korean postgrad who was with me that I was very confused. This character is very different. And I explained the American Vanessa. And she said, oh, you wouldn't find a woman like that in Korea. <laughs> uh, so, you know, to me, that's a translation, right? It's not linguistic, but that femininity is being translated differently. Sometimes English lyrics were kept. I'm going to carry on because um, I've got lots more to show you. This is, you can find this on YouTube really easily. Um, uh, one more thing about the Korean in the Heights. Uh, there's a family situation with some domestic scenes, and I was really taken aback because the mother was physically violent towards her husband, and that is not what happened in New York. Uh, again, I was very confused what is going on here. Um, the mom actually shoved the dad to the floor, um, and I had not seen that in this musical before. But then on a subway platform, you know, weeks later, I saw a Korean family roughhousing with each other, and a dad smacked a, a child and then gave him a hug. And I talked to Korean colleagues about this, and they said, yeah, we we're just really physical. And, um, you know, I'm not surprised the musical would, would put that on stage because that's how f Korean families are. Um, uh, so that also gives you a sense of how much you can read without knowing the language. You can, you can definitely still be interpreting. Um, uh, in the venues in Korea and China and Japan, you often have these areas with red carpets inviting the spectators to mark the occasion with a selfie. Um, and you can see again portraits of the leading actors. This is a, a very um, a more avant-garde musical, Hedwig and the Angry Inch, or kind of rock musical. Um, but you can see some beautiful uh, men playing the lead uh, transsexual character. Uh, and you even have, um, there's a song in this show called Wig in a Box, and there's a kind of box structure in the set, and so that's replicated in the foyer so that spectators can mark um, their presence and, and kind of enter the world of the musical a little bit more. Every production will do this differently. Here at Wicked, you can see a small child has worn green to the show, um, and I love this because you can just see how excited they are. My photo's blurry because they're just so excited. They're recognizing the characters that they just saw in the first act. Um, but adults want to take pictures too. It's not all girls. This is a young man having his picture taken. But you can see there are two Alphabas and there are two Glindas. So you could come back multiple times to see your favorites. Um, I had the good fortune to be in East Asia when Man of La Mancha was produced in Japan, in South Korea, and China. So I saw three productions of the same musical within less than a, a year. Uh, so we have Japan, South Korea, and China. Um, just a couple of details on a classic musical uh, and how that gets uh, 
received in China, Japan, and South Korea. In Japan, this is very historic, so there are photos to remind you that Japan is part of theater history. This actor who I saw has been playing the role since 1970. So he's been playing this role for nearly 50 years. It is his role. And so they're reminding you at the venue of J Japanese theater history intersecting with Broadway theater history. Um, women in kimonos. Uh, so we have Japan, the Japan uh, site of performance uh, framing this experience of a classic American musical. Um, there's, there's me um, with a pull quote. This is from a, a review of the Broadway production in 1965. Men of La Mancha has everything. That's why we're still performing it in Japan. Um, just reminding audiences, you know, you made a good choice. You picked the show that has everything. Um, if you came back again, you could have a, a free souvenir um, neckerchief for being a dedicated spectator. So bonus if you bought more tickets. Uh, in Korea, you could pose with your favorite Don Quixote. Uh, one of them was the more handsome Don Quixote, and the other was the funnier one. Um, I think I saw both of them. I did see it twice. But you can see how massive these photos are. It's very much about the casting. Uh, in China, you could meet the cast after the show and get autographs. Um, this poster was in a 7-Eleven. Um, this is uh, tickets available for sale on WeChat, the Chinese social media app. Um, you can be a knight just like Cervantes dresses up in the show. Um, or be one of the sidekicks. That's a Chinese theater fan. Um, uh, I need to, to end. Um, too much to show you. Um, uh, there is some recognition in China that the audience still needs some education, that musicals are Western and foreign and everyone may not have experience of them. So here at the Sound of Music, there's a great map of Europe and you have a dad pointing out to his child where Austria is so that he knows where those Von Trapp children are. Um, we'll jump ahead. Uh, what I'll finish with is that in China, what we see now is that the fan response is for student fans to now put on these shows themselves. Sometimes they do this officially and license the show legally and pay a fee. Sometimes they don't. Um, uh, they will do the labor of translation. So these, this is a translation uh, by students at Fudan University in Shanghai. They paid the license for the musical Rent and they translated it, but when they translated it, instead of all the references to the East Village in New York City, they included some references to events and places uh, relevant to uni students at Fudan Uni. Um, so instead of Spike Lee's shooting down the street, there was a reference to a student protest that had happened the previous year. Um, and I'll finish by sharing a clip with you um, of one of those performance says, I filmed this, so I kind of became a pirate by taking my phone out at the theater and capturing this. Uh, this is a student who's doing a PhD in maths right now. He has no aspirations for a professional career. But what I want you to notice at the very bottom, you can see one of the student fans in the audience just rocking out. She's loving this so much. So I would argue that this is a fan practice, but it's also growing theater spectatorship in China. So this is Zhao Feng. Oh, no. videos of the original Broadway performance so that he could pay his tribute uh, and that that was the greatest tribute he could offer as a fan was to try to replicate that and share it. So when these pirates are pirating performances or fan subbing on Chinese social media, it's always with an intention to educate and share um, and ultimately grow the audience for musical theater. So I'll end there. Happy to talk more with anyone who knows more about these countries than I do or who has seen any of these shows, but thank you.
That was the um, first half of our translation and adaptation panel. Um, we're now on to the translation half, and here comes uh, Dr. Richard Mansell. Um, um, Richard is Senior Lecturer in Translation at the University of Exeter. Uh, his current research focuses on translated literature in the English language world, exploring the networks of people and organisations involved in getting books to market <coughs> and how and why decisions are made. Taking a more sociological approach, he uses publishing and sales data, archival research, reviews, interviews, and more <laughs> to analyse how translated literature functions as an industry uh, and how it compares to other cultural industries. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you for the invitation to the organisers for being here. Um, so just to say I'm from a translation studies point of view, but actually I say rather than translation studies, translator studies. There's been a shift over about the past, you could take it back to about a decade, um, in some respects to a more agent-based model. What that basically means is I like to study people first and then texts after that, and I hope that will come out here. Um, thank you very much to the organisers as well for the, the whole event. There's been some fantastic things already, and I've noted a few down that tie in very nicely with what I'm going to talk about. David, where are you? I can't sit in at the back, I can't see anyone else. Um, you were mentioning about Twitter, popularity and engagement, and how that can be used with subtitling. And Agnieszka, you were talking about the move from maker-centred to user-centred um, practice. And so in my head, I'm thinking producer to consumer here. We'll see how that comes out in the terminology I use. And how Netflix actually respond to a complaint on Twitter. About 10 to 20 years ago, you wouldn't think that a large company would do that. But things have been shifting, and I'm going to talk a bit about that shift in general. So, um, over the next about 15 minutes, I aim to establish why the changing structure and size of the translated literature industry which go hand in hand with why the technological developments and changes in the creative industries mean that academic studies, and especially sociological studies of translation, should take readers into account. The spark for this is uh, there's a larger project that I'm working on, and when I was doing the initial research for that, I started looking into something called the Global Translation Initiative, which was, in its own description, a consortium of organisations in the UK and US working with arts councils in other English-speaking countries. This arose from the awareness that the perceived low proportion of published translations, and we'll get on to the figures shortly, was not exclu exclusive to the UK or US, but rather to all English-speaking territories. Its goals were to bring different sectors of the translation industry together, to identify obstacles and opportunities, and to document the current states of translation into English. All of this research is freely available. This is another thing that's come up earlier on in the day. You can get all of this freely online. If anybody wants any of the sources that I mentioned here, by the way, please do just either drop me an email or Twitter. I'm our man in Devon on Twitter, if you like, way in green, you know where that comes from. Um, so the three main outputs from the research were all published in 2011. The first is a report by the publisher Dolky Archive Press, on a survey it carried out in 2009 to 2010 across five key sectors. English language bookshops, universities, publishers, the media, and translators. The report concludes that the principal barriers to getting translations published in English were perceptions. On the one hand, some perceive that translated literature is somehow more difficult or less popular. On the other, translators perceive that publishers are not interested in translations. Publishers perceive that the media are not interested in reviewing and promoting translations, and the media think that readers are not interested. Yet there is no research into readers themselves to bear this out. So that's one of the things that I want to do. Indeed, any attempt at a full account of the translated <coughs> literature industry out of necessity must include readers. Pascal Casanova lists as inhabitants of what she calls the world literary space or the world republic of letters, Writers, readers, researchers, teachers, critics, publishers, translators, and the rest who read, write, think, debate, interpret. A structure which provides their, our, intellectual categories and recreates its hierarchies and constraints in every mind 
thus reinforcing the material aspects of its existence. Thus readers as agents and reading as an act um, are vital in creation and survival in the widest sense. I'm not trying to say that it's dramatic here, again, we'll get onto the figures, um, but with literature living on, the survival of translated literature. Yes, in some sense there are more privileged readers. Translators themselves are privileged readers. And those who write readers' reports for commissioning editors, and I know there's at least a few people here who do that, but we must, at least conceptually, include all readers. And um, as it's or as already come up today, that is a messy business, and so we'll try and clarify some of the parts with that. Although he's referring to canon formation, Franco Moretti's comments in this regard are entirely appropriate. He says, readers, not professors, make canons. And before he goes on to say, readers read A and so keep it alive. Better, they buy A inducing its publishers to keep it in print until another generation shows up. He essentially says, we can teach what we like in universities. If we want to concentrate on poetry all the time, wonderful, nobody cares. We don't change the character. <coughs> it's the people who actually consume this and keep it alive who do. Of course, there are issues here in his definition of the canon and what we read and what is popular about, for example, out-of-copyright free e-versions of works. Once a translation or once a work is out of copyright, then anybody who's got a Kindle will know, you can get the versions for free, and they might actually then supersede some versions that are in copyright. That's not something that I'll talk about here, um, but it does raise issues about the relative power of different readers that I shall touch on here. But what is clear is that readers, whether they are aware of it or not, are an important part of a wider network, and how this network functions and communicates is changing. So, let's get on to the figures then. One way of including readers, although only at a macro and quantitative level, is to use sales data. And this is generally positive when we look at the headline figures. In 2018, sales of translated fiction rose by 5.5% to make up 5.63% of all fiction sold, comprising 2.6 million books and worth £20.7 million pounds in the UK. The highest figures since Nielsen, so they collect sales data, started to collect the data in 2001 and against the background of a falling or at best flatlining book trade. Um, there was a report on this in The Guardian a few months ago and you'll have seen people very happily say, <laughs> no more 3%, we are the 5.63%. <laughs> but when you start looking at France, Germany, Spain, Italy, Poland, you look at 12, 14, 16, 20, 33% of fiction is translations. Now, um, I refer later to a study by Rajendra Chitnis from the University of Bristol um, in a different regard, but here there's an interview that he did as well with one very important German agent who said if you look at the other countries and take English as a source language out of the equation, actually things start being more comparable. And anybody here who's looked at sociological studies in translation, I know about Giselle Shapiro's work and also Bourdieu's work, they talk about the hypercentral position of the English language and of Anglo-American culture in the world system. Anyway, put that to one side. So the figures only tell one small part of the story. Yes, they're rising, but one explanation for this could be that the same hardcore group of readers are buying more books. It doesn't have to be that we are getting more readers reading the books. We need to know what the audiences are actually doing and who these audiences are. So if we look at changes in the industry, we can see how the very role of the reader is changing too. So here we move on to the change and it's something called the long tail. 20 years ago, there was a fear that the book trade was going to head the same way as other media. Running and Slart is stating that in 2001, their quote, publishers were on the brink of adopting the same commercial logic that previously had spread throughout other types of media. Books were now expected to comply with the same performance indicators as magazines, newspapers, and television channels. But that didn't happen. Yes, we've seen huge mergers like Penguin and Random House coming together to make Penguin Random House. Are we being recorded for this, by the way? Uh, yes, yes, but we can edit it. No, nah, I was just going to say that Mr. Trick, it should have been Random Penguin. It's a much better name. <laughs> um, the behemoth that is Ashet, if you look at everything that they encompass, not to mention the translation-specific Amazon crossings as well. But even within these, literary fiction, including translated literary fiction, are allowed to behave, um, or rather is allowed to behave, somewhat differently to other media. 
in significant part owing to the prestige that books carry. Thus, the thinking at work is more long-term than a simple hit-or-miss culture. It doesn't matter if something is not the greatest financial success at one particular point in time. Um, the power for this, uh, for translated, the power of this for translated literature, can be found in the long tail. The long tail um, is a name first proposed by Chris Anderson in 2004 to describe the business practices of companies such as Amazon and, who we've already heard of today, Netflix, highlighting how modern distribution channels for media have changed what can be stocked and sold. In the past, channels of distribution were scarce. Anderson called this an economics of scarcity. Think of when I first wrote this, I put four TV channels, and then I thought, hey, it, wasn't, it was a long time ago when we actually got five. But four TV channels, physical space in the video rental store, never mind the trip you would have to make to your local blockbuster video, or Ritz being the other one, show my age now. And so success was measured quite simply in hits. You had few products, so they needed to earn that small bit of rental that it cost for that space in the store. Now those old limits have gone. Think not only of iPlayer and Kindles and all the rest, but even using the internet to be able to order that obscure book that you want. You can find it somewhere and it can come to you. The economics of scarcity don't rule things anymore. And so with that, it appears that we like other things as well as hits. We just consume them a lot before because they were there. This doesn't mean that hits are over. No, it just means that the dominance of hits is over. And rather, we get a rise of niche cultures as well. And all of those other bits, those little niches, add up to a significant market, which can be just as large or larger than the hits themselves. Amazon talks about this in terms of Amazon, particularly when you're looking at Amazon Marketplace. They don't care if you buy something, one copy of something that's sold 100,000 times, or one copy of something that's only sold once. Or think of Kindle, think of downloading music. It doesn't matter to them, because there is no physical product. For them, the storage is exactly the same for all of them. Anderson proposes that the long tail comprises three forces, which put most simply, in his words, are <coughs> make it, get it out there, and help me find it. Or to put it in slightly more detail, democratising the tools of production, democratising the tools of distribution, and unifying supply and demand. I shall briefly apply here the first two in terms of translated literature, before then moving on to the third, which is the most relevant to our topic here, which is in more depth. So, with the democratisation of the tools of production, basically cheap and powerful PCs, it is easier for a small independent publisher or even a micro-publisher to create a professional edition. Of course, there are certain financial issues that will always remain. Rights need to be acquired for foreign works and copyright. Translators need to be paid. And this is a significant issue for smaller publishers. Not something that I'll talk about here. More than happy to talk about after. And publishers need to, well, feed themselves and their families. Uh, one publisher, and since we've been recorded, I'm not going to mention it, um, in an interview was asked what kept him going with publishing as a small publisher. And I'll need to paraphrase here. He basically said he believed in the project, and when he started it, he had a lot of savings, and now he doesn't have any. Mm -hmm. That clearly is not a business model, so I'm not saying here that people need to use up all of their money on their own business. But, basically... With the democratisation of the tools of production, we can create the products. Likewise, with the democratisation of the tools of distribution, it is easier to get a book to a point of sale, from digital self-publishing at one extreme to getting the printed book in the window of Waterstones at the other. Being a small publisher is no longer an automatic bar to sitting at the top table. Look at the composition of the Man Booker International Longlist and Shortlist this year as an example. Or consider this. I was in the audience of the first Wednesday talk at the Literary Translation Centre at the London Book Fair this year, and it was about the importance of literary prizes for translated literature. Talking were Charlotte Collins, the translator, Margaret Jill Costa, Maureen Freely, also translators, and Jack Testar, the publisher at Fitzcarraldo. I was standing by Daniel Hahn, and he leant over to me, whispered, and he said, do you realise they've got three Nobel Prizes between them? And these are people who are working of course, or Hampton Mook, it's large, but Fitzcarraldo, they have a Nobel Prize, and it is a small press. 
So these two forces start to explain the growth in small presses behind the growth in translated literature in the UK, as noted by Joanna Walsh in The Guardian back in 2014, and Stefan Tobler of And Other Stories, when talking of the early years of the press, says that it would not have been possible without the internet, allowing an editorial, uh, an editorial team to work alongside their other commitments from wherever they are in the world. But even with the best literature and most beautiful products, the works need to reach consumers, and that is where the third force comes in. <coughs> in theory, at least, Small publishers and translated literature should both be at a significant disadvantage given the current climate in the national media. As Ronnie and Slater note, they say the battle for media attention has become fiercer, with a particular focus on national authors and big international names in the individual book markets. As a little aside for this, since they wrote that in the UK context, one of the papers that most significantly covered translated literature, The Independent, has gone to an online-only edition, and they simply don't cover it in the same way anymore. Boy Tonkin um, does not do as much anymore. Indeed, some elements of the national press have been overtly hostile to translated literature. Talking in 2005, Christopher McElhose deplored the coverage of Sebald's The Immigrants as <coughs> baffling and shameful, adding in his words that the Times steadfastly refused to accept a review from one of their leading critics. Yet the success of that book is an indication of how translated fiction has become a success too. Again, in Matlehose's words, that book sold after a slow start because other, author, uh, other authors, having found their own way to it, claimed it as their book of the year. So it's not that initial point of release, but rather once we start to get people talking about it and talking to other people about it. So in his final report on the AHRC-funded project, Translating the Literatures of Smaller European Nations, Regenda Chitnis notes that not only is word of mouth a vital marketing tool in translated literature, but furthermore, and quote, technological advances are central to the growth in translated literature. Social media, book review sites, online reading groups and bloggers have transformed the notion of word of mouth. Readers themselves are part of signalling mechanisms, uniting supply and demand by writing about what they read and what they like. This is the production side of things. And posting it on blogs and Twitter, the distribution side of things. This is noted in wider industries too by Anderson, who says that, quote, the traditional line between producers and consumers has blurred. Consumers are also producers. And readers have shifted from passive consumers to active producers, commenting and blogging right back at the mainstream media. Here we see that example of Netflix actually paying attention to the people blogging because they understand how these three forces are working together. Now, this is not simply the reserve of already privileged readers, but rather the forces of the long tail serve to unify those interested in what could be considered a fragmented field. For example, Stu, also known as Winston's dad. Anybody heard of Winston's dad? A couple of people smiling. Um, and founder of the Translation Thursday hashtag on Twitter is a care worker in Derbyshire who left school at 16, but he's a passionate ad advocate for translated literature. Indeed, if you look at book bloggers, many of them are from outside the book trade and have their own full-time jobs. Again, this isn't about people giving up their time uh, as I've mentioned before, rather it's about people doing things and it's finding out why they do it that's the interesting part. So this too is part of the long tail. Anderson says that one of the big differences between the head and the tail of producers is that the farther down you are in the tail, the more likely you are to have to keep your day job. Note that the same here could be said for small publishers as well. So awareness of how this works. The long tail in itself is not a model. You can't think just because something will sell in small numbers that you can automatically make money from it. No, you've got to guide people down to this. However, in the case of bloggers, keeping the day job is necessary anyway because it's rather tricky to make a living from blogging or from publishing your book. Um, Anderson says, for the average blogger or micro-publisher, the long tail doesn't promise riches. If what you're doing has value, it does promise you more attention, reputation, and readership. So it means that people will pay attention to what you do. To couch that in Bourdieu's terms, and I'm trying to keep the, the theory down here, but again, more than happy to answer questions about this, if you like. Um, the reasons why I'm going to use Bourdieu will become apparent in a minute. The gain is not to accumulate economic capital, but symbolic capital. 
What is more is that people are motivated by direct contact. Anderson notes this as well. He says, but fundamentally, social media is a peer-to-peer -peer medium. Bloggers would rather hear from someone doing something cool than from the paid promotional representative for that person. The problem is that the people doing the cool stuff are busy, which is why they pay PR people to do the outreach for them in the first place. Yet with small independent publishers, if you tweet to them and you get in contact with them, it is probably the publisher you are talking to or somebody who you actually care about anyway. So although being recorded, I'll mention two people here, Catherine Taylor and Nikki Prasa. You are interested in what they think about translated literature if you are interested in translated literature. So it seems that actually in translated literature, small indies and bloggers are the perfect match for the three forces of the long tail. So some of you will have noticed here that my approach is sociological. I concur with Bruyette that any serious attempt at a full political economy of world literature will have to be at least, in part, sociological in its basis. However, it is my belief that translated literature can question some of the methods and tenets of past sociological approaches too. For example, given the blurring between consumers and producers, does it hold, Borgia talks about restricted fields, a field that isn't necessarily complete, where people produce for producers? And so if people are only writing for other people producing things within that field, that field is restricted in some way. Is that right? Is it necessarily restricted? Or does translated literature actually show an evolution of a field where consumers become producers too? And not that we are going to revert to some sort of status where most consumers don't actually write about what they think about things. Does this also indicate that translated literature works according to a different logic than non-translated literature, and so can be conceived of as a separate field? I don't know the answer to that, because that's one thing that I'm researching <coughs> at the moment, but I'm very interested to see if it holds. Finally, there is the issue of measuring word of mouth, and again, this is where the technological progress that has altered the media over which word of mouth travels is important. Think of hyperlinks, that Anderson terms the ultimate act of generosity online, he paraphrases an act of hyperlinking in the following words. I think so much of you and your content and everything you stand for that I'm going to transfer some of my reputation, which I've earned over many years with my readers, and give it to you. I'm going to take the trust that my readers have in me, and I'm going to turn that into traffic to you that comes with a positive bias. Thus, the hyperlink is a marker of symbolic capital, of prestige, you can put it that way, that way if you like. And the quantity of this can be measured through the number of hyperlinks and the traffic generated by it. In a similar way, we can look at the interaction with tweets as to how this works too. This gives us a map of symbolic capital, which then analysed together with, let's say, sales data, offers hard data exemplifying the, what to use a term, I'm afraid to finish off, the transubstantiation of symbolic capital into economic capital, I'll put it another way, making money out of prestige, um, how that happens, and importantly, the role of readers in this. Thank you. Gabriella Saldana. Oh, hello. Okay. Um, Gabriella Saldana is a lecturer in translation studies in the Department of Modern Languages at the University of Birmingham. She teaches translation theory and research methods. Her research interests are translation stylistics and the artistic nature of translation, the reception of translations, and their impact on literary landscapes and the relationship between gender identity and translation. Thank you. And uh, I, I'd like to add my voice to those who um, thanked the organisers for their programming, since it has uh, cohesively led, I think, to, um, uh, to what I'm hoping to, to say, and it's particularly links in to, with, it, with the last three presentations where uh, we talked about adaptation and, and translation and uh, translator and agent-focused uh, research. 
Well, something that I want to uh, start with is um, the idea suggested and already questioned in some of the presentations um, today that the literary field is uh, to some degree autonomous, as suggested by, for example, uh, Pascal Casanova, who was just mentioned, and Heilbrunn, who <coughs> suggests that Cultural exchanges, uh, and they are talking in particular about book translation, have a dynamic of their own which is based on a certain autonomy vis-à-vis -vis the constraints of the world market. And Casanova, for example, also posits that literary value, and this is something I find quite problematic, is incommensurate with the values of ordinary commerce and is the sole value recognised by all participants. What I want to suggest is that thanks to some of the processes uh, or to the processes that, for example, Richard was describing now, the, the situation is not uh, so, so clear-cut. And what I'm using here is, um, um, is a theoretical framework based on the concept of landscapes which was first suggested in Kershaw and Saldania in 2013, where Kershaw and I took the uh, theory proposed by Apadurai, who uses, who calls it a theory of rapture, and suggests that in today's globalized world, um, cultural forms are fundamentally fractal. There, there is always a rapture and we cannot find boundaries, structures, and regularities. Rather, in today's globalized world, the, uh, today's uh, culture, cultural exchange, and uh, is always um, is dynamic, but always um, experiencing attention, and as physical landscapes are the result of uh, geological and natural uh, tensions, cultural landscapes, uh, such as Apadurai, are basically the result of a tension between homogenization and heterogenization, which I'll explain <coughs> in a minute. So they're always changing. And what, what is also useful about the metaphor of landscape is that it always, uh, that it suggests uh, a perspective, so it's always biased because the landscape is always relative to the position of the viewer. So what I'm going to talk about today, for example, is the reception of trans Brazilian translated literature in the Anglophone press, and what I'm showing is how biased that perception of Brazilian literature is because it has been filtered through the eyes of reviewers who inhabit an Anglophone world, which is quite different uh, from the world uh, that is portrayed in the reviews. So, so what is important here, and I'm going to call attention to the last um, quote there, is that in today's globalised world, uh, the points of departure and uh, points of arrival are in flux. So the, the very useful ideas that we um, uh, that we cling still onto of target and source culture do not work so well anymore. Points of references are not so stable. And uh, another point uh, made by Singh in relation to the study of cultural exchanges is that because of this dynamism, there has been a tendency to focus on the movement, on how things change places, but we are not looking um, or paying enough attention to how the things that are moving change themselves as they travel. So uh, what I'm arguing is that things such as literature change as they travel and uh, ideas of literary value and cultural value, who brought up the idea of cultural value, you, uh, also, also change. And I think I, I hope to demonstrate that with a few, with a few quotes. So I want us to see translation as a, fo as a political and natural force that is constantly changing the literary landscapes around us. And, uh, and in order to do that, we have to, like um, 
previous uh, speakers have been doing is study what English calls uh, the concrete instruments of exchange and conversion, whose rise is perhaps the most conspicuous feature of our recent cultural history. Studying prices, for example, as English does, translation processes, but also corporate patronage and what I've focused on, which are reviews. And what we need to take into account is not just that we will see, we know we're going to see that this literary field has been penetrated by the logic of commerce, but also that it's not just a simple, and I think some of what uh, Richard was saying as well already points at that, it's not simply that it's a commercialised field. So we need to study what happens in the marketing of literature, and Squires already, Claire Squires, makes um, some advances in the study of marketing of literature in general, but I want to focus on translated uh, literature in particular and on the role of uh, reviewers. So who are, in Casanova's words, creators of literary value? They are the ones that determine what is literary and what is not sets the limits of literary art. That is according to Casanova, and I think it's still true, but we'll see that they, um, they don't have such a, such a clear monopoly. But although they continue to be important as um, opinion formers, as, as they are conceived in marketing theory. Um, so, okay. So looking and, uh, at the literature, the discourse on the publishing of literature, <coughs> um, I, I basically distinguished it to two approaches, and this is a broad uh, convenience distinction. One is what I call the homogenizing approach, which supports the, uh, what ACTA calls the imperium of monolingualism, an increasingly market-driven situation in the global culture industry that rewards translation-friendly works of art, the McDonaldization of literature and things like that. And a perfect example of that kind of discourse appears in uh, Mireille Sperman's description of the Gold Dutch promotional campaign in Britain when she said that her impression was that British people um, often refer to the insular mentality of uh, their countrymen and women, their fear of all things foreign, and the idea that that idea of the uh, translated literature as a window to the other world does not really work because it emphasizes the distance and that's not convenient for marketing purposes. So they chose. Uh, Dutch authors who dealt with recognisable themes and issues with excellent English that could come afterwards and talk about their books. So that is one approach to selling translated literature. And another, very different, exemplified here with a quote by uh, Parish Pete, Director of Literature Grants uh, of the United States National Endowment for the Arts, says, no, 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 the best works in translation are those that transport us to a place that we've never been, to live among people we have never known. So we have here the two. And what I found looking at reviews of Brazilian literature in English translation is that sometimes this tendency to want to present foreign literature as a window to another world leads reviewers to focus precisely on the distance, on what is not known and on what is different. And therefore, there is a risk of creating and reinforcing borders rather than bring them down. So, um, looked, um, I, I did a study that's already been uh, published, um, and I looked at reviews of Brazilian titles in the Anglophone press, from 2000 to 2015, there were 94 books um, translated into English and published and reviewed during that time. And what was interesting, and I'm going to talk only about those reviews that, um, or those titles that had a Brazilian setting that not only were Brazilian literature, but they weren't, for example, a Paulo Coelho, who's a very famous, popular Brazilian author, who deals with very universal things, let's call them, 
or a Clarice Lispector, who's an experimental, difficult writer, who's you know already part of the um, literary canon, but something in between. And what was interesting is that here there was this. I found a a, a tendency to emphasise what the setting, the geographical and physical place where this was happening. The fact that these were novels about Brazil was, um, was often mentioned in the titles and the headlines with um, names such as Amazon, um, Amazonian, uh, Amazonia, Rio, Sao Paulo, Copacabana. And then it was the idea that this was an exotic place was I'd say literally exoticizing that the word exotic was everywhere, so it was exotic and sophisticated crime writing, um, crime fiction, crime fiction with an exotic locale, a dangerous exotic world, etc. So this was already quite obvious as part of the um, the reviews. But what was interesting was that the distance was also emphasised in more subtle ways. And this is why what I claim here is that translated literature, <coughs> in this case, is, um, becomes part of it, the tourist industry, in the sense that if you look at, um, at that uh, um, tourism studies, you find that um, tourism results from basic uh, basic binary division between the ordinary everyday life and the extraordinary. We do tourism to experience the extraordinary. Yeah, we don't go to 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 Brazil to fish and chips so to see you know what their pubs look like. We go there to experience the beach, the jungle, etc. So, what produces a distinctive tourist gaze, according to Uri, are those aspects of the place to be visited visited, which distinguish it from what is conventionally encountered in everyday life. And this is what I see highlighted in the reviews. The things that were the focus, I felt, of the reviews, extreme poverty, pervasive corruption, daily violence, and tropical climate, which were um, the kind of themes that I saw recurrent, and I looked for others. I expected, for example, uh, Brazilian women and uh, sex to be part of the of the discourse but I didn't find that and except in novels by Jorge Mago but these other were quite um, quite prevalent and I'll give you an, an idea here there was a lot of information given about Brazil and the state of its economy the state of its society etc sometimes in one of them I found I think two paragraphs about Latin America before we went on to Brazil. And there is information such as kind of 175 million people living below the poverty line, 9% uh, of the population wealthy enough to pay taxes, oppressive hate, poverty, ramshackle, ramshackle city, and when wealth is mentioned, it's always in contrast. So this is just an idea of kind of the picture looking at uh, what I saw, the, the vocabulary uh, describing poverty, but the same goes for corruption, for violence, and uh, for the tropical climate. So what I'm saying is that in the, as, as literature uh, is commodified, there is uh, unmarketed, there is a tendency to valorize um, cultural difference and uh, employed to, to sell translated literature and foreign literature. And coming back to Apadurai, and I think we need to, um, for those of you who are within the field of uh, translation studies, you will have heard of the cultural turn, which changed dramatically uh, or some people claim it changed dramatically our way of looking at translation and led us to move beyond linguistics and look at the culture. And now I'd like to, to question what aspects and what culture are we looking at when we look at cultural exchanges? Yeah? 
what is it that we are defining and describing as culture? And interestingly, um, in, in um, a Padurai's model of globalization, he argues that culture is better used as an adjective, as an um, contrastive property of certain things, so, uh, rather than a, a substance that homogenizes or that unifies. It's not what unifies a certain group of people living in London from a certain group of people living in, in Rio de Janeiro. It is what makes those people different that becomes cultural. <coughs> Unless there is a difference, there is no culture. So, um, so according to Apadurai, culture are those differences that mobilize group identity. Are those things about Britain or about Brazil that make people feel British or Brazilian. And these concepts of culture and therefore of cultural value and therefore of literary value are constantly being negotiated in places like reviews. So when we have uh, reviews such as Henningham's, which I don't mention there, but was in the Times Literary Supplement, of a classic of Brazilian literature, and uh, we find a quote such as this, which I'm reading for, one of the many enigmas which surround Machado de Assis is how a writer whose sensibility is as finely pitched as that of Chekhov, who extended the possibilities of realist, of realist fiction through experiments with point of view as subtle as those of Henry James, and whose savage disenchantment might have earned him the respect of Jonathan Swift, so you see here where the standard is there, the classic, the canon, world canon, emerged from an impoverished background in a tropical empire run on a regime of slavery. So you here see um, the expectations where you find culture and where you find literature and where you're unlikely to find it most of the time. And um, like an, another example that I think kind of I, I like them because they, they seem to contrast European with uh, South American culture. And I don't know how to pronounce this surname. If someone does, it's It's a, a Hebrew <laughs> name in Portuguese, so anyway. Um, so, uh, so in this other review of his work, um, we find a lot inside echoes of the Jewish literary <coughs> imagination. We find a meshing of the archaic images we have inherited from European culture with the hoarse, deep sounds of Brazilian folklore, constantly renewing itself through myth-making in the form of literatura de cordel, Brazil's pulp fiction, and telenovelas, the soap opera. So on the one side, we have the Jewish literary imagination and the archaic images coming from the European literary world. And on the other, the hoarse, unsophisticated, popular pulp fiction and soap operas that we get from Brazil. So my argument is that here, these reviewers are not only are basically redefining culture and creating cultural differences. Um, and just to finish on something that I read recently that doesn't belong to Brazil, but to suggest that this is not such a north-south um, tension in um, uh, Michelle Wood's uh, um, authorizing translation edited collection. She mentions, uh, for example, another reviewer in this time, um, very renowned reviewer in the New York, New York Times, talking about um, Muller's works as one of German and Northern European contemporary novels that successfully catalog bleak pessimistic realities that strike an American audience as profoundly depressing or um, bar than re uh, on a review of Gunter Grass Too Far Field, um, dealing with the German questions. You may tell me what the German questions. 
are. Um, but I, I, I don't know, I'm not a German studies um, specialist. But it doesn't sound to me that the painful intrusion of the past into the present is something specifically German to me. Maybe I'm wrong. But what I want to point out is that in these discussions of literary value and of literature, we, uh, or reviewers, are replicating stereotypes that um, risk uh, entrenching borders. So, to conclude, literary translation has entered the middle brochure. It's not maybe that hard, difficult literature of the 3%. And maybe it's a much more um, easily domesticated and easily consumed literature. But it's still in the discussion of um, literature in, uh, uh, in languages other than English in the Anglophone press, we can still find that um, those old stereotypes coming back yeah, and um, and I don't know. I think in in portraying <coughs> literature as a window to the other world, we are I I believe, or this in these reviews are creating um, ideas of a national literature that I feel in this case are being imposed on a particular uh, field of production, <coughs> but. This is not the whole picture, and to end up on an optimistic note, and, and going back to the beginning of the day with uh, the uh, role of uh, social media, and uh, also to the example of and other stories and uh, niche publishers that um, are presenting, I think, an opportunity to resist the um, the entrenchment of stereotypes and um, the ideas of cultural borders that um, are being constantly recreated. And I think that's that. Any advice to people? 
equal at this end <coughs> of the equation, uh, it would be most welcome. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, good question. Thank you. Um, it was a very, very, very long answer. <laughs> no time for. Quick answer. Um, are you aware of Ross Schwartz's recommendations on how to write a pitch and how to form a pitch? If not, Google that and anybody else interested, Google that and you'll find that it's on loads of different sites. You're nodding, so you've got that. So that's the first thing, actually creating a professional pitch in itself. Second thing, what you're talking about with the cultural stereotyping really is how the translation itself is then marketed. A bit of this, yes, could be in the strategy of the translator, but of course, at the point of pitch, you're trying to pitch it as something that the publisher will then go on and sell. So it's looking for the right publisher for it, really. So then you've got to look at their lists. So if you look at literature across frontiers, they have a resources section, a very good list of publishers in the UK who publish translated literature, translated fiction, and go for the right place with it. Then as much material as you can get to back up what is good about that work. So if you can get reviews about the Italian book in Italian, translate the relevant sections of those for the commissioning editor, make sure that you can actually send the pitch to a named person at the press as well, and so they actually know that it's a personal thing, and so then that gets rid of a bit of cultural stereotyping when you're doing that as well. That's the quick way of doing it. Then the long, long answer is it depends entirely on the work, because there are some it's almost even some cultures that just get stereotyped in that way. There's a very good PhD thesis by Gubu Tekgul from Exeter from a few years back, and she was looking at Turkish literature translated into English, and just saw that just about any book that was published in English, translated from Turkish, will have some sort of pictures of Bosphorus, the mosque, and so on, even if it's got nothing to do with it. It will just be stereotyped in that way. And like Turkish culture, there are many more like that as well. So that then really is who, who's selling it, who's choosing the cover images, who decides what this is going to be like. So it's the house that you're going for again with that. Thank you. Don't know if you've got anything to add, Gabby. No, except that, you know, some publishers may want you to stereotype if you want to sell your translation. Yeah. So. Because sometimes, <laughs> sometimes you'll get one where the They've got a, or, or another house has got a successful X, Y, Z, I don't know, it's been recorded, so let's not say too much, really. Um, UK publishers and US publishers are known to be risk averse, so if they see something that they think will sell, then they will try to copy it from other people. Am I being careful? <laughs> Probably not. It is documented somewhere, I shall find it to us. Uh, so, Cultural stereotyping is one way of trying to tap into that. So just look at the um, Scandinavian crime fiction phenomenon, that then either you get something in Scandi Noir or like Scandi Noir, and it gets stereotyped in that way, even if it's not got that much to do with it. That's Macklehose got a snack for that as well. Okay, so, yes. It's more of a comment than a question, um, but kind of drawing on what Gabby said about reviewers and what Richard was saying about the importance of um, looking at reader responses, whether that be kind of online reader responses or real reader responses. The importance of, and, and all of looking at all of the agents that are involved in it as well, often these stereotyping images come from, the, the, as we've said, the marketing material from the publishers and stuff, so that's the way that they're marketing, mm. which then gets echoed in the reviews. But then the, the need to study reader reviews um, from blog sites, from media sites, that because we can then follow how these kind of um, these stereotypes, these way of talking about it, these way of reading the books, then follow down in all the reviews, all the kind of the research and the literature that's being done about um, the way that people read and the way that people talk about books is that all of these, it's, it's they're not isolated; they they all have an effect, particularly when they're online. So therefore, and, and the research that I've done myself on on books in translation and the way that they've been read and talked about online is that you can see the effects of the marketing material, you can see the effects of the reviews, um, and the impact those have and the influence those have on the way that the bloggers and the reviewers talk about them on their, on the blog, on their blog posts, on the review sites, 
and then research suggests that readers also, when they pick up a book, whether it be in translation or not, will do their research online. They will go and they'll read about the author, they'll go and read what other people have read about it, and then they'll read the book. So therefore they're then influenced by everything that's been said about it. So it's so important to, to, to kind of study reception at every level of, of kind of the chain of reception in order to understand all the, 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 the kind of the mechanisms at work for, for chasing it back from a textual level, but all the way through, that when we study translation studies, we have to follow it through to kind of to the, to the, to the, kind of the end of the chain, really, to understand how it works and what's happening. So, my soapbox is on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Did, did you want to say something very... No, no, no. No. Okay. Um, right. Do we have a question for um, our adaptation speakers? Hello. <laughs> um, I mean, it's this idea of expertise that was kind of people not wanting to challenge the experts. I was thinking linking the two papers together, mm. this rise of kind of fan shows, whether that's kind of giving people a certain um, idea that it's okay to not be an expert, or that you know, the fan is an expert in a different way, or you know, that's becoming more valued. <laughs> We're actually working together on a project for a book called Theatre Fandom. Um, and I'm curious to know actually, is anyone out there familiar with the really rich, still quite niche, area of academic study called fan studies? Have you been to the conferences? Or? It's a thing and it's amazing! <laughs> That is the combined effort from scholars, starting particularly between the UK and the US, but now spreading worldwide, the desire to study how and why we become fans of things. And your paper was making me think about that as well, when you're talking about people becoming not just creators, but producers. That is exactly what Henry Jenkins' foundational text, Textual po Poachers, his book, was arguing that people are doing not just becoming receivers of media, but creators making it and remaking it afresh. And as the person at the back was saying, need the need to study that process all the way down the chain. What happens then when, when, when hypothetical fictional worlds are being extended by thousands of people writing their own versions of something like Harry Potter? And then you're reading those wide array of um, fan texts kind of plugging them into your own head canon and picking and choosing which ones you you want to believe in and that build your world and then you're writing your own. It's amazing. So it's a whole massive ball and we do need to study the process as a whole. And for me that's what makes China so exciting to study. I'm sure even not people who aren't working in China studies know about copyright infringement and intellectual property issues in China and that's been really exciting to learn about from uh, people in the industry, but also from the students who are participating in these processes. Um, obviously, the industry doesn't want to jeopardize professional relationships and networks, and so they're not going to go against copyright. They're going to get the license, and they're going to... Um, uh, all, all translations of musicals are verified by the licensing agencies, so they have representatives who, who go to those productions and verify that nothing inappropriate is happening. Um, and I've met some of those people and they delight in a lot of the localizations and this is something that's valuable for my research and it's wonderful to see that kind of openness to these musicals being flexible texts that can be localized. As far as the students extending their uh, spectatorship by, by becoming performers themselves with these new new productions, um, they all there's a range of attitudes and I think that that's what's exciting to study because you're seeing this moment of change in China where more knowledge of theater practices and theater writers is being acquired by these young fans and they're evaluating for themselves. It's, it's similar, I think, to having a VPN in China of are you going to jump over the firewall or not? Um, so are you going to illegally translate a musical or not? And even if you're doing it altruistically to educate people and extend the joy of musical theater, you know as the fan that the composer and author are not getting the um, royalties from that and you have to make that decision. So um, stay tuned. I mean, look at China, everyone. Um, we, I think we have time for a very quick question. I think it would be... Oh, well. you, something just connected to that, yeah. if that's possible. Uh, is it 
can we talk about different types of art then? Because with theater, I was very surprised with people being so apprehensive of saying something about, well, maybe it's because I don't know, so this, this lack of expertise, but with television and films, is the complete opposite. When there's a petition now collecting uh, signatures to force HBO to redo the eighth season of Game of Thrones. Mm -hmm. So is, is that idea that as a fan I have the right to, well, I tell you what I want to watch. Yeah. And it doesn't matter that you invested millions of dollars in creating that franchise and that amazing battle. That's not, that, that doesn't do it for me. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. I know better than you. Yeah. So how to find balance? There is a book by Len Collar called Arts Talk in the Digital Age, which basically argues that the reason why something like sport or the media is so incredibly popular and populist, it's not just because of its formal properties, it's because sport, the media, we've been encouraged to talk about it and to take ownership over our sports teams and to yell at the ref, oh, you can't do that, and to feel a sense of expertise. And that we've been systematically denied for art, it's since the 19th century, which is when cultural producers, that's what I say in the Reasonable Audience book, literally decided to retrain the audience. They built their own concert halls, rise of um, mass immigration to urban centres, traditional hierarchies were breaking down. So instead of everybody going to see the same thing at once and being vocal and vociferous and yelling and screaming at actors that they loved and booing and throwing stuff at the ones that they hated were told to sit down and be quiet and to receive excellence. And that's the point where I think high culture with all of those problematic overtones broke away. And that's what means that people with, I talk about a sense of cultural confidence, People without their inbuilt sense of cultural confidence, connected to cultural capital and all of those things, they find it hard to legitimise their own readings. And particularly in a world where we have historically said, your views don't matter, shush. And where theatre makers even today are saying, oh, a negative review, well, you probably weren't right, the right kind of audience, were you? <laughs> Chris Goods talked really persuasively about that. <coughs> Can I just add quickly with the Game of Thrones example? I'm not a Game of Thrones watcher. I've, I've never seen any of it. However, for the other seven series, there were the books behind it. This series, of course, the author, George R.R. R. Martin, hasn't actually finished the books. So there is no notion of authority behind it. I'm sure there is something in that uh, petition to do with authority and where their allegiance lies, because the idea is the screenwriters don't know what they're doing. So the idea they're not as good as the original. It's a translation issue again. Okay, um, I think we will have to finish there. So um, I'm going to ask you to just for a really great panel. <laughs>
well, subtitling in this case is, is all about what the constraints are so that whenever they complain, they understand uh, all the, <laughs> you know, the limitations that are involved. Uh, so I think it, it's it's uh, our role as well, you know, to go out there to the public and uh, just uh, talk to them and uh, educate them. And I think all those things that happen um, that, that that we mentioned the the thing on Game of Thrones and uh, with uh, Roma as well, uh, people talk about. Um, subtitling. Uh, well, it starts in a bad way, right? But then uh, hopefully the discussions continue. Uh, in the media, you've got like the Guardian and the uh, all the all the main uh, papers discussing this. So I think it, uh, it sort of gains um, visibility and it also allows association. Uh, well, Christine's here. She was talking about the uh, yes. So the ABTE uh, after uh, association, they they uh, they can then go to different institutions and you know say hi, we are here professionals and we know how to do this uh, in the right way. So that's one thing. I've had anecdotal evidence of, of fan uh, awareness or response to. So uh, on Chinese social media, fans were very upset over the Chinese translation of the American musical Thrill Me. They mostly knew it from videos of a Korean translation, and there was great unhappiness over the quality of the Chinese translation. And so when it was announced that that production would be remounted a year later on social media, fans were saying, well, they better get a new translation. I can do better than this translation. Um, another fun anecdote, I was giving a lecture in China, and I showed a clip of the Chinese Man of La Mancha, and I saw a student in the audience lip syncing along to the Mandarin lyrics and this was within months of the production opening and I thought that's a sign of a, of a, a strong translation if a fan has already committed those Mandarin lyrics to memory. Um, the other evidence I see of sort of fans awareness of the labor behind the creation of, of these musicals um, are the Korean and Japanese fans who will um, collect funds to pay for catering for lunches at rehearsals so they're aware of the labor of the performers and they want to show their gratitude in advance so they will um organize uh, sort of box lunches but the, the boxes will have images of the performers on them and there'll be little messages saying we can't wait to see you on opening night so um they feel like they're contributing to the process somehow by offering that sustenance during the rehearsal period, so um, those are fun, fun little uh, stories to collect. Mm. There's definitely something about the co-presence of performer and audience in theatre that leads, I think, to an acute awareness of the work of performing, the labour of performing, and audiences often talk about gratitude for that labour, whether or not they kind of enjoyed what had happened. There's in the Reasonable Audience book, I found that there's a two-block rule which is unofficially yes. circulated amongst audiences, yes. don't say anything bad about the production until you've got two blocks away. <laughs> because we have to respect the fact that the performers showed up and gave it their all for you. Um, but there's there's also, in the, the conclusion of my The Case in the Audience book, I argue that, like Lynn Connor says, one of the things that's holding less culturally confident audiences back from engaging fully and wholeheartedly in theatre is the feeling that they're not allowed to talk about it without being rebuked. And I suggest that actually one of the best things theatres could do is encourage um, loud disagreements. But that, does, but, that does, <laughs> but that presents a risk. And in terms of, I think the question was really about the pragmatics of making this work to what extent audiences mm understand that. In theatre, they understand the work of performing, but not so much about all the decision making that goes on behind the scenes. There's a brilliant series of letters in the Bristol Vic archives at the University of Bristol Theatre Collection, where Dennis Carey, the, the then artistic director in the 1950s of Bristol Vic, says to audiences in the newsletter, please tell me what kind of shows you want, I'll give them to you. And audiences, of course, write in in the hundreds and go, I would like these shows please, <laughs> hundreds of suggestions, to which he slowly, painstakingly and exhaustingly 
breaks down why they won't work. <laughs> well, I can't do that because that's too many performers, and I can't do that one because the rights are currently held by these people. And you don't know what goes on to the business into the business of this making. Please stop sending me these letters. So there's that tension between it's your theatre, we want to give you what you want, and oh, stop it, stop talking to us. <laughs> We're giving you what we think you need. I'm not sure to what point it's necessary to actually understand what's going on behind the scenes. Sorry, I really want to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Is that better? There we go. How much you need to know what's going on behind the scenes as an audience member, reader, whatever it is. Um, one interview that I, uh, one translator that I interviewed a few years ago, and we were talking about the name the translator movement, which is a movement to try to get translators recognised. So when translations are reviewed, as well as the author being named, the translator should be named, which is a good thing. We're being recorded. It is a good thing. Um, and she said, but let me give you an example. What's your favourite album? And I told her, and she said, who produced it? And I told her, and she said, no, you're not supposed to know that, um, because most people don't. And yet the producer will have a huge effect on the sound of that album. But do you need to know that to be able to appreciate it? No. So if we start getting into the realms of trying to teach people everything that's going on behind the scenes, it's almost that Venuti-esque re-education of readers so that they can then appreciate a foreignizing translation coming at it from my translation studies point of view, which actually, no, <laughs> let's actually observe what they think of what we have, rather than trying to teach them why it's, why it's good and why they should appreciate it, because then we're getting into the minute breakdown of why we're right, mm -hmm. which we don't want. Even no. though we are. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are in a sense, that, and that's part of the beauty of it, because as professionals, we assume that we have our conception of quality to some extent, but it doesn't necessarily align with the audiences. And it's mm. fine, and that's mm. okay, and I think we should understand that we need to take every opportunity we have to, to teach people what we think, why we act in a certain way, and I think that social media is particularly good for opening that, opening that platform for us, but we shouldn't expect that everyone is an expert in translation, because mm. that's not the point. I mean, people do other stuff, they, they just want to watch something and enjoy it. And that's fine, and any kind of translation anyway has implications. And regardless of how we intend it, it's going to be understood in a different way. And so Tatlin is a very good example for that, for instance. Uh, there is this, a, a couple of years back there was this film, The Eye in the Sky is a film about a military action in Somalia or Kenya, so it's a bunch of uh, British and American actors, everyone speaking English, and then they are suddenly in Kenya, and then you're in Kenya, you have Kenyan actors speaking English too. And then sometime, at some point, subtitles are appearing on the screen when black African people are speaking English. But you don't see subtitles for the American, uh, and you don't see subtitles for the. We, we do have that on our shows, we, we subtitle Americans. <laughs> <laughs> I've known anyone familiar with swamp people or mountain men, so American tribes that are hiding away in the swamp or in the mountains. That's subtitled even on American TV. Yeah, but, but here is a statement. And the fact that those that are show there, for, for the producers, probably that's part of how they want to deliver the product. For the audience, maybe some people want to understand, for other people it's, so you're discriminated against this other community because you're assuming that they are not understandable even though they're speaking the same language and it's along the same lines of their common mm -hmm. discussion which is why I'm not so sure where I stand in the whole discussion because parts of the film were really difficult to understand <laughs> mm -hmm. even for Spanish speakers and since there were different languages involved too sometimes you didn't realize whether they were speaking uh, uh, variation or it was Spanish or not so it, it was yeah yeah so I think it, it's a statement, what, w the reasons that we have to think of translation in a certain way are not the same reasons that the audience will have, or your opinions. That's interesting. There's a lot written about, about the colonizing mode of production, as Spivak calls it, in post-colonial studies. Brilliant black scholars, scholars of color, doing amazing work talking about the power, the colonizing power, of filming and subtitling and whose voices get to be taken as the norm and whose get to be seen as other. 
Mm. It's um, definitely something. I'm glad the whole field, the whole field, seems to be doing a good job at paying attention to that. Well, we, we do that, and, and I have to say, we do it quite subjectively. We, a new show is coming in, yeah, they have and <laughs> we, um, we listen to it in the office, and if we think this person is particularly hard to understand because he's got no teeth in his mouth, for example, one of our stars, we subtitle him. Because, but that's very subjective. That, um, it's not, uh, not a lot of research goes into it. It's just <coughs> two or three people, the programming um, directors in in the office to think this is very difficult to understand for English audiences, let's just subtitle them. Mm -hmm. Which is why it's maybe, we're not over, we're not, maybe we're not thinking enough about it. That's why, as those colonial scholars say, it's so important to pay attention to who gets to be in the room when those decisions are made. Mm -hmm. Yep. I'm in the room. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I'm not in there. <laughs> if you're talking about people who are missing teeth or perhaps have a speech impediment, then... But the, the, the reason that we're doing is because not not because of missing teeth, but because you can't understand what they're mumbling, what they're saying. So we want to make sure that their message is understood. Mm -hmm. But you can't understand what they're saying. Other but people in the room might be able to. Might, 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 might might can, can I say, like, along that, just so as an example that I saw a couple of weeks ago, I was just channel hopping and there was a program on about an ambulance team. I don't know if anybody else saw it. And they were going from one place to another, people who were dying in 999. And the people into whose homes they were going, they were subtitling them, but the actual ambulance staff, they weren't. And the people they were subtitling were not any less comprehensible to understand than the actual ambulance people that were going into the homes. Wow. And I kind of thought, well, what is actually going on here? Is this some kind of a class thing that they're saying, because these people look as if they're in working class environments, mm -hmm. they're being subtitled because it's assumed they won't be understood because of the environment in which they live. Because in terms of their actual speech, they were as easy to understand as the ambulance workers who weren't actually being subtitled. Mm -hmm. And I just don't know how that kind of decision had been made. Maybe you know if you're... Well, I, I'm not sure which program you're talking about and which channel it was on, but um, for, for us, we would, if, if some of our American production or news production, we would decide to subtitle them if we feel it's difficult to understand what the contributors are saying. That could either be because of their accent or because they've got a hand in front of mm. their mouth or because there, there's a lot of background. We do a lot of reality documentary style programs, so it's sometimes a lot of background noise. So there's a number of, but it's, it's about trying to subjectively see, are people able to hear what they're saying? It's nothing to do with class distinctions or race or any other background. It's just trying to be um, as objective, objectively as possible. Can we understand what they're saying? Yes or no. And what we also do, and you might get upset by that, some American shows that we buy from America, we replace an American narrator with a British narrator to change the tone of the show, so I mean, to change the script of the narrator as well, to make it more accessible to the British audience. Mm -hmm. My argument is always that there is no such thing as an objective decision, because we're all subject Absol in the world, embedded in, in systems of bias. Whether we mean to or want to or not, that is the case. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to say, is the answer then not to subtitle everything? And then everyone is evenly <laughs> subtitled. <laughs> 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 the ambulance workers hadn't been subtitled as well. Yeah, that, that, it's it's very 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 old, strangely, yeah. I just wondered, it might have been on the technical side with it, because the people in the houses wouldn't have been wired up with a mic. Is it that every now and then the sound would drop out no, and so they made a decision from the start? I don't know because I've never no, seen no, it. They didn't then get to watch anything um, that's not objective. I kind of thought, well, why haven't they just subtitled both? of the sides of, you know, everybody who's involved in the dialogue, why have they just taken the decision mm. to subtitle some of the participants who were completely comprehensible? You know, they didn't have very, very strong uh, regional accents that wouldn't have been understood. Uh, I just couldn't understand the logic of it. Does anybody here remember Rapsi Nesbitt? <laughs> Paul. <laughs> you know, the thing. Uh, it was a show on the BBC years ago, and it was a Glaswegian character with broad Glaswegian accent. I remember one episode where somebody from the home counties finds himself lost in Glasgow, um, speaking like this very properly, you know, and they subtitle him into Glaswegian. 
<laughs> to show them that that works very nicely. And yeah. then when Rhapsody Nesbitt starts talking back to him, they subtitle that into standard, not, I can't say received pronunciation English because it's not when it's written down, but you know what I mean, standard English with it. And that bit worked very nicely to highlight this sort of gaze thing that we're talking about. And in the other direction, too. Oh, no, no, you reply if, you're, if it's back to this. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say something to the earlier one, but I mean, not Glaswegian speech is a different language, and Scots know English. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, because it's so close to English, we tend to think of it as not being a separate language, mm -hmm. but uh, it is. No, what I was going to say is on that issue of the subtitling of certain people in that programme, and uh, maybe you raised that, I'm sorry, I missed the subtitling part earlier on, but you often see people's grammatical mistakes corrected in the subtitles, mm -hmm. and that's the variation, I guess. On, on the same thing, that's about choices being made about the validity of the, the speech of the speakers. No question. <laughs> so, coming back to the idea of, of subjectivity, I mean, we, we are, what is understandable is subjective, yeah? Yes. Uh, so, uh, you know, some people may not understand my English because I have a Uruguayan accent, and uh, some people may not understand a Brahmi because they're native speakers and they learn English. So it's, I don't think it's, that is very subjective. And what is subjective as well, we need to realize, is our perception of the different arts involved here. Because, um, and, and I, coming back to what Kirsty said earlier about the, um, the researchers doing research for <coughs> advocacy and understanding audiences. I thought that was very interesting because I think as, as translation studies scholars, we may have a tendency to, say, to want to explain translation because we perceive that as an, as a, I, well, I perceive that translation as a literary art is very misunderstood. And while some uh, members of the audience may not feel qualified to comment on someone's performance because it's theatre, they will still comment on someone's literary translation because it's not literature, it's language, yeah? yeah? So I know Spanish, so I can tell you how, what you should have used instead of that word because I'm a native speaker of Spanish, so never mind whether this is a piece of literature. I, you know, people do feel that qualified to come and say, you got that one wrong. But if, if, if it's theatre, you know, I'm not an actor. Oh gosh, no, I, no, I'm not going to comment on whether this was a Barmouth experience or not. But I think our levels of expertise can, can be seen there as well. And I think mm -hmm. maybe sometimes explaining, you know, can we explain what is translation? Or what are the implications? Is that going to change? I don't know. Such a good question. I think what we're talking about here is lines of power and privilege and who gets to dictate the right way of doing things and the idea of the norm versus who that's other, who gets to who gets denied the right to speak, and then what it takes to reclaim it. Yeah. Any other questions about doing research with audiences? They could be methodological, they could be Broader. Sorry, can I say something? Uh, uh, I mean, I'm not an academic or anything, very uh, stuff with imagination, but what you say about you know everyone's um, point of view being uh, um, you know um, okay uh, with this sort of extreme relativism, is there not the risk that everybody's opinion uh, is supposed to be acceptable regardless of the um, of, 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 of whether it is or not um, uh, true, like say um, um, flat Earth, you know. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it is, in my opinion, just as valuable as yours. I don't think that's that's really useful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can understand how you want to prevent prejudice and sort of uh, you know mm, categories being handed down from above, but at the same time, you need sort of to uh, to define a sort of a, a a, a limit somewhere. Such a great question. And actually, that 
that reminds me of the major crisis of faith that I had in 2016 when Brexit happened and Trump happened and suddenly everyone was going, oh, no, one, no one believes in experts anymore. And I was going, I, I, I believe in experts. Experts are important. Oh, shit. I have spent my whole career going, everyone's an expert of their own experience. We must listen to all and receive all, and understand all experiences equally. Oh no, what am I going to do about that? And what I did about that is write an article in Theatre Research International called Audience Experience in an Anti-Expert Age, where I, where, I, where I address that question. To what extent do we and should we be listening to contrary positions? If I believe that we should not be inviting platforms for Nazis, if I believe that we should be punching Nazis on site and shutting them out of the marketplace of ideas rather than, uh, than offering them a platform alongside the very people whom they're seeking to silence and subjugate, how can then I, in academic ways, say that I need to listen to all competing viewpoints? And I don't think it's a position that can easily be reconciled. The only thing that I think we can do as researchers is to acknowledge our own subjective position, to think about the subjective positions of the people with whom we're talking and to acknowledge there are different kinds of different kinds of knowledge out there different ways of seeing and understanding the world uh -huh. and to know when we should stop listening and to whom we should actually go yes i want to hear your perspective and if your perspective is the daily mail comment section this is shit and should be shut down Maybe your perspective isn't necessarily valid or helpful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that is, not a is there not a contradiction to what you were saying earlier? That sort of, you know, uh, um, uh, s somebody should, should feel free to be entitled to that money. I suppose that they should be, be free to be entitled. But between uh, listening to somebody and validating their opinion because uh, they express just their own point of view, uh, uh, see. Okay, I think there is a major fundamental difference between platforming an opinion and understanding it from an academic perspective. Actually, we should, as academics, be paying attention to flat earthers to say, look, here is an array of contrary evidence that proves the earth is round. How do you navigate yourself around and away from that position? And then we can, from a scholarly perspective again, be paying attention to the process of denying facts. How do people listen to blatant lies and propaganda and incorporate that into their worldview? What does the process look like? I think we need to be understanding that, surely. Surely that's a major tool for resistance. We don't then need to be putting them on the BBC and getting them <laughs> to legitimately say the earth is flat, vaccinations cause autism. We're being recorded, so I'm going to be careful. <laughs> Um, when you were asking your question uh, about validation of opinion, there's a difference between allowing people to have an opinion and validating it. And so saying that, yes, you have an opinion about something and we're going to listen to you isn't the same as saying, and your opinion is necessarily good. Um, so I think it's about how communities or networks grow around this and how something gains currency within that. So in my, from a sociological point of view, I'm thinking here, the, the, the symbolic capital that certain people hold within that and the power that they hold within that. So the way that we resist against that is to try to mine away around the outside and break it down and make that community smaller by convincing the other people that actually another way is, could be better and would you like to come and see it from this point of view? And again, being careful because we've been recorded. At the centre of some of these networks are people who don't believe the things that they are saying, and rather they are convincing other people, so they hold this supreme position of power within it, where they can say what they like. They don't have to believe it to convince other people that it's right. Those people you will not change because they're in the game to accumulate as much power as they can for themselves. It's the other ones around it where we... We can do that work. And we can understand the process of, of sorry, young sorry. white men being radicalised against feminists, fe uh, against women, for example. We can understand that process in action by studying it without giving them a centre page spread in the New York Times. Just one observation here. Um, don't jump at my throat mm -hmm. straight away. <laughs> Um, I just think it, it would be quite useful to notice that there are two, um, two dimensions here in this discussion. One is the academic and one is the profession. Mm -hmm. And I think that we should kind of bear in mind that both need to exist. 
but they don't necessarily work in the same. They might actually, at some point, be on parallel lines rather than intersecting. And so perhaps what you were saying about what you subtitle and what you don't subtitle might be taken purely from a pragmatic point of view. I want this to be um, useful for my audience. I want my to make sure that my audience understands everything. Whereas you, from an academic point of view, will observe that, analyze that, and analyze it deep out of it as well, and kind of say, well, this is what happened, and this is what happened because, and that you can actually say it has happened based on a subjective criterion, but at the same time, he still got <coughs> the need, or maybe even the right, to go ahead and subtitle that because he thinks that that speaker had a list. Mm -hmm. Just, just wanted to say, I think it's it's kind of usual to, to perhaps take these two, distinguish these two plans. Although I would say, at least in theater studies, um, the audience opinion is is exactly the place where the industry and academia intersect because. Um, uh, as researchers of audiences, whether we uh, rate these sources or not, we need to look at websites like TripAdvisor because that's where audiences will go and say, I love The Lion King and I'm seeing it for the 20th time. Um, and that's also where the producers will go to get the quotation, I love The Lion King and put it on a poster. So I would, know, I would disagree with you because when it comes to audiences, if you study audiences, you you you're looking at the same thing the industry is looking at. So you don't have a choice. You have the same interest. Yes, you might be working with it differently, but you're still going to go, I'm going to go to TripAdvisor or in China, I'm going to look at Doban and look at the, the Chinese consumers ratings of, you know, in China, they rate restaurants and theater on the same website. What, you know, that tells the researcher a great deal, just as it will tell the, the arts marketer a great deal. Um, so, I know in, in conversations we might be in parallel, but in terms of what we were talking about today, audiences, that's that's the common, that's what we have in common. I called, right. my, and I called my book The Reasonable Audience because it's about what it means to feel like you're a reasonable person with the right to judge. This is a reasonable compromise. I'll subtitle this thing, but not this thing, because from my position here, I can understand that perfectly, but not so much that, so other people might not. But there are, there are, <laughs> that, that idea of reasonableness divides along lines of class and race and ability. That's why it's important to study and listen to all kinds of audiences from all backgrounds rather than thinking, well, this is what I think is a reasonable way to do this. But in, in practice, what would that mean for us when we're getting buying a new show and there's someone that we find, for whatever reason, difficult to understand? Normally we would be able to make the decision that afternoon, do we send it for subtitling? In time for premiere, if we actually wanted to engage the audience, we would have to probably bring in um, a research group, 30 or 40 people, play them the show, mm -hmm. ask them, "Did you understand everyone all the time?" Mm -hmm. Analyze it, and then make an infor informed decision. And I, I, ideally, that would be great, but it's, it's just not practical. <laughs> it couldn't, and it means we can't premiere the show for another month or two, and we have to spend X amount of money on, on that research. Yeah. Well, that would go against the academic endeavour anyway, wouldn't it? Because we don't want to theorise simply at a case-by-case -case level. Yeah. We should be able to... In but the for, for us, it's on a case-by-case -case basis. Mm. For us, it's this case, this theme, do we think it's audible what the person is saying, or do, mm. do we need a, an aid? But it will be from your experience as well, so yes. your professional experience, and that mm. feeds into how you, how you act, serious. basically what I think you were saying there, there anyway. And, and you're getting the feedback, and you're listening to it, and you're taking it seriously. So if someone says, well, actually, I think that decision was ableist or problematic in this way, then potentially the only thing you can do is make the best decisions and then own up to any mistakes. Yep. So that's what we you're would, doing. We would make changes in season two, for example, but maybe stop the subtitling mm -hmm. or add more, depending on if we're getting feedback. Yeah, but you can only do the best you can in those circumstances, but it's about acknowledging all of us, all the time, our own subjective position. Yeah. But I think that's, that's why it's important to have uh, as academics, in my case, obviously, a uh, different identity from industry and the audience and to, to understand that I'm not the industry and I'm not the audience. Because I do research on fan sub in a non-professional sub -sighting. And obviously, you wouldn't like that necessarily because, well, that's piracy, basically. Uh, but I, as an academic, that's a social phenomenon that I need to study. And there's some value in there. 
So I cannot just simply adopt the agenda of the industry because I cannot just assume that that doesn't exist. Uh, so I need to know that. But at the same time, I cannot just assume that whatever the audience is doing is right necessarily mm. because I, if that's my starting point, then what's the point of science? Mm. And mm. then as an academic, I'm not fulfilling the role. And um, it, it's the same, it's not about just having the opinion, but also assuming the responsibility of developing that opinion and to, to have educated guesses about whatever I'm investigating. And that's part of the whole thing. And I think you do need to separate that, even though uh, some academics are also professionals, I think those are two completely different identities at play. Yeah, I think they do feed into each other. Yeah, you know, and they communicate. They need to feed into each other, and ideally, academic, academia and the profession should keep talking to each other as much as possible, because that is what we both, what both sides need. But then again, I do agree with what he was saying about, you know, I need to make a decision now. Mm -hmm. yeah. You are saying, I'm looking at what the audiences are saying on TripAdvisor. Yes, but you're looking at it afterwards. Mm -hmm. at, at that moment in not time, always, not I always, am though. I'm in the line on fire, on fire, and I kind of think, I've got a deadline in half an hour, thank you very much. I can't ring you up and say, from a connect point of view, do you think it's acceptable? Because I need to make that decision there and then. And then you, as an academic, can look at my decision and think, oh, look, look what I've done. So we are kind of standing to different places. Do you see what I mean? Inevitably, I think. In a more extreme example, is a TV newsroom where decisions are made on how you translate words, whether you use the word terrorist, as the, yeah. the guest said, um, <coughs> words, that, who you choose to subtitle. I think that's something that's not been brought up yet today. I wonder whether it helps to think about the issues you brought up in that we all act in different roles as prof professional translators of titles, um, part of the industry and academics in terms of different ethic uh, priorities. So, you know, you have a, a clear um, objective, you know, we as academics we want to understand uh, and as translate, so what? So this is. I'm, I'm going to throw this question back to the audience, where I'm guessing there are more translate professional translators that here, and it's like you know, it's a question of you know, I, if I if I'm responsible for producing, for selling this show, or am I responsible for translating, or am I responsible for interpreting the audience response to a room full of. Um, you know, professionals and academics. So we, I, I think it should be useful to think that as, as part of our ethical role as translators or as academics. I, I think, yeah. that, sorry, I think that in translation studies, at least, I think that kind of analysis of the source text, target text, that this has been translated that way, this has been translated wrong, it shouldn't have been, or, you know, whatever. I think, I, I don't think that's there as much anymore. And, and I think the, 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 the research is, 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 or the way of looking at these kind of things has moved on from kind of comparative to, that's the way that it's done. It's not right or wrong, so it's not a mistake that that's been translated. But, but what, how, does that affect the text as a whole? Does that, do you see what I mean? So I, so I think that, I, and I, I, I think that's quite often a, a criticism that's aimed from uh, at at researchers from the, the profession in translation studies that you know we're there to criticise the decisions that they've made and to comment on. But I, I don't think that's kind of necessarily the sense anymore. I think we've moved on from that than it being a you know purely textual analysis of comparative saying I don't know. Well, are you looking at me? I don't no, I'm just like, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I don't think anyone was suggesting. No, no, I don't, no, but yeah. Uh, just to circle back to the mention of TripAdvisor and other various um, platforms that have been mentioned throughout the day, social media and otherwise, um, I'm wondering from an academic perspective, is there more value or would you say the opinions voluntarily expressed on these platforms are more authentic than ones that we can collect in pointed questions and surveys? It's so difficult because um, if you think about your own social media activity, you you know, it's a place we go when we want to enthuse or, or vent. It's not, we don't tend to go when we've just had a kind of 
middle ground experience. It's when, you know, there are a lot of emojis that are required or something was really awful. Um, so I think as researchers, you need to keep that in mind that you are going to get those pulls, but those are still really valuable. I look a lot at, at the more anecdotal uh, evidence and I'm looking at how are people writing about what they're feeling. Um, uh, as a Canadian, I'm really interested in the musical Come From Away, and if you haven't seen it on the West End, you can go, and that's been really interesting on social media because every night there's a very fast standing ovation, and spectators are really aware that they've not had this spectatorship experience before, where everyone in the theater is on their feet together like that, and it's really interesting to track how they're describing it. So I tend to look more for at the phrasing rather than the kind of rating of the experience, sort of how are they trying to put it into words? Because ultimately our big challenge is that theater is ephemeral. Um, I had the good fortune at, as a PhD student to be working in perfume shops, which is a great thing to be selling if you're researching theater because you're, you're selling a thing that's gonna disappear. Um, so I've always been really mindful of how do we talk about the thing that's not there anymore. Um, so for me, social media is great because you see the amateur spectator, right? Not the experts um, trying to put into words. So I steal from them all the time. But I think you need to know what you're going to those social media platforms for. Yeah. yeah. And I think there's a danger in trying to find authentic ways of identifying audience discourse. So my current project is about what can I know from audience letters and correspondence in the archives? And what about from doing surveys where I'm asking people to fill in little boxes and tick things, but also write some stuff. And then to talk to me, one-on-one -on -one interviews, focus groups where, and all of these things are, as um, Oakley said in a brilliant 1980s paper, these are social interactions. Whether it's writing something on Twitter or talking to me as a researcher over the phone, these are social interactions. And Oakley was taking the whole social sciences to task in that article, article interviewing women. She said that, that the social sciences had tended to think about these methods as just mechanistic ways of drawing out objective truth. And they're not that at all. They're a social interaction. I'm talking to you and I'm entering into some kind of social contract. And you're doing that when you're writing your thing on Twitter or on Facebook to a particular audience because it's a social place where there are particular rules and conventions. And that's how I think we should be studying them. What, in what ways are audiences themselves performing their responses? Um, and just, because I, I know we were kind of trying to talk about methods and, and give advice. Um, use social media as a researcher, play with it, test the boundaries of what you can do. When I was in China, I was observing a rehearsal and a, um, a kind of famous Chinese actor happened to come to the rehearsal and I, I knew that Korean producers were really trying to build celebrity in musical theater in China because that's, as I showed with all the pictures, celebrity matters in Korea, not so much in China, but they were trying to really push this and I wanted to test it. So I took a selfie with this actor and I just put it on my um, Chinese social media, WeChat. And I just said something silly like, oh, I just met this guy. Does anybody know him? Apparently he <laughs> sings well. And within half an hour, everyone on my WeChat was like, oh my goodness, it's Lo Young. Oh my goodness, you met him? <gasps> and for me as a researcher, that was a really good test. And I only did it because he said, I just was at this film festival and I got mobbed by some people who knew me. And I, and, and I was really, he was really unsettled as a theater actor because he didn't think he was famous because he's theater famous, not movie famous. Um, so, okay, that's not really, um, you know, concrete data. That's a little social media game, but, um, you know, I, I, it reinforced the value of social media as a platform that you can get a quick response, that you can get a, a really intense emotional response. And if you're interested in affect, then that kind of evidence can be useful. Can I just ask something to Laura? Did you mentioned that you work with China, Japan, and Korea. Um, and then you, you know, from like you are gather you travel a lot and you say you're not fluent with the language. No. So how do you work around that? <laughs> it's different in every country. 
Um, <laughs> Don't say Google Translate. Um, no, he's yeah. in Europe and, and, and Middle, the Middle East and have lots of documents that cover research and, and likely is written in English and or other European language that I can kind of you know, understand. But then when I move away from you know, my, you know, my cultural area, like, you know, it's just hard and you, need yeah. to, you would need to have five, six, seven translators. So in terms well, of I think what you're saying about distance is exactly the point, is that you're, you always have certain languages that you're closer to or, or certain locations that you're closer to. So for me, after French, the next language is German. And so I can go to archives in Germany and look at newspaper clippings and not translate them perfectly but when you're looking at theater reviews um, uh, if, if someone says the musical is for, for sauber and uh, um, uh, magical or bewitching and you see that in you know 20 reviews you're noticing a trend so even with mediocre language skills you can glean some information for me fortunately because the West End and Broadway are so dominant in the global industry most of the Germans Austrians and Asians who I meet have English language skills so I've really relied on that and I don't know if I mentioned this earlier my larger project is looking at um, the transnational circulation of musicals so I'm looking at Germany and Austria as well and and how they're helping develop the East Asian industries um, so um, other things that help me, um, people in the industry make really useful introductions for me. So I just talk to everybody and I'm always telling them what my work is. And if someone says, you should meet so-and-so, I always say yes, even if I think, I really don't think I need to meet so-and-so. <laughs> because you don't know, you don't know what experience they had. Maybe they were in some rehearsal, maybe they knew the famous director, maybe they saw the production you didn't get to see. Um, so I generally always say yes. Um, in terms of language in East Asia, um, I was I had an HRC fellowship and I was given Mandarin lessons, which I would regularly hijack to get the teacher to tell me more useful vocabulary so I could say, um, and when you rock up to interview a Chinese practitioner and you can say, I'm a musical theater teacher, um, they think, oh wow, you, you know, even though that's all I can really say, um, it's, an, it's an icebreaker and that made a big difference just being able to say things and um, again, just being open to, to the possibilities. My teacher was teaching me how to say, I want things, wo yao shui, I want water. And I thought for a second, wait a minute, musicals have songs that we refer to as I want songs, where the character expresses their um, overall dream or goal that they're trying to um, accomplish. And so I said to the teacher, oh, can I say that there is such thing as wo yao ge, I want song. And she was so confused and she said, no, no, no. In Chinese you would say wo men yao ge, we want songs because you would never express an individual desire, you would only express a collective goal. How earth shattering is that as a researcher to think, wow, that's the power of Western musicals that express individual desire and dreams. I still don't speak fluent Mandarin, but that is such a useful lesson. So I don't know, I guess I'm kind of proud of my scrappy researching because it's, it's going to have holes. Yeah, of course. You budget this crop of research. You know? I mean, Sorry. If you were to budget this translation in interpreting work in terms of time and you know financial resources that you need for further EHRC, how, how would you go about that? Uh, I'm just trying to get. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's really important because again, in East Asia, um, in Korea and China, generally the industry has the language skills, so I don't need interpreters. But in Japan, I did need interpreters. I needed them a bit in Korea, but it was often for a status thing. I was meeting an older person who didn't want me to hear their accent, and so they wanted a translator, but it was very clear they understood me and they could speak in English if they wanted to. Um, uh, so sometimes post-grads, if, if there's normally there's a post-grad who's a musical theater fan and I, I'm, it's like I'm bringing the gospel and, and so we have a little <laughs> exchange and they do some um, uh, translating or interpreting. Um, I have budgeted for translation um, uh, of interviews, so uh, transcribing and translation from Korean, and I do put that into budgets for funding bids for Japan for interpreting in the archive so that someone can help me go through documents faster. Um, I did that in Korea. I had a, what, I mean, the uni gave me a postgrad assistant, so we went to the library and their archive and went through some books and um, and I find I've worked a lot with students who have language skills that I don't and um, 
if you're really clear about what you're interested in, not just focusing on the language, but what are the ideas you're interested in or who are the key figures, there's, they pick it up. I've had amazing um, good fortune with students. So, um, but yeah, I just go online and I, or I talk to translators I know about what are the rates for this kind of translation. Um, so it's not ideal, but I'm not, uh, my project is interested in kind of broader strokes anyway. So I'm trying to collect a big picture. But, um, but for me, that's part of the fun is this is a challenge of how do I, because people have said to me, why don't you just pick one country? And I think that's not the point. The point is that five countries have had a similar experience of this culture and that culture now lets them dialogue with each other and network in crazy, exciting ways. So um, the fun is finding the money and finding the ways to um, pro be able to process most of it myself. Um, I have a question about um social media reviews of, of translations in relation to books and literary translations. Because like, it strikes me that you're talking about how on TripAdvisor everything's either five stars or one star, and there's nothing in between. But I've not looked into this a great deal, but on websites like Goodreads or even on kind of Amazon reviews, it tends to be a bit more nuanced in terms of scores, and people give more thoughtful, in-depth, because a book is a big commitment of time, and people form opinions on it. And it's sort of interesting because, particularly what Gabriela was talking about, um, with kind of reviews exoticizing translations, um, do reader reviews take the same approach, do you find? Or, um, is, you know, I, when, when a, a reviewer in the Times talks about, you know, at least in respect to this yeah. exotic mystery, yeah. um, is that just something that they're, they're, they're setting upon it themselves, the reviewer? Like trying to sell their copy to the reader and the reader, you know, but obviously an online reviewer who just went to book doesn't necessarily have that motive, but do they still fall into that habit? I, I haven't, I, it's, a, it's a very good question. I, I love to have a compare, you know, reviews in Amazon to the other lot. Um, I haven't um, got a grant with a sufficient budget for it yet, but um, it's in. I haven't, so I haven't looked at them in in any detail. My impression from looking occasionally, particularly at um, reviews of titles that I found particularly interesting, is that the reviewers, the non-expert reviewers, if you want, tend to be much more focused on the story and the plot and the characters than the setting so but that was my impression on a mm -hmm. you know yeah and it, I, I think it, it would be useful to to look at it and I yeah but yes. it's it's different I think the, the point of view is very different because some my again and kind of this is a very subjective impressionistic um, opinion is that uh, sometimes the, the the professional or the critics need to uh, show knowledge in a way that maybe readers who connected more with the story don't feel the need to. They don't need to give you an essay on on Brazilian poverty uh, before they they go into you know they but. Let's see, that's a hypothesis. If someone wants to explore it, let me know what they find. Um, two, two points with it. One, a couple of months ago on the 3% podcast, which is a podcast by Chad Post, who is the publisher of Open Letter Books. Uh, he was commenting about the current state of reviews in the media, and he says that he thinks that one day he might start a literary journal and just create reviews with a random generator of words and give everything three and a half out of five for all the good it does. Um, so when you talk about nuance, it might not actually be nuanced. It might be just nobody wants to offend too many people. Nobody wants to be too enthusiastic either. Um, in looking at reader reviews and blogger reviews, quite frequently they have their own identity and, and some of them have an identity that they're trying to sell and build up as well and so get that that symbolic capital of prestige from what they're doing. Some others have a different angle of, again, take far too long to talk about specific details and don't want to offend anyone really. Um, but 
because of the nature of it, there is such a wide variety out there, clearly what they want to do is to try to become a trusted name so then they become more of a go-to place. So an example of that would be uh, the Knowledge Lost blog, Michael Kitto, who writes on it, who started a newsletter recently, the Translated Lit newsletter, um, to try to make it more of a place to go. If you want to have a quick chat after about that, I'll talk about the details of that now. Not in front of everyone. Your observation, it kind of chimes with my impressions on what the. Um, I think it's also interesting because I feel like there's been an evolution recently from um, translated literature all being very highbrow mm -hmm. and philosophical for a very specific audience interested in that kind of writing that just obviously ignored genre fiction, whereas non English markets will translate whole swathes of genre fiction from English yeah. because it's just viewed as a good story mm -hmm. and there's no kind of exoticizing component to it. Um, or perhaps there is, that's a bit of generalisation, but, but in, in any case, the English language market does seem to, uh, from what I can tell, be becoming more receptive to that, to kind of more general literature. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's an interesting turn because to sell that you have to be able to present it just as a story, really, um, rather than as some grand statement about, you know, the, 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 I think, the nature of Brazilian culture, for example. Mm -hmm. For example, the Rui Fafon book from a few years ago, The Shadow of the Wind, became a bestseller. Nobody really cared, it was a translation, it became a bestseller because it was in the Richard and Judy book club. Yeah, um, likewise, a lot of Scandinois things. Then the area does become important, so we start to get that cultural stereotyping within there, but the fact that it's a translation doesn't matter, and then you get people even writing in English, emulating the style of it, or it becoming a Scandinavian written directly in English. So it blurs all of that. In terms of genre fiction, look at Amazon Crossing and what they've been doing, biggest publisher in translated literature. Most of it is genre fiction, and that's powered by their own sales data that they will not let you see or touch at all. But they can see how the book does in different markets, how it does in the original market, if it's been translated somewhere else. They know all of that, so then they have a very good idea what will do well, and then they know which readers they can push it to. The amount of data that's in there driving it is scary, to be honest. But, yeah. um, some, some of you may want to follow the progress of a Dutch musical as it arrives in London next year. There's a Dutch producer building a theatre at Canary Wharf that revolves 360 degrees. So, uh, or actually the stage doesn't, the auditorium seating revolves, uh, and it's called uh, Soldier of Orange as in the Netherlands, not another Soldier of Orange. Um, they're not changing the title, even though a British audience might not think of the Netherlands when they hear Soldier of Orange, but it's, it's a Dutch musical that's being translated um, and will be um, opened in London next year um, on the scale of a West End show. So will, will its Dutchness persist? beyond the narrative? Will will it be marketed as a Dutch music? I mean, in that case, it is a very Dutch story. It's about a Dutch resistance fighter who joined the RAF, and it's a, in, in the time of Brexit, it's a very interesting um, bit of history to, to put on stage in London. Um, but it'll be really interesting to track how much the Dutchness is foregrounded. In the Netherlands, the marketing is all orange, um, and it's a much beloved show, longest running musical in the Netherlands. But um, will will a British audience go for that Dutch show? And if they do, will they go for it because of World War II history or because it's a European import? Should we? <laughs> um, if no one else has any questions, or if you want to obviously talk to our panel privately afterwards. <laughs> But can we just thank our panel very much for being here all day and for that enlightening discussion. Um, and thank you all for coming again. And that's it. <laughs>